What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was in Marvel as Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 3. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Before leaving the council room, Peter and everyone decided that the Avengers weren't ready to deal with someone of Hulk's caliber. He might as well be the living personification of rage given form in this universe, so people like Sabretooth, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, and Mystique would never stand a chance. Sorry, but it's just the truth. Even if they were to fight well in the beginning, the Hulk will only grow stronger with time. Anger and rage fuel his strength constantly, after all. The anger from a drawn-out fight would be more than enough for the Hulk to beat them which is why Peter and everyone else decided that the Avengers Council and a select few others will be the only people involved in this mission. The Avengers' first mission, that is. Iron Man, Magneto, Professor X, Storm, Nightcrawler, and last but certainly not least, Spider-Man, obviously, Fury wouldn't be anywhere near this. He may be an amazing spy or secret agent, but he would have even less of a chance than the Avengers they're leaving out of the mission. Storm was an easy pick for the team as she's an Omega-level metahuman and could simply attack from a distance using her flight ability and lightning. Nightcrawler isn't nearly strong enough to deal with the Hulk, but he has a very valuable ability, teleportation. He won't get involved with any of the fighting, should it ever come to that, and simply use his teleportation to assist the team when needed. The rest were chosen because they're strong enough to deal with this. It was that simple. Well, all except for Tony. Most of the council didn't think that Tony's suit would hold up against the Hulk, but he managed to convince everyone that he had something planned for this. After all, Tony knew about the Hulk for a while now, so he has had time to cook something up for the Green Giant. Tony refused to say anything about it when they asked, but Peter thought it was probably the big Hulk buster suit. Though, he didn't know that for sure. The world has changed with his influence, so Peter tries not to expect anything anymore. Not to mention the inclusion of the X-Men, which didn't even exist in the MCU. Peter just has to be prepared for anything and remain watchful for things that may stay the same. He hoped that a lot would stay the same, but rarely is anyone that lucky. After the game plan was formulated and the council meeting was finished, Peter returned home to spend some time with his Aunt May before heading out that night to patrol the streets. His crime-fighting schedule has lessened greatly due to the cell of Han Ninja in the city, but Peter still likes to get out of the house for a few times a week and swing around saving people. Speaking of the hand, Peter swung to a nearby brick building and entered the place through the door on the roof. The door was locked by a keypad, which Peter easily accessed before entering the building. The outside and inside of the building were completely different. On the outside, the building looked like an old not-so-tall skyscraper. On the inside, the place looked brand new and modern. Stepping inside, Peter was instantly greeted by a small group of red-clad ninjas, who guarded the door in shifts. As soon as they saw his entrance, the ninja straightened up and bowed. Keep up the good work. Peter called out as he descended the stairway. This building is the headquarters of the Hand, not just for New York City but the whole world. The Hand never had a true headquarters before Peter's arrival. Each finger of the Hand had their own home base, which usually changed frequently based on their whims or plans. The closest thing that they had to a headquarters was the temple where Peter fought the beast, but that doesn't really fit the description. Peter had the hand move here about a month ago. He could technically portal to any location, but having his subordinates close by feels more comforting in a way. As Peter descended the stairs, he was met by his trusted second-in-command, Scythe, who rushed over as soon as Peter's code was used to enter the building. Good evening, Black Sky. Scythe says as he bows similarly to the ninjas that were guarding the roof's door. Do you require any assistance? Yeah. Peter nods as he takes out a flash drive and hands it over. This contains the information of a man named Bruce Banner. He should be trying to enter the country from South America. He doesn't have a passport or any identification, so he'll most likely cross the border illegally. I want everyone looking for him. Discreetly of course. Of course. Scythe agrees instantly and tucks the flash drive into his pocket. Would you like him killed? Hearing this from his second-in-command reminded Peter that he still has a long way to go with the hand. Their first line of thought is always killing. No, I want him located and surveilled. 
That's it. Peter says as he thinks for a moment. If he's having trouble crossing the border, maybe lend a hand, but other than that keep a wide distance from this one. He's far more dangerous than he looks. You'll see from the drive I gave you. Understood. Anything else, sir? Scythe asks respectfully. Yes, have we had any problems since our last talk? Anyone stepping out of line or planning behind my back? Peter asks, knowing that Scythe has been monitoring the troublesome members of the hand closely for him. Nothing that I can't handle. Scythe says with a shake of his head. Malik and his men have been fairly quiet, which is odd for them, but the new rules don't give them room to act as they used to. How are the cities he's in charge of? Have his men followed the rules? How are the crime rates? Peter asks. Crime rates are down, and the reports say everyone is following the rules. So far everything points to Malik and his men adapting to the new hand structure. Scythe says with a shrug. Hmm, stay vigilant. Peter says as he turns to head back up the stairs. I hope they adapt and thrive but some people have a hard time changing. I'm going to call it a night. Be sure to get some sleep, Scythe. Yes, sir. With the hand and shield both looking for Banner, it didn't take long for Peter to be informed of the man's location. The hand was the first to inform Peter of his location, which made Peter feel a bit of pride. Shield, which has satellites and technology that has never been seen in the public before, couldn't find one man, while his ninja could. A few days after Peter gave Scythe the flash drive, he was messaged with the exact location of Bruce Banner. He was already in Virginia and would soon arrive at Culver University, where Betty Ross works as a scientist and professor. Damn, the guy moves fast, Peter thought. Barely an hour after Peter was informed of this by the hand, Natasha texted everyone about the same exact thing. Natasha, he's here. Culver Campus, Virginia outside a pizza shop on the outskirts of campus, an elderly man waved off a group of children as he begins to close up for the night. As he's locking up, a disheveled man appears in his view scaring him half to death. W what? He jumps and freezes as a look of recognition forms on his face. Bruce. Stan, I give you my word, whatever you've heard about me, it's not true. Banner says as he holds his hands up on the other side of the glass door. Oh, I know. I always knew. I mean, you and Betty used to live up above me. Have you seen her? Stan says as he opens the door and pulls Bruce inside, hoping that no one saw him. No. She doesn't know that I'm here. She's with somebody? Banner asks as the old man locks the door and puts down the blinds one by one. Yeah, he's a head shrink. Stan replies. I see. Bruce mutters dejectedly. Hopefully she's happy. What can I do to help? The man asks, ready to help in any way he can. I could use a bed for a few nights. Banner answers hopefully, eager to sleep in a nice warm bed. You can have your old apartment upstairs. Stan agrees easily. That'd be great. Thank you. Sadly, none of the old man's work with the blinds mattered, as Banner has been followed by two separate groups for a while now. Neither knew the other was there, but both were there on orders from the same person, Peter. Natasha, he's here upon receiving this text, the Avengers Council convened once again, but by this time they were informed that Banner was sound asleep in an apartment above some pizza place. Knowing that it isn't best to wake him up, as nobody is happy when someone wakes them from their sleep, they all agreed to give Banner his beauty sleep, as he may turn green without it. They would rely on Clint and Natasha to inform them when he's awake, and head over together at that time. Next day, is this guy a bear or something? I didn't know humans could hibernate. Clint comments from his position in an empty shop across the street from Stanley's Pizza Parlor. It was already midday and there has been zero sign of Banner leaving the building. The shop had some traffic from customers coming to buy food, but there was no sign of their sleepy scientist. The second floor's curtains were shut tightly, so they couldn't see inside, not even a shadow was visible. Though this wasn't some trained agent that they were dealing with, so neither Natasha nor Clint were worried about Banner giving them the slip. Especially with Clint keeping watch of the building. They don't call him Hawkeye for nothing after all. From what I can guess, he most likely didn't sleep during the entire trip here. He's being hunted by a United States general. I'm sure the nerves have been hell for someone so untrained. Natasha answers from across the room, polishing one of her many pistols. Yeah, well hopefully he wakes up soon. I promised Laura and the kids that I'd be on a plane back by tonight. Clint says as he keeps his eyes trained across the street. Well, our job will be finished when the bosses arrive, so you could just leave as soon as they get here. Natasha says with a shrug. Are you sticking around? Clint asks with a raised brow. Yes, I'll stay in the area just in case they need some help. Natasha nods as she holsters her gun. Sigh, then I'll stay as well. Clint sighs defeatedly. Clint didn't have it in him to leave the mission when his partner would stay behind without him. 
If something happened to her after he left, then Clint would never forgive himself. His family would understand. After all, this isn't the first time that he would return home late. It certainly wouldn't be the last either. That's for sure. You don't have to. I doubt that they'll need my help. Natasha started speaking but she was soon cut off. Oh, we got movement. Clint practically jumps as he sees a much cleaner Bruce Banner walk out of the pizza shop with a couple of pizza boxes in hand. Where's he going? Natasha asks as she sees Banner walking toward campus buildings. I don't know. To deliver some pizzas? Let Fury and them know he's up and moving. Clint says and they slip out of the building, following Banner at a safe distance as not to cause suspicion. Culver University Science Building, excuse me. Pardon me. Coming through, Banner maneuvered his way through a crowded entrance and towards the security desk. Hey, pal. I got a delivery on the fifth floor. I don't think there's anybody up there right now. A fat security guard replies in confusion. Look, I'm going to catch hell for my boss if I don't collect. You have to let me at least check it out. I'll tell you what. I got an extra medium. Take it on the house. Banner holds out a pizza box toward the guard. Eh? Fine, just be quick about it. The guy snatches the free pizza and shoes Bruce inside. You're the man. Banner says thankfully as he walks past the guard. Both Natasha and Clint watched this interaction from close by but out of sight and were shocked. Did he just bribe a security guard with a pizza? Clint asks as he watches the sad excuse of a guard start inhaling pizza slices. Yeah, I can't believe that worked. Natasha says with a shake of her head. Navigating his way through the building, Banner finds a computer lab of sorts, and he signs into one of the many PCs as Betty Ross. He still knew her login and password after five years apart. Thankfully, she didn't change anything. Unfortunately, any and all work associated with the project that turned him into a monster was gone without a trace left behind. When he ran from the soldiers in Brazil a few days ago, he had a laptop with all of the research data from the Super Soldier Serum Recreation Project. Bruce saved that data and even added to it over these many years, hoping to use it to cure his green skin condition. Sadly, that laptop was completely destroyed during the escape, so his only hope to recover some of it was this, but sadly either the government or his old girlfriend deleted all of the data from that time. Sighing in defeat as he was hunched over the computer, Banner loads up a message board and instantly a line of text appears. Mr. Blue, Mr. Green. How goes your meditation? Bruce Banner, the data is gone. They found me and my laptop was destroyed during my escape. Mr. Blue, without that data, I don't know how to help you. What now? Bruce Banner, I've gotta keep moving, I guess. Mr. Blue and Mr. Green? A voice sounds over Bruce's shoulder, causing him to jump from his seat and onto his feet. How secretive. Turning around, Banner saw someone that he definitely didn't think would be there. He expected a guard or a professor perhaps but not this. Surely not this. S Spider-Man? Banner mutters in shock. Hello. Peter waves from his position, leaning on a nearby desk. W what? Bruce asks in confusion, I'm here to speak with you and help if that's what you're asking? Peter says as he pulls up a chair and takes a seat. Help? You want to help me? Banner was confused. After all, in his mind, the Hulk is a killer that would warrant Spider-Man's assistance in subduing, not helping. It would be easier for Bruce to believe that Peter was here to attack him than anything else. Yep, you've been on the Avengers radar for a while now, but we decided to wait. We were still building and recruiting at the time, so we gave you some space. Peter says as Banner tries his best to control his emotions and blood pressure. Um, okay? Bruce wasn't sure what to say. Technically, we would have left you alone a bit longer but General Ross decided to pull his shenanigans, so we had to move up our schedule. After all, we can't have that idiot provoking you into destroying a city or something. Peter says, showing his clear distaste for Banner's most hated enemy. I see. Bruce says as he starts to slowly calm down. Good, you're taking this well. Peter says with a smile and stands up. We shouldn't stay here for too long. Get back to that pizza place. I'll meet you there. How do you? Bruce asks, but Peter jumped out of the window and disappeared before he could finish speaking. Sigh. My life used to be so simple. Peter could have portaled Banner out of the building instead of splitting up like this, but he didn't want to reveal his portal ability to the Hulk just yet. He didn't know if the Hulk sees and knows everything that Bruce does, after all. Portals will be Peter's best weapon against a being as powerful as the Hulk. Especially when it comes to trapping or moving him out of a crowded area. Though they technically didn't separate, as Peter stealthy followed Banner all the way back to the pizzeria, wanting to make sure the squirrely scientist didn't try to run. Not like it would matter, as the hand and shield were still following him as well. Peter had to be careful dealing with Banner, 
So he refused to take any chances, though. On top of that, the team of Avengers that arrived with Peter was watching and listening in on that whole first meeting, ready to pounce should the need arise. They would continue to remain hidden but close by, as too many people may scare or excite Banner into turning green, which wouldn't be good for the people and property in the area. Thankfully, when Banner returned to Stanley's pizza parlor, Stan was already closing up without a customer in sight. You're back. The old man greeted Bruce warmly. Did you get what you needed? No. Banner answered as he looked outside the windows for any sign of Spider-Man. What's the matter? Were you followed? Stan asks as he stops what he was doing and checks the windows as well. Probably. Bruce answers as the kitchen door swings open behind them, causing the two to swing their heads around. Hello again. Peter says as he waves to them and inspects the pizza that was still left out. Hey, this looks okay. Are you from New York? Too shocked to answer the question, the old man turned to look towards Bruce, wordlessly asking what was happening with his eyes. Don't look at me. I have no idea what's going on today. Banner said as he watched the Spider-Man carefully inspecting the leftover pizzas. I ask because usually, the pizza outside of New York is subpar at best, with a few exceptions, of course. This looks like something I could get in the city. There's no way you're from Virginia. Peter says but soon loses interest in the pizza, as the old man didn't seem very talkative. Should we talk upstairs? Peter turned back toward Bruce and gestured toward the passing civilians outside. Um, mm Yeah. Banner replies, not wanting to draw attention to himself. Are you gonna be okay, kid? Stan finally speaks. Yeah, I think so. Banner says as he follows Peter toward the kitchen, where they went upstairs to his apartment. As the kitchen door was closing behind Banner, the door to the shop opened, and in came a dark-haired woman with blue eyes and a middle-aged man with dark hair and eyes. Insert picture of Betty Ross here, as Betty entered the shop with her boyfriend, Leonard, she saw a very familiar backside of a man heading to the back room. She instinctively knew who it was, but wasn't sure if her eyes weren't deceiving her. Bruce? She thought as Stan turned to see her with a look of worry on his face. We're pretty well closed here, Bets. I'm sorry. The old man says as he glances at the door, only increasing Betty's suspicion. Oh, come on, Stan. It's Friday night. She responded while studying Stan's odd behavior. Who just went in the back? Just a plumber. Stan lies but sadly she could see right through it. Toilets broken. Bruce is fixing toilets now? Betty says with a raised brow, causing Stan's eyes to widen which proves her suspicions right instantly. Ah? Uh? Stan was lost for words for the second time today. Bruce. Leonard questions with a confused look. Isn't he dead? Listen, you kids should really get going. Stan tried his best but Betty simply ignores him and marches into the kitchen. Wait! The old man calls out, but she was already gone. Standing frozen with the old pizza shop owner, Betty's boyfriend's face slowly morphed into one of concern and jealousy. He always hoped that Betty's missing ex was dead, not because he hated the man, but because he loves Betty and knows how she feels for the other man. While Stan started muttering to himself about how he did his best and that this wasn't his problem anymore, Leonard walked out of the shop and took out his cell phone, making a quick call. Climbing the stairs to his temporary apartment, Bruce lets Peter inside and turns on the lights. The blinds were still shut tight, so they simply took a seat in the living room without worry. How can you help me? Banner asks skeptically. In his mind, the Avengers may be strong, but they can't face the might of the United States military. First, the military isn't after you, Thaddeus Ross is. Peter says, confusing Banner. Ross is a general. If he's after me, the military is too. Bruce corrects Peter with a shake of his head. No, he lied to his superior about the reason for his trip to Brazil. The government thought that he was simply going to extract a scientist, nothing more. They didn't even know you were there. Most people think that you're dead. Peter said, causing Banner to raise an eyebrow. So, does that mean he's in trouble now? He asks hopefully. No, not yet. Peter said with a shake of his head. So you're telling me that after lying to his superiors and that whole mess in Brazil, Ross hasn't even been reprimanded and is probably still out there hunting for me? Banner raises his voice angrily. Say the word and we'll move in, Webhead. Peter could hear Tony's voice through his earpiece but didn't reply. Well, his superiors don't know just yet. Ross has become very adept at hiding his misdeeds over the years, but that doesn't mean they won't find out. After all, the Avengers are involved now. Peter says as he turns his head, sensing someone coming up the stairs. Right? Banner says, but before he could continue, the door to the stairway flies open and hits the wall. Bang, Bruce! Betty exclaims as she marches into the room, determined to find out what was going on. Betty? 
Bruce practically jumps out of his seat in surprise as their eyes meet. Well, this just got complicated, Peter says, causing Betty to turn towards him next. Spider-Man. She mutters in shock. Yeah, hello. Pete says with a wave. I'm here to help Bruce. Help with what? After a long explanation, where Peter sat back and watched the two reunited lovers speak, Betty was finally up to speed on what's been going on. What is it like? When it happens, what do you experience? Betty asks curiously, completely forgetting her boyfriend is waiting downstairs for her. Remember those experiments we volunteered for at Harvard? The induced hallucinations? It's a lot like that, just a thousand times worse. It's like someone poured a liter of acid into my brain. Bruce explains. Do you remember anything? She asks again. Just fragments. Images mostly. There's too much noise, I can never derive anything out of it. He says. But then, it's still you, inside of it. Betty says, but was soon cut off. No. No, it's not. Bruce says resolutely. Okay, this is touching and all, but it's getting late, so let's get this show on the road. The Avengers are willing to help and shelter you. We can deal with the military and help you research your condition. Are you interested? Bruce, I don't understand why we can't just walk in and talk to my father. Betty ignores Peter and speaks, trusting her father as she was raised by the man. No, he told me what he was gonna do. He wants it out of me. He wants to dissect it so he can replicate it. He wants to make it a weapon. I can't let that happen. It's too dangerous, Banner says, knowing just how scary the beast inside of himself was. Betty didn't know what to say. In her eyes, her father is a bit stern but he was still her father and she loved him, not some power-hungry general that would do anything for results. Though if what Bruce said is true, then how could she ever look at her father the same way again? So? Peter says, feeling like a third wheel somehow. You want our help? Yes, anything to get Ross off my back, but I need the research from the super soldier recreation experiment. That's why I came here, but it's all been deleted. I'll never be able to cure myself without that data. Bruce says dejectedly. No, it's not. Betty says, causing Banner's head to snap toward her. I have all the data from the project at home. I knew something was fishy when you disappeared so I copied it all and hid it away. There, problem solved. Where is it? Peter says as he wants to leave Virginia tonight. He knew how the movie went for this one, and if it goes by the same plot, then Ross and his soldiers would be arriving by tomorrow. Though things have changed with Peter's arrival, so he just wants to be safe. Peter isn't worried about the military, as General Ross and his army could be handled by a single Avenger, but the Hulk is a whole other story. The Hulk is a dangerous enemy after all. Ross is probably the only person on this planet that can anger Banner with his mere presence, so it's best to just keep them far apart for everyone's safety. Outside of Stanley's pizza parlor, Betty's boyfriend, Leonard was speaking in hushed tones over his cell phone. Yeah, you told me to call you if he ever shows up, so this is me doing that. I know. I'll try but you know how bullheaded she can be. Leonard practically whispered into the phone as he paced back and forth outside of the building. This guy is a weaselly little shit, isn't he? Across the street, inside the same building that Natasha and Clint previously occupied, Tony comments to his fellow Avengers. Just as they planned, Tony, Charles, Eric, Storm, and Nightcrawler tagged along for this mission. They followed Peter and Banner at a distance and sneakily hid in the building, listening to the conversation thanks to the microphone that they placed on Peter's suit beforehand. Though that wasn't the most interesting conversation going on across the street. When Betty Ross showed up with what appeared to be her boyfriend, all of them instantly knew that this could get complicated, as love tends to complicate just about everything. As soon as her boyfriend left the shop without her, they all knew that Betty caught on somehow, but what surprised them was the little rodent's actions upon stepping outside. He made a call almost instantly. Using one of the many abilities he added to his Iron Man suit, Tony was able to listen in on the call and was shocked to hear Betty Ross' boyfriend calling her father and ratting out Bruce without a shred of shame. What should we do? Charles asks, knowing that the military would rush over. Let's see what Webhead wants to do. Tony says as he opens communications to Peter once again. Hey, we got a problem. Where is it? Peter asks after hearing that Betty has the research that Bruce needs. As soon as Betty was about to answer him, Peter's earpiece goes off. Hey, we got a problem. Tony's voice came through. Betty's boyfriend just called the general and ratted Banner out. Furrowing his brows and going silent for a moment, Peter puts his hand on his ear, tapping the earpiece so he can speak back to Tony. Did he say that I'm here as well? Peter asks, confusing both Bruce and Betty, who wondered what was going on. Who are you talking to? Banner asks a bit anxiously. Waiting for a reply from Tony, Peter holds up his hand briefly, 
non-verbally telling the two to give him a minute. No, he didn't seem to know. Stark replies. Good, when he's off the phone, send Black Widow to sweep him up. We can't have the general know that we're involved just yet. He'll start backtracking and maybe go into hiding. Peter says and takes his hand off the earpiece. You got it. Stark says and the line goes quiet again. Who's Black Widow? What's going on? Betty starts asking as she saw that Peter was done speaking. Why did you mention the general? Banner asks suspiciously. Calm down. Peter says to Banner and looks toward Betty. Your boyfriend just called your father and snitched on Bruce, so now General Ross is on the way. I need to leave. Banner mutters as he instantly jumps to his feet and starts heading toward the door. As he reaches for the doorknob, Peter shoots a web at the door, sealing it shut and causing Bruce to whirl around and look at him dangerously. Oh, calm down. Peter rolled his eyes at Banner's behavior. He only just found out and he's definitely not even in the state. It'll most likely take him hours to get here at the least. We have time, so relax. Taking a deep breath, Banner paces around the room and tries to calm himself down as he can feel his pulse was rising. Betty, on the other hand, was shocked and didn't want to believe that Leonard would do such a thing. Then she remembers what Peter said about sweeping him up and rushed to the door. Sadly, the door was blocked by webs and a normal human would never be able to pull them off. If you're worried about your boyfriend, he'll be fine. We're just going to detain him until this is all wrapped up. He won't be harmed. You have my word. Peter says as he walks to one of the windows and peeked out just in time to see Natasha luring the man into an alleyway. As soon as they were out of the public eye, Natasha used a needle to inject him with something, causing the little rat to fall unconscious almost instantly. Target detained. Peter heard Natasha's voice over the comms. Since that's taken care of, let's go and get that research data. Then Banner can leave before the general arrives. Peter says, breaking the two from their thoughts. I it's in my basement. She says, scared for Leonard. Relax, we're the good guys. Your boyfriend will be released by tomorrow night at the latest. Now, let's go and get that data. Peter says as he walks over to the door and rips the webs off easily. As Peter walks down the stairs, both Bruce and Betty lock eyes and stare at each other for a brief moment before following after him. At an undisclosed military base, a middle-aged man in a blue shirt showed up out of nowhere and asked to speak to General Ross. He was almost turned away at the gates, but then he mentioned Bruce Banner's name, which immediately grabbed the general's attention. Insert picture of Samuel Stearns or Mr. Blue here, Dr. Samuel Stearns is a world-class cellular biologist, who has been using his connection with Bruce Banner to study what happened to him, hoping to do something similar but more controlled to himself. Dr. Stearns, are you telling me that you've been in contact with Banner and can make more like him? Ross asks after hearing what the man had to say. As soon as Banner didn't have the research data anymore, his helpful friend Mr. Blue gave up on him and went straight to a different source, General Ross. No, not yet. I've sorted out a few pieces, but it's not like I can put the same Humpty Dumpty back together if that's what you're asking. He was a freak accident, the goal is to do it better. The eccentric scientist explains. I like the sound of that. A new voice echoes into the room as Blonsky comes strolling in. Blonsky, I don't believe that I called for you. General Ross didn't like his subordinate acting so open in his presence. Sorry, sir. Blonsky says respectfully. But I would like to volunteer as Dr. Stern's test subject. Why? You're already enhanced. Ross asks in confusion. After being the one and only soldier to escape the Hulk's clutches back in Brazil, Blonsky was enhanced with a knockoff version of the Super Soldier Serum, which was still being tested by Ross scientists. Sadly, even compared to the original serum, the recreation used on him was about 50% weaker than the original, while the Hulk is well over 10,000% stronger than Captain America. Yeah, well, I want more. You've seen what he becomes, right? I can never measure up to that with just my current strength. Blonsky says, getting nods from both Ross and Stearns. I have, and it's beautiful. Almost godlike. Dr. Stearns comments with a far-off fanatical look. Make me that. It's the only way we can beat the green bastard. Blonsky says pleadingly. He wanted nothing more than to be a titan like the Hulk. A man that could move mountains with his strength alone. I don't know what you've got inside of you already. The mixture could become an abomination. Stern's comments after a moment's thought. Hearing this seems to anger Blonsky, who grabs Dr. Stern's by the collar and raises him into the air with ease. Stand down, Blonsky. General Ross orders with a threatening glare. Tisk, yes sir. Blonsky reluctantly dropped the scientist, who didn't expect it, and fell on his backside. Good. The general says as he turns to Stearns and offers him a hand, pulling the scientist onto his feet once again. 
Abomination or not, we need all the help we can get. I never said that I was unwilling. Dr. Stearns looks over at Blonsky in fear. I just needed informed consent. I can get to work on him immediately. Ring ring ring, get to work. I need to take this. General Ross shoes them out of his office and picks up his phone after seeing the caller ID. Leonard? Is there an emergency with my daughter? By the time they exited the pizza shop, Betty's boyfriend was nowhere to be seen. She peeked around for him but soon gave up as she knew that the Avengers had kidnapped him. Did you drive here? Peter asked as he gestured to the only car parked outside the shop. Why yeah, that's mine. She stutters, still shaken up by how quickly Leonard disappeared. Good, let's take your car then. Shaking off her piling emotions, Betty unlocked the car, and they soon drove off. The whole car was silent as they made their way out of town and toward Betty's house. Betty was dealing with the return of a man she loved even to this day and the abduction of her current lover. On top of all of that, her father may not be the man she thought he was. It's safe to say that she's having a very emotionally conflicting day. Banner sat in the passenger seat, staring at Betty as she drove the car. He loved this woman and he never forgot that love, even through the five years that he spent running and hiding from the US government. Sadly, she was already with another man, which is a bit crushing but it's been five years so he can't blame her. Though that doesn't stop the grudge that was forming toward her new lover. After all, he ratted Bruce out to his most hated enemy. Peter, on the other hand, sat in the back seat quietly listening to Fury on the radio. My people in General Ross Circle say that he's currently in New York. His men are gearing up and a plane is being readied for his departure. It will take about five hours for him to get here. Give or take. Fury informs everyone. Based on that time frame, Ross and his army would arrive by the morning. Should we send Banner away and stick around to capture the general? I see no reason to allow him free reign anymore. Charles says over the comms next. Hearing Charles's question, Peter remained silent for a moment. When it came to Iron Man, Peter allowed Tony to deal with Iron Munger, as it was his debut as a superhero in a way. Tony needed that first bad guy to beat in order to become who he was meant to be. In this case, the bad guy is a monster that is stronger than the base level Hulk. The Hulk would have to get pretty angry to beat the powerhouse that is Abomination. Emil Blonsky would become a terrifying creature, but to Peter's knowledge that hasn't happened yet. He only gains that level of power after this run-in with Banner in Virginia, which means that Peter may have a chance to stop the abomination before it's made. Maybe I should step in this time? Peter thought. Do we have all the evidence to justify his detainment? Peter holds his earpiece and speaks, catching the attention of the two in the front seats. I have all kinds of damning evidence on Ross going all the back to the 70s to his recent excursion to Brazil. Fury replies. Hmm, once we get the data Banner needs, we'll send him to the Avengers Tower and stick around to greet our guests in the morning. Fury, can you get transport ready for our green friend? Peter says over the comms. Will do. Fury replies curtly, knowing that Peter wants to hide his portal ability from Banner for the time being. Are you staying to capture my father? Betty asks, torn between whether she believes everything she has heard about her father today. Yes, he won't be harmed. I promise. Peter tries to comfort her. He needs to stand trial for his actions, so if you don't believe what we've told you today, then your father can be proven innocent in court. Betty goes quiet for a moment as her hands grip the steering wheel tightly. It's not that I don't believe you. It's just hard to think of my father like that. Dash one hour later, after getting a hard drive with all the data from Betty's house, which ended up being more of a mansion, they returned to the car and headed to a nearby airstrip. Seeing as Betty was a bit of a wild card, Peter discreetly texted Tony to monitor her phone. Family is important, so Peter wasn't sure if she would tip off her father or not. Thankfully, Betty seemed to be conflicted and that seemed to keep her from making a decision one way or another. Fury seems to always have a Quinjet close by for personal use, as that's what was waiting for them at the airstrip. Banner would be riding to New York in style. I've never seen that before. Betty comments, as she's been around the military all her life, yet this jet was something new to her. Yeah, it belongs to a friend. Peter says as they park the car and step out. Maybe you should come with me, Betty. Banner says as he glances at the jet. I don't think it's going to be safe here in the morning. Usually, Banner would push her away, afraid of hurting Betty as the Hulk, but he was currently leaving what may become a war zone. Betty looks between the jet and Banner before walking forward and embracing her long-lost lover in a tight hug, surprising the man. I'm sorry, Bruce, but I need to see if my dad is really the man you told me about. I can't just, chop before Betty could finish what she was saying, Peter Karate chopped her in the neck from behind. Instantly, Betty lost consciousness as her whole body went limp. 
Thankfully, Banner already had her in his arms, so he supported her before she could collapse onto the cold hard ground. What? Why? Banner reacted with surprise but slowly anger started to show on his face as he cradled Betty's body. She'll be going with you. Peter replies calmly. She can speak to her father in a safer setting. Not just for her safety, but everyone else's as well. I have a feeling that you would get very angry should anything happen to her. Banner couldn't find a single word to argue back with, and soon his anger washed away. He didn't want her staying as well, and this solved that problem. Betty would be angry with them when she wakes up, but that can be handled at that time. You're right. Banner admits as he looks down at the woman in his arms. Though you could have been gentler. Maybe, now get on the jet. I'll see you at the tower when we're finished here. Peter says and shoes him away. I think you're forgetting something. Banner says as he gestures toward the hard drive in Peter's hand. No, I don't think that I did. Peter answers simply, not willing to hand over the data just yet. You, Bruce, are a man that thinks he's a lone wolf. I have not a single doubt in my mind that you'll go back into hiding upon landing. Turning around, Peter gets in Betty's car and rolls down the window, holding up the hard drive for Banner to see. This will be your incentive to stick around. Peter says as he starts the car. See you in New York, Bruce. As Peter drives off, Banner couldn't help but curse Spider-Man's name. The guy had him pegged perfectly, though. He planned to get the data and slip away into hiding. Preferably, to a less populated area, where he would contact his good friend Mr. Blue for help. Sadly for him, Peter already knew Banner's character from the movies and wouldn't let that happen. While General Ross was rushing to Virginia on a military plane, Blonsky and Dr. Stearns were in a lab unpacking supplies. What's that? Blonsky asked curiously as he watched Dr. Stearns organize his things. General Ross had this lab made in New York City after the incident that created the Hulk five years ago. Many scientists still work on the super soldier serum here to this very day, but none have come as close to completing it as Banner had. This dash, Stearns holds up a vial of what appeared to be blood. Is a blood sample from Banner. I had him send me this a year ago. It took months of persuasion to get him to mail this tiny amount to me. As Stearns places the sample into a glass fridge for storage, Blonsky watched his every movement, never taking his eyes off of the sample. Are they gone? Peter asked over the radio as he drove Betty's car on the dark highway. Yes, I'm following them back as planned. Storm speaks over the radio. Thank you, I apologize for giving you the boring job. Peter says, feeling bad for sending her away on the first mission. No problem. I don't relish in fighting, and this is an important job. Storm replies without care. Good, just keep us updated. If anything happens, I'll portal over to assist you. Peter says, as he opens a portal in the road, which swallows the car, leaving behind an empty highway. Betty's mansion comes into view as the portal closes behind him. Pulling into the driveway, Peter is met by the remaining Avengers members. That went well. Tony says with a smile. Yes, Mr. Banner has good control over his emotions. I could feel every fluctuation in his emotional state, and he was constantly working to keep himself calm and together. Though, there's a wave of constant anger in him that is concerning, to say the least. Professor X rolls over and shares his findings as well. Odd, maybe it's just the way he is? We can look into that later, though. I'm sure he'll be thrilled with us helping in his research. Peter comments. Peter didn't think that there will ever be a cure for the Hulk. The Hulk, in Peter's opinion, is a physical manifestation of Bruce Banner's rage and anger. As long as Bruce has these feelings, then the Hulk will always exist. Seeing as Bruce tried to kill himself and failed due to the Hulk, Peter wasn't even sure if Banner could take any drugs to dull those emotions either. Would they even be effective? No, if there was a cure that could get rid of the Hulk, Bruce would have found it in the movies. Peter thought. The best option is for Bruce to accept and reconcile with the Hulk, as he did in Avengers Endgame. At least then they can merge into a singular being, negating each other weaknesses. A Hulk with the brains of Bruce Banner. The general should be arriving in a few hours. Peter says as he checks the time on his phone. Do we know where he's landing? Minus four hours later, at an undisclosed airstrip in Virginia only a handful of miles away from Culver University, the sun rose only moments ago as one large military transport plane landed on the strip. Though it wasn't the only one. One after another, four planes landed in total each of them carrying able-bodied soldiers, vehicles, and equipment. When every plane landed, the soldiers from each plane hustled and bustled to get to their respective duties. Whether they be moving crates, driving vehicles, or simply securing the perimeter, these soldiers moved with purpose as they executed their orders perfectly. Was that the last plane? Peter asks over the comms from his hiding spot in a nearby tree line. Yup, no other planes are in the area. Tony answers him. 
Good, who wants to take the lead? Peter asks, but no one speaks up. Well, Magneto seemed eager, but the man was a bit too hot-headed, so everyone ignored him in this instance. Though he has been calming down as of late. It just takes time for someone that had a villain mentality to adjust to the hero's gig, but he has been adapting well so far. I guess I'll take the lead then. Peter says with a sigh. Everyone wants the feeling and power of being in charge, but they don't want any of the responsibility, which is something Peter has learned in the many months since making the Avengers. Even seasoned veterans like those on the Avengers Council would rather offload the work and responsibilities onto another capable person. Sadly or luckily, depending on how you look at it, this person was Peter. This made Peter a sort of leader in the Avengers. He still couldn't make decisions on his own or anything like that, but his words carried more weight than the others did, for sure. After all, he does most of the work. Though, he couldn't blame anyone for this. Tony is a lazy playboy, Fury is busy with S.H.I.E.L.D., Charles is busy with his school, and Eric is a bit extreme for a leadership role. Peter was the only option really, and he didn't mind being the one to take control in a way. I'll head down there and speak to them. Peter says as he uses his webs to catapult himself out of the tree line and straight toward the airstrip. You guys get into position and be ready for a fight. Remember, no killing or maiming as long as you can help it. This is our first mission, and we don't need the media freaking out about the Avengers killing American soldiers. Yeah, we got it. Just be quick. I haven't slept yet. Tony says crankily, getting some words of agreement from everyone else. They did stay up for the whole night waiting for General Ross to arrive, so he couldn't blame them for being tired. Peter wasn't all that tired, but that was probably because of his age. He is the youngest one here, after all. Though they didn't know that. I thought you'd be used to all-nighters at this point, Tony. Peter jokes over the comms as he flew closer to the airstrip. That's different. Those all-nighters are spent in air conditioning, preferably drunk and with some lovely women. Tony banters back. I'm so jealous. Nightcrawler mutters, probably forgetting that they could hear him. As Peter soared closer to the airstrip, it didn't take long for the soldiers to notice his arrival. At first, they just saw a blurry blue and red figure in the air, but as he got closer, the men and women with good eyesight immediately knew who was visiting them. Spider-Man. One muttered, which caused a chain reaction amongst the soldiers. It can't be. Why would Spider-Man be here? That's definitely him. Forgetting that they were supposed to be guarding the airstrip, each soldier watches Peter shoot past their defenses and land next to one of the planes with the grace of a cat landing on its feet. They didn't even raise a gun in his direction. Hello, I'm here to speak to General Ross. Peter says with a wave to the surrounding soldiers. Each soldier was too shocked to say a word, but that didn't last long, as the man himself came driving over in a Humvee. What's going on here? Not knowing exactly what's happening, General Ross exits the car and sees his men standing around with dumb looks on their faces. There better be a good reason for. Before any more words could leave his mouth, the general turned to see a man dressed as Spider-Man standing next to one of his planes. Is this a joke? Ross muttered questioningly. I'm afraid not. Peter says with a shake of his head. General Ross, you're under arrest. As Peter says this, he shoots some webs in the general's direction. Wrapping the old man's arms and legs tightly together and knocking him to the ground. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Do you understand the rights I have just read to you? Peter says as if he were a police officer, as Ross wiggles on the floor like an angry worm. What's the meaning of this? General Ross shouts angrily. Do you know who you're attacking? I'm a United States general. Yeah, I know. Peter says I'm caring. Sadly for you, the Avengers have been watching your movements. You may be able to hide your mistakes and misdeeds from your superiors, but not us. Exclamation point. General Ross instantly became alarmed as he stopped struggling and looked up at Peter in shock. As the shock wore off, the general's mind went into overdrive, trying to figure out a way to overcome this situation. It took only a split second for the general to make up his mind. Weapons ready. He shouts, causing every soldier in hearing distance to train their guns on Peter without a second thought. They were trained to follow orders, and so they did. I'll warn you once. Ross says as he glares in Peter's direction. Leave and stay out of my business. You don't want me as an enemy. No, thanks, I think I'll stay. Peter answers challengingly. Fire. The general ordered without a shred of remorse. Bang bang bang. Instantly, the sound of gunfire filled the airstrip as about a hundred soldiers fired their weapons all at once. Kicking off the ground and into the air, each bullet passes under Peter, but that's not all. 
He was surrounded by soldiers, so these bullets that were supposed to only hit him were now heading toward friendly soldiers. Before any of the bullets could claim the lives of a single soldier, the tiny metal missiles were stopped midair, shocking everyone who thought they were about to die. When you said no killing, I never thought that I would have to stop them from killing each other as well. Magneto comments as he floats over and flicks his hand, which causes all the bullets to fall out of the air. When you said no killing, I never thought that I would have to stop them from killing each other as well. Magneto comments as he floats over and flicks his hand, which causes all the bullets to fall out of the air. Each soldier watched the bullets that would have torn them apart fall to the ground with frightened looks on their faces. Thanks, Eric. Peter says to Magneto as he lands on the ground beside General Ross, who was still tied up on the floor. No problem. Eric says, as he stays floating in the air, looking down at the soldiers menacingly. Before the army could make another move, Iron Man and Professor X made their entrances next. Using his telekinesis, Charles landed his chair beside Peter, while Tony stayed in the air with Eric, ready to fight at any moment. I advise you all to stand down. Peter takes the lead once again. You may have the numerical advantage and some military hardware, but we came here expecting to possibly fight an angry green monster. Compared to that guy, the bunch of you are nothing special. Now, put your weapons down and surrender. I promise that none of you will be treated harshly. The soldiers paused and looked around at their comrades, each of them contemplating how to handle the situation. Shooting Spider-Man was hard for them to do in the first place, as he's a hero that many of these soldiers respect, but one person held more respect in the military than even Peter. Tony Stark. The majority of these soldiers looked up at the Iron Man armor with awe and respect in their eyes. The Starks have always had the respect of the military, ever since World War II. Hearing Peter's words and seeing the arrival of Tony Stark, many of the soldiers lowered their weapons, ready to peacefully cooperate with the Avengers. Don't listen to him and fire. Those that didn't lower their weapons instantly took aim at the nearest Avenger and fired. Thankfully, they have Magneto on their side, who once again stopped all bullets in midair with ease. Especially since the majority of soldiers weren't shooting this time, which made his job even easier. This time the shooting lasted longer, as each soldier that shot emptied their clip, hoping that more bullets would solve their problem. Sadly, it didn't. Magneto is an old Omega-level metahuman. He has had many years to train his powers and this certainly isn't the first time he has encountered automatic assault rifles. Jarvis, lock onto those that are shooting. Tony commands from his place in the sky. As Tony looks down at the many soldiers, his heads-up display gets to work and marks each hostile soldier with a glowing square. Good, now set weapon systems to stun and let him loose. Tony says and many compartments all over his suit open up. From these compartments appeared all kinds of different weapons. Stun guns, tranquilizer guns, there was even a futuristic-looking blaster that popped out of his shoulder. It glowed in a pale blue light as it seemed to charge up. Within seconds, Tony resembled Farah from Overwatch, as non-lethal weaponry were fired down from the sky at each of the previously marked soldiers with pinpoint accuracy. Justice reigns from above. Peter thought as he saw the whole thing. I played too much Overwatch in my last life. As the soldiers were hit by the darts and stun weapons, the soldiers that didn't shoot watched as those that did were swiftly taken care of. Some were hit by stun darts that electrocuted them, some were drugged into unconsciousness by tranquilizer darts, and some were hit by what seemed to be a laser that instantly made them collapse. When the hostile soldiers were all on the floor and unconscious, Peter acted quickly before anyone else could get any funny ideas. Don't worry, your friends are all alive and well. Peter says as he can see the remaining soldiers growing antsy after seeing their comrades taken down like that. Feel free to move them for treatment if their condition worries you. We're only here for General Ross, so although you and your comrades here attacked us, we'll overlook that with the excuse of following orders. Don't listen to this idiot. General Ross starts yelling in anger once again. Use those weapons and cut me loose now. You incompetent foo, LS, as the general was screaming more orders at his soldiers, who had no idea what to do at this point, a tranquilizer dart shoots out of nowhere and pierces into his neck. God, you never know when to shut your mouth, do you, Thaddeus? Before General Ross fell into sweet sweet unconsciousness, he remained awake just long enough to see who was speaking. F Fury? Ross stuttered before his willpower gave out and he fell asleep on the cold hard ground. Said person walked out from behind one of the military planes with a recently fired tranquilizer gun in hand, causing every soldier to turn their heads in his direction with dumb looks on their faces. What are you waiting for? Fury snaps at them instantly. You heard the man. Get your comrades treated and cleaned up, now. Peter didn't know if it was because Fury spent a lot of time in the army or because he has been leading people for longer, 
but these soldiers followed his orders instantly. As the soldiers were scrambling to do as they were told, one of the more high-ranking grunts belonging to Ross walked off into a secluded area and made a phone call. With General Ross in custody, Peter looked around for Emil Blonsky but didn't find the guy anywhere on the airstrip. Asking around, he soon found out that Blonsky stayed behind in New York for some reason. Sadly, no one here knew why, and the only man that could give him answers was currently in a drug-induced sleep. This wasn't supposed to happen. Peter thought as he and the Avengers left the area with the unconscious general in tow. Though, I knew this would happen sooner or later. Asshole! Betty yelled in anger as she kicked the door of the Quinjet from the inside. They were almost in New York, where they would land at the top of Avengers Tower. Bruce hoped that the whole ride would be peaceful, but that hope was crushed as his ex-girlfriend sprung up from her sleep. Once he explained to her what happened, Betty started cursing Spider-Man's name as she let out her anger on their poor transport. You know, I know a few techniques that could help you manage that anger effectively. Banner offers, but that seemed to only bring himself into the crosshairs. You zip it. She snaps her head in his direction and hisses angrily. Okay. In a fully stocked lab, both Dr. Stearns and Emil Blonsky could be seen sitting at a table by a phone. You're ordered to halt all research for the time being and move everything to the location that I provided earlier. Wait there for further instructions. With the general captured by the Avengers, it's only a matter of time before they come snooping around. Do you understand? A female voice says over speakerphone. Yes, understood. Dr. Stearns answered. Blonsky? She asks as only one person answered her. Understood, ma'am. He answers her through gritted teeth. Good, I'll see you too soon. She says and swiftly ends the call. Ah, she's an annoying bitch, isn't she? Blonsky comments hatefully toward Major Kathleen Spar, who is a high-level aide to General Ross. Why must you use such language constantly? Stearns asks as Blonsky pulls out his pistol and rests the barrel on the scientist's forehead. Now what, could I have possibly done, to deserve such aggression? It's not about what you've done, it's what you're gonna do. Blonsky mumbles agitatedly, causing Dr. Stearns to raise his head in interest. I want what you've got off banner, I want that. Blonsky points to the blood sample in the glass fridge. Okay. Stearns agrees with a glimmer of interest in his eyes. Good. Blonsky says, slightly surprised by the doctor's quick agreement. Now, load me up. Holding out his arm expectantly, Blonsky waits as Dr. Stearns walks over to the fridge and pours Banner's blood into a syringe with a long needle attached to it. Are you sure about this? Stearns asks as he holds the needle centimeters from Blonsky's skin. Just do it already. Blonsky answers back in annoyance. Okay. Dr. Stearns mutters as the needle pierces the soldier's skin and he pushes the plunger at the end, injecting the blood. Finally. Betty comments as the Quinjet lands on the helipad at the top of Avengers Tower. Yeah, I could use some food right about now. Banner says, as they just spent hours on a jet without any food or water. Same, let's hope that they have something to eat. Betty replies as they see a door on the roof, but soon find that it's locked tight with a keypad on the side. Okay? I think that I hate Spider-Man. While Betty was having her realization of hatred, Banner tried to punch in some random codes on the keypad, but nothing worked. They were stuck on the roof. As they were stranded, Betty did what she did earlier on the Quinjet and started kicking the door in anger. Truly, this was one of the worst days of her entire life. I can help with that. A voice calls out from above, as the former lovers turn to see a white-haired and dark-skinned woman descend onto the roof behind them. Meanwhile, Aefor, Oorur. As the blood was injected into Blonsky's arm, the reaction was almost instant. His body began to swell and turn a sickly green color. His skin resembled that of a lizard but also looked slimy and wet like a frog. Awawagher. Spiky bones grew out of his back where the spine was as his body grew to a size even bigger than the Hulk, breaking the ceiling and equipment around him. You see, this is what. I've been trying to explain. Dr. Stern says as the abomination grows and begins to tower over him. I didn't know what you were already enhanced with. Blonsky's hair fell off as if he were a cancer patient, as odd-looking fish fin ears formed on the sides of his head. I mean, clearly it worked. Stearns cowers in fear as Blonsky's transformation was complete. Let's assume that you don't know what I'm saying, but if you'll just calm down. I can fix this. Insert picture of abomination here, all sense of reason seems to have left Blonsky, as he menacingly looks down at Stearns, who was practically huddled up in the corner. Oh Orfer. Abomination growls as he backhands Dr. Stearns across the face. Instantly, a big gash opens up in the doctor's forehead as his body flies over to the glass fridge. 
As he smashes into the fridge, causing it to shatter, the vial that held only a few leftover drops of Banner's blood broke and a single drop managed to find its way into Stern's open wound on his head. As the blood was absorbed into the open gash, Stern's head seemed to morph and grow as a sickening smile formed on his face. Bang boom, with its creator out of the way, Abomination rushes across the room and smashes through the wall, breaking out of the building. Even at night, the roads and sidewalks of New York City were packed with cars and people. As soon as a bang was heard, everyone turned to see a giant lizard-like monster man fall from a nearby building, barreling down toward the packed street below. What the? Someone muttered as the monster crashed down onto a taxi, flattening it with its giant body and most certainly killing whoever was inside. Agawagur. The abomination roared so loudly that it could be heard for multiple city blocks. When the shock of what they were seeing wore off, the people on the sidewalk ran and screamed as they do their best to just get the hell away from the thing that fell onto the road. Those in their cars tried to drive off at first but with the New York City traffic that was impossible. Everyone trying to drive off at once somehow only made it worse, so they all gave up on their cars and ran away just like the people on the sidewalk. Luckily for these people, Abomination didn't even have them in his eyes. No, he turned his head and looked toward a tall skyscraper in the distance. The big glowing sign at the top of the building was like a beacon pointing him in the right direction to go. Avengers, without giving the fleeing civilians a second glance, Abomination kicks off the ground and starts making its way toward the tower. In his drug and power addled mind, Blonsky was looking for a fight and saw it in the Avengers. He even hoped that the Hulk would be there as well. This is the cafeteria. Storm acted like a good host and showed Bruce and Betty around the key spots of the Avengers Tower. Yes. Finally. Betty says as she walks up to the counter and starts ordering some food from the chefs. Sorry, I don't think either of us has eaten anything in the past 10 hours. Bruce says as he joins his ex-lover in getting some long-awaited food. Ms. Monroe, there seems to be a disturbance in Harlem. The voice of Jarvis fills the room for all to hear. What is it? She asks. One moment please. Jarvis says as the room goes silent. What's going on? Betty asks as she and Banner walk over. Their orders were already made, so now they were just waiting for the food to be done. It appears to be a big green monster, ma'am. Jarvis reports back after searching social media and other sources for information. What? That's impossible. I'm right here. Banner says in confusion. Have a look, sir. Jarvis says, as a nearby TV lights up, showing surveillance footage of Abomination squashing a car with its entire body. What the hell? Banner was confused, but soon remembered that General Ross flew from New York to Virginia. Is this his doing? Jarvis, inform Stark about what's going on. Storm says as clouds begin to form around the Avengers Tower. Already done. Jarvis says as the video on the TV shows the monster running in a certain direction. Ma'am, it seems to be headed in our direction. Good. Storm says as she walks to a nearby balcony with Betty and Bruce following after her. W what should we do? Betty asks in fear. Stay here dash Storm says as she turns to look Bruce square in the eyes. And stay calm. We'll take care of this. Rumble 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 as Storm ascends into the air and shoots off toward the sounds of roaring and destruction, lighting dances along the clouds and the sound of thunder fills the night air. Oddly enough, the stormy clouds seem to follow her as she flies off. Sir, there seems to be a problem in New York. Jarvis voice echoes from Tony's suit. After capturing General Ross, the Avengers team let the soldiers off for their attacks against them and carted off their captive to a secluded area. They plan to take a portal back to Avengers Tower without any prying eyes watching them. What's the problem? Peter asks as he and everyone else heard Jarvis speak. Did Blonsky do it or did Banner lose his cool? A big green monster appeared in Harlem. Ms. Monroe is on her way to deal with it, but backup may be needed. Jarvis answers as a hologram appears from Tony's suit, showing exactly what Storm saw before heading out. Is it Banner? Charles asks in worry. After all, they just sent a man that could topple a city if angered to one of the biggest cities in the world. No, Mr. Banner and Ms. Ross are currently in the cafeteria of Avengers Tower. Jarvis answers negatively. Whoever or whatever it is, let's just get back and deal with it quickly before anyone gets hurt. Peter says as he opens a portal to the hallway outside said cafeteria, still trying to keep that power secret from the Hulk. Let's go. Peter says as he walks through with the webbed U general on his shoulder. Tossing Ross onto the hallway floors, Peter turns towards Fury as he steps inside. Get him to a secure location. We'll go in backup storm. Peter says as he walks into the cafeteria followed by the whole team. Bruce, Betty, good to see you both again. Walking past them after a short greeting, Peter jumps off of the nearby balcony without giving them a chance to reply. 
Apparently, he was the only one with some manners, as the rest of the Avengers practically ignored them while following Peter off the building. Banner watched their backs as they jumped off of the balcony and into danger with an odd feeling. He almost felt as if he should be joining them but quickly does his best to squash that feeling. We'll take care of this. Storm says as she flies off into the distance, leaving behind both Betty and Bruce. She didn't know which direction the monster was coming from, but she didn't need that information in the first place. It only took Storm moments to find Abomination as it was hard not to notice where the animalistic roars and sounds of destruction were coming from. Heading that way and bringing the thunderous weather with her, Storm caught sight of a towering green figure barreling down the street toward the Avengers Tower, crushing cars and destroying anything in its wake. As she isn't a close quarters fighter, Storm didn't bother landing or getting too close, simply deciding to follow Abomination from above. Closing her eye for a brief moment, Aurora seemed to exert herself for just a brief moment as the sounds of thunder intensified. Opening her eyes a moment later, an unnaturally bright blue light illuminated from her eye sockets. Hearing the intense thunderstorm going on above, Abomination stops for a moment and looks up to see the tiny figure of a woman with glowing eyes floating in the clouds. Huh? Blonsky grunts in a deep and monstrous tone. Before he could understand what was happening, countless strands of lightning filled the sky, seeming to almost dance around the woman. Mesmerized by what he was seeing, Abomination stood in awe as every strand of lightning converged to form a giant blue bolt of energy. Fear set in as the glowing eyes of the flying woman lock onto him. Instantly, Blonsky knew that he was in danger, as his brain was telling every nerve in his body to move. Thanks to his training as a soldier and the enhancements his body has gone through, Abomination was able to push past the fear and run for cover. Sadly, his enhancements didn't make him faster than lightning, which moves at 270,000 miles per hour. Zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
He fought through the pain and went to slap Storm out of the air like a fly. Just as the giant green hand was about to make contact, a nearby Prius flew through the air and smacked Abomination Square in the jaw with its front number. This sent the sickly green monster tumbling backward, causing the trajectory of the slap to go off course and miss Storm completely. Hello, MS, Monroe. Having a hard time. Magneto floats over with his trademark smirk, two other cars floating over his shoulders. Storm still didn't have a good opinion of Eric, so she didn't want to answer him. Especially when he has that infuriating smile on his face. What? No, thank you for saving your life? Eric asks a bit condescendingly. Be nice, Eric. Charles says as he floats over on his chair. I'm always nice. Eric says as he sees Abomination rising back to his feet and sends the other two cars shooting in its direction. Right. Charles says unbelievably as he turns his head to see Nightcrawler on a nearby building. Kurt, take Aurora back to the tower for treatment. We'll handle this from here. Right, boss. Kurt says as he disappears from his spot on the building and appears beside Storm. Let's go. As he finished talking, both he and Storm disappear in a puff of blue smoke, leaving the battle to the rest of them. The police are safe. Peter comes swinging over and lands on a streetlight between both Eric and Charles. How are things here? Aurora was hurt, so Kurt took her back to the tower. Charles explains. Oh, he's getting back up? Eric comments, but something odd happens. A fourth car goes flying in Abomination's direction, slapping him square in the forehead and sending Blonsky back to the ground. Huh? Eric grunts in confusion as he wasn't the one to throw that car. Back in Avengers Tower, Betty and Bruce were both watching the TV in the cafeteria with plates of food in front of them. Neither has touched their food, as the sights being shown on the screen in front of them were too shocking. When Storm left, they asked Jarvis to continue showing them what was happening. At this point, both ex-lovers almost knew that this monster had to be related to General Ross. Most likely he was trying to make something like the Hulk and it just went out of hand. Watching the fight between Storm and Abomination, that same feeling that Banner felt earlier arose from deep within him. As he watched the monster crushing Aurora with its tight grip, Bruce couldn't find it in himself to sit by and do nothing. Weirdly, he felt responsible somehow. Standing to his feet, Banner walked over to the same balcony that the Avengers leaped off of. Hey! Betty calls out as she follows behind him with worry written all over her face. Where are you going? To help? Bruce mutters as he peeks over the edge of the balcony at the world below. What? You can't control it, remember? Betty says, referring to the Hulk. Yeah, but maybe I can aim it? Banner says as he stares down at the streets below. What if you can't? Betty asks, scared of what might happen with two monsters running around the city. I don't know. Bruce says as he climbs up on the ledge and looks down. But I have to try. Wait. Betty yells and reaches out to grab him but it was too late. Banner leaned forward with his eyes closed and fell out of the building from the 122nd floor. As he descended closer and closer to the ground below, Bruce opened his eyes which were now a vibrant shade of green. As the fourth car comes flying past Peter and the Avengers, smashing into Abomination who was just getting back to his feet from the other three cars sent his way, everyone turned to see where it came from. Hulk smash. A new voice fills the air as a giant green mass comes barreling past the Avengers. The Hulk didn't slow down for a second as it ran up to Abomination and punted its head, sending its large body flying back and into a nearby building, which causes a good portion of it to crumble. This isn't good. Charles mutters as they now have two monsters to deal with. It's like a monster movie? A metallic voice says from above as Iron Man joins them. Where's Godzilla when you need M? I don't think it's as bad as you would think. Peter says as he watched the Hulk. Hulk came here and immediately started fighting Abomination. Even after Abomination was sent flying into the building, Hulk hasn't started rampaging and destroying everything. No, he simply waited to see what its enemy would do next. You think it's helping us? Eric asks skeptically. I think he's helping us. Peter corrects as Abomination bursts out of the rubble of the building and turns to see Hulk standing there. Banner. Blonsky yells in surprise but also joy. Yes. Ha 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 ha. I've been waiting for this. Let's see which of us is the better monster. Come, ugly lizard. Hulk says as he motions for Abomination to come at him. Want help, big guy? Peter swings over to Hulk, hanging upside down next to his green head. Bug? Hulk comments as he turns to see the spider-themed suit Peter was wearing. Spider. Peter says as he points to himself. Don't ignore me. Abomination yells as he kicks off the ground and sprints toward Hulk. Incoming. Peter calls out as he pulls on his web and launches himself out of harm's way. Huh? 
The Hulk was a bit slower to react and took a punch to the jaw, which sent the big guy staggering backward. Capitalizing on his advantage, Blonsky moves forward to hit Hulk again. Pardon me. Peter mutters as he shoots a web at Abomination's fist and dives between the giant's legs, pulling the web along the way. The hand that would have hit Hulk for a second time instead was pulled under Abomination's body, causing the giant to almost do a front flip. Thanks to his newfound strength however, Abomination was able to keep its footing and pull its arm back, yanking Peter back through his legs in the process. Hey, funny seeing you here. Peter says as he uses the momentum from the monster pulling him to kick off the ground and introduce his boot to Blonsky's chin. Peter wasn't as strong as the Hulk or Abomination, but a full power strike from him wasn't something to scoff at. Abomination took the hit directly and stumbled backward a single step, rubbing his jaw with a look of surprise and discomfort. You're pretty strong for a little guy. Abomination says as he begins to see Spider-Man in a new light. Hulk strong too. Hulk says as he appears beside Blonsky with a car in each hand as if they were boxing gloves. Before Abomination could react, a car-wrapped green fist smashes into the side of its ribs, sending the monster flying away from Peter and Hulk. That's what I'm talking about. Peter says as he leaps onto Hulk's shoulder. Let's go kick his butt. Spider smash. Hulk asks as he turns his head to Peter. Yeah, buddy. Peter says with a thumbs up. Let's smash the hell out of this guy. Hulk looks at Peter suspiciously for a moment before reaching up and flicking him off his shoulder with a single finger. Hey! Peter says with a look of betrayal as he's sent flying across the street and lands on his feet with ease. Hulk no trust humans. All puny humans are Hulk enemy, and Hulk will smash them all. Hulk says as he turns away from Peter and toward Abomination. Go! Hulk smash alone. Haha, <laughs> that's what you get for thinking you know everything. Tony laughed from above as he watched his best friend get flicked away like a bug. He doesn't seem to want our help. Charles says as well. Should we just sit back and watch? Eric asked with an amused look on his face. No, we can't just do nothing while two monsters fight in the middle of the city. Peter says with a shake of his head as both Hulk and Abomination start exchanging blows once again. What should we do then? Tony asks as all three of them turn to Peter. Charles, see if you can put them to sleep with your telepathy, but be careful. Peter says as this was the reason he was chosen to join this mission in the first place. All right? Charles says as he places his hand on the side of his head and closes his eyes in concentration. Unlucky for him, Charles chose to start with Hulk and that was just the worst idea he could have had. As he tried to project the feeling of being tired and sleepy into the Hulk's mind, Charles's consciousness touched a small portion of the monumental anger that fuels the Hulk's existence and power. Almost immediately, Charles's face scrunched up in pain and anger as Hulk's anger began to influence and cloud the professor's mind. It didn't take long for Charles to pass out from the weight of all that anger, causing the wheelchair-bound professor to fall from the sky. Meanwhile, Hulk wasn't affected at all. Ha! Huh? Eric grunts in surprise as he uses his metal manipulation to hold Charles by his wheelchair. Taking a closer look, they could see that Professor X was bleeding from the nose slightly, but other than that, he was thankfully still breathing and seemed alright. Okay, that was a failure. Peter comments as he opens a portal next to Charles. Send him through, Eric. Sure. Magneto says as he looks at his friend worriedly. Their time spent together lately has made it hard for Eric to see Charles hurt like this, which is understandable. Don't worry, he'll be fine. Pets say as he hops through the portal with Charles. Let those two fight for a minute but keep the civilians safe and destruction at a minimum. I'll be right back. As the portal closed, Peter used a quick healing spell on Charles before depositing him into a bed at Avengers Tower. They would have time to check on him after the situation was dealt with. By the time Peter returned, only a few minutes had passed and Hulk seemed to be on the losing end of the fight. Eric and Tony were following the two from above, using anything they could to contain the brawl to the street and away from any people or buildings. Peter thought about sending the two Goliaths to the Mirror Dimension, where they could fight to their heart's content, but then an idea formed in his head. Hulk was always one of the more controversial Avengers. He is less controlled and caused property damage like no one's business. Not only that, he was also fairly scary to the general public. That can all be changed with this situation. Abomination appeared and scared the hell out of everyone while causing who knows how much damage and casualties, and who comes to save the day? The Avengers. Of course, the Hulk would count as a member of the Avengers in the eyes of the public. After all, they are both fighting the same monster. Peter just has to get Hulk to accept his help and the people would love him. Especially after videos are shown of them fighting together. Speaking of video, Peter could hear and see multiple news helicopters in the air. They're all keeping a good distance though, which Peter was thankful for. At this point in the fight, 
Abomination was straddled on Hulk's chest and raining down punch after punch to the big guy's face, which was cut open in multiple places and swelling by the second. Hulk looked like a man that got into the ring with Mike Tyson. Oh no, you don't. Peter mutters as he shoots a couple webs on each side of the street and uses them to catapult himself toward the fight. Soaring through the air, Peter turns his body horizontally and goes in feet first. Just as Blonsky was about to smash Hulk's face in with another devastating hammer fist, Peter launches over like a torpedo and kicks him square in the face with both feet. The hit sends Abomination barreling backward and off of Hulk. Peter lands beside Hulk's head and slaps his bruised cheek a few times. Wake up, big guy. We got a monster to smash. Feeling some taps on his face, Hulk groggily opens his eyes. The last thing he remembers was losing to the lizard man looking thing and then getting hit over and over again without the power to retaliate. Wake up, big guy. We got a monster to smash. A voice says as Hulk sees the spider that he flicked away only moments ago. Thinking back, maybe he should have taken the spider up on his offer to work together, as only minutes after turning him down, Hulk was getting beaten so badly that he passed out for a brief moment. The only problem with accepting help from a human is the fact that every human Hulk's ever met has either been deathly afraid of him or attacked him with military-grade weaponry. Hulk has a very bad opinion of humans and that opinion is completely fair and justified. After all, ever since the day he was born, Hulk has had to fight his other half's battles for him. All of those battles against humans. Those that didn't attack him, cowered in fear or ran away, and that type of treatment to a newborn being certainly won't help in their development. It's safe to say that the Hulk has some problems. Not only does he have trust and identity issues, but he was also molded into a racist somehow. Racist toward the human race to be exact. He's a giant with the mind of a child but no one has had the opportunity or inclination to ever find all of this out. They were usually too busy running in the other direction or shooting in his direction. Come on, big guy. Don't look at me like that. Peter says with an unseen pout as he sees Hulk's annoyed face. Let's be friends. We can beat that monster together and get some pizza afterward. My treat? Hulk has no friends. Hulk exclaims as he sits up and sees Abomination getting back up to his feet as well. That's right. Blonsky yells. We're practically gods. Friends, family, possessions. All we need is to know who's the strongest and that's me. Hulk is strongest monster. Hulk corrects challengingly as he rushes at Abomination. Fine, let's do this the hard way. Peter muttered as he watched Hulk and Abomination go at it once again. As the two start throwing fists once again, Peter doesn't sit idly by any longer. Looking for an opening, he slips into the brawl and assists Hulk the best way he can. Using his webs or even his body, Peter redirects attacks that would otherwise hit the Hulk. He didn't need much power to do this. Only agility and dexterity. Both of which Peter had far more than either Hulk or Abomination. Annoying insect. Blonsky yells in fury as Peter kicks his arm at the elbow, causing him to only graze Hulk's chin with his fist. Go away! At this point, Peter has made him miss multiple attacks on Hulk, so Abomination had enough and turned towards the annoyance, ready to take care of him before finishing the fight with Hulk. What? Are you mad? Peter asks condescendingly with a tilt of his head. This had the exact effect that Peter was hoping for. Blonsky looked to get even more pissed off than he was before, as he turned his attacks toward Peter in an instant. Luckily, Peter was faster and smaller, making him hard to catch. That combined with Blonsky's angered state of mind makes every attack thrown Peter's way fairly predictable. Are you sure you're not mad? You seem angry? Peter antagonizes Blonsky more as he sidesteps a punch that cracks the concrete street upon impact. Meanwhile, Hulk stood off to the side with a dumb look on his face. All he could think about was how this human wouldn't take no for an answer. He asked Hulk to work together and he refused. He asked to be friends and Hulk refused again. After his many refusals, the same human just kept showing up and helping him and Hulk didn't like it one bit. In his mind, humans should either run away or attack him. They could do nothing else. Maybe you should calm down? Peter says the forbidden words, which makes Abomination's anger skyrocket to the point of no return. You damn annoyance. Just die already. Blonsky screams as he picks up a car and throws it at Peter. Using his senses and enhanced body, Peter jumps through the already broken window of the car, completely passing through the car without touching it. The car continues to soar past Peter and straight at Hulk, who was too caught up in his own thoughts to react as the car smashed into his chest. Oops. Peter mutters as he landed and saw Hulk get knocked back by the car. What's with these guys and using cars as weapons? Hulk, angry. Hulk says angrily as he staggers back while catching the car and tossing it aside. Hulk smash. Hulk has had enough of all of this. 
He only wanted to help and get rid of this monster as his other half wanted, but he was losing and then the spider started getting involved. Not to mention the two flies, Eric slash Tony, that were overhead and interfering in his fight constantly. Whenever they would stray too far from the center of the street, they would be attacked from above until they steered closer to the road once again. Neither of the two could fly so they had to just take it as they slowly grew used to staying on the road away from buildings. Hulk had enough and it was time to let all of that built up anger out. What better way to do so other than violence? Eowulf. Hulk exclaimed and sprinted over to Peter and Blonsky. Feeling the ground shake as Hulk grew closer, Peter does the smart thing and slips away just in time for Hulk to collide with Abomination. Hulk spear tackled the bigger monster, which sent Abomination tumbling backward and onto a car with Hulk on top of him. Before Abomination could get his bearing back and retaliate, Peter, who was perched at a nearby light post, acted quickly to assist Hulk by shooting constant streams of his webs from his wrists at their enemy down form. As the web was sticking into place on Blonsky's arms and legs, Hulk didn't even notice due to his blinding rage. He started raining his large fists down on the face of his enemy just as Abomination did to him earlier before Peter stepped in. The tables turned as Abomination strained against the webs holding him down, taking fist after fist to the face. The power of these hits was enough to make it feel as if there was some sort of earthquake happening. The ground shook and cracked. Cars, trash cans, rubble, and even the light post that Peter was on shook with every punch that landed on Blonsky's face. Oh! Sleep! Hulk yelled over and over as he just kept punching away, causing a small crater to form in the street. At one point, Abomination almost broke out of Peter's webs, but sadly for him, Peter would just add more. That combined with the fact that Blonsky was getting his face beaten in, made it hard for him to think straight after a certain amount of time. As time went on, Abomination's face started getting more and more mangled as each munch opened a new cut or swelled a new bruise. Soon, Blonsky stopped struggling against the web and seemed to pass out, but Hulk didn't stop. The attacks continued on the unconscious face of his enemy. Hulk either did not caring or hadn't noticing that he already won the fight. The question now is should Peter stop him or let Hulk kill Abomination? Should I step in? Peter thought as he and the other Avengers stood by and watched Hulk keep smashing Blonsky's face in. After a moment of thought, Peter made a decision. Jumping off the light post and onto Hulk's shoulder, Peter pats the big guy on the head a couple of times before speaking. That's enough. You won, big guy. Peter says these simple words, which instantly causes Hulk to stop and look down at his still alive yet mangled enemy. Hulk win. Hulk says as he stands up with Peter still on his shoulder. At this point, the news helicopters flew a bit lower to get a better shot, and some nearby police officers start pushing into the area as well, both thinking that the situation was over. The addition of these people set off alarm bells in Hulk's mind, as his only history with armed humans and helicopters was very violent, to say the least. Huh? Hulk grunted as he looked around and thought the worst. Hulk calm do. Peter tries to explain that they were on their side, but he was flicked off of Hulk's shoulder for a second time before he could finish speaking. With Peter off of his shoulder, Hulk turned and ran off, not wanting to deal with the humans that he thought would attack him at any moment. Staring at the big fleeing back of the Hulk, Peter sighed and turned to Tony, who just landed beside the unconscious abomination. His helmet opened as he bends a little to get a closer look at the monster. Tony, go follow Hulk. Peter says and instantly receives a reluctant look from Tony, who didn't want to do any grunt work. Don't look at me like that. Just follow him from a distance and bring Banner back to the tower when he switches back. Tony sighed as his helmet closed and he flew off to chase after the escaping Hulk. When Tony left, a few police officers came forward. Is that thing real? One of them asks as they look at the sleeping abomination. Is it alive? I don't think our cuffs are big enough for this. Don't worry about it. We'll be taking it into our custody, so you won't have to worry about anything. Peter says to the police as he turns toward Magneto, who was still floating above everyone. Eric, use the strongest metal in the area to restrain this thing. Feel free to go overboard. We can't have it escaping and destroying another part of the city, after all. Nodding his head, Magneto uses his powers to draw metal from the nearby rubble in the area and uses that to tie up Abomination in what looked like a complicated bondage style. That's very, interesting, Peter says as he recalls seeing something similar in a Japanese adult video. Thanks. Eric replies with a smile, knowing full well what Peter was thinking. I had a lot of practice in my youth. Right? Peter says, as he turns to the police officers, who stood around them without a clue as to how to handle this situation. We'll handle this. If you guys can focus on crowd control, that would be helpful. Keep the media and civilians out of the area. Yes, sir. One officer said, and the rest followed suit. 
Once Abomination was all tied up and secured and the police had a perimeter in place, news crews and curious civilians started pouring into the area in droves. Since the news crews couldn't get past the police, they set up outside the barriers and started interviewing witnesses. While this was happening, Peter was talking to Fury over the phone. Yeah, have Jarvis give you the location where this thing first appeared and see if there's a lab there or something. Alright, call me back when you have more information. Peter says and hangs up the phone. Where are we bringing this guy? We can't just stay here all night. Eric gestures between Abomination and the crowd of onlookers forming around them. Take him back to the tower for now. You go ahead of me. I'll catch up in a bit. Peter says as he looks around at the destroyed portion of the city. Is there anyone left that needs help? As Peter thinks out loud, Eric nods his head and flies off with the bound abomination floating behind him. The news helicopters followed their departure, while the ground news crew stayed behind to continue their interviews and film the destruction. When Eric left with their prisoner, Peter ran around the area looking for any people in need. Although Magneto and Iron Man did their best to contain the fighting to the streets, that didn't mean buildings weren't damaged or destroyed here and there. Thankfully, the police were on rescue duty since the beginning of all of this, so not many people needed Peter's help at this point. Using his super hearing to locate survivors of tonight's festivities, Peter delivered injured victims to paramedics. As he dropped off the last of the injured, the news crews pounced and surrounded him with questions. Spider-Man. What was that thing? How did this happen? Was that second monster an Avenger? Spider-Man. Over here. Spider-Man. They were far too excited to even give Peter a chance to speak, so he simply swung away and headed back to the tower. Along the way, Peter took out his phone and started writing a tweet. At Spider underscore man, press conference at Avengers Tower at 7 a.m. Don't be late. The people needed answers and Peter knew it was best to give them swiftly. If you don't do that, those with bad intentions will twist the narrative to support whatever they're trying to sell to the general public. Arriving back at the tower, Peter found Magneto on the roof with Abomination contorted in metal bondage on the helipad. The news helicopters were still up above, filming the Abomination this whole time. He can't fit inside the building. Eric explains as soon as Peter arrived. Hmm, okay this is something we should have thought about when designing the tower. Peter said with an exasperated sigh. True, we have a detainment floor, but none of the cells are big enough to fit this guy. We need bigger and stronger cells for situations like this. Eric says matter-of-factly. Okay, let me call Fury and see if he has something for this. Peter says as he enters the building through the rooftop door. Peter didn't know how they imprisoned someone as strong as the Hulk in the movies, possibly in an extremely reinforced cell or cryogenic storage. Peter wasn't sure. Killing him would be easier, but that wouldn't be a good idea with the cameras everywhere. Peter thought as he texted Fury about their problem. By the time morning came along, Magneto and Abomination were still on the rooftop, but thankfully, a solution was on the way. Fury had a reinforced cage, similar to the one they used on the Hulk in the Avengers movie. They had it made especially for the Hulk so it should also work on Abomination. It wouldn't be a permanent solution, but it would hopefully be enough for the time being. As for the laboratory where Abomination was made, Fury found it easily as there was an Abomination-shaped hole in the side of the building. Fury's men were still going through the building, but they already found security footage of Blonsky being turned into the Abomination. Everything was pointing at General Ross, which was good as it gave them someone to blame for all of this. Dr. Stearns wasn't found in the laboratory, which wasn't good. He appeared to have been affected by whatever made Blonsky into a monster, as his head swelled and grew in the security footage. Ten minutes before the press conference was planned to start, Tony returned with a knocked-out Bruce Banner in his arms. Hulk ran all the way to upstate New York and found a safe location in the woods before reverting back to Bruce. I'm going to sleep. Tony said as he dropped Banner onto a nearby couch and walked off tiredly. Lucky bastard. Peter muttered as he can't sleep until the press conference is over and Abomination is contained. Standing at a podium in an auditorium on a lower floor of the tower, Peter addressed the plethora of journalists and news cameras. I won't be taking any questions today. I'll simply explain what happened and what we know. Today's incident was a tragedy brought on by the mistakes and actions of one man. General Thaddeus Ross wanted to recreate the same thing that made Captain America and failed twice. You all saw both of those failures fighting each other today. Hulk, the big green guy that helped us capture the abomination on the roof was his first failure. The guy on the roof is the general's most recent failure. They were both normal people like you and me, but the general wanted to make them into super soldiers. This is the result of that. As Peter says this, a big screen TV beside him lights up and shows the security footage from he lab. 
All in attendance gasped in shock as they watched a normal soldier transform into a giant monster. They couldn't believe Hat Thing used to be a human. After all, everyone thought it was an alien or something in the beginning. Every bit of evidence we have points to General Ross, which is why we have him detained already. We'll continue to collect evidence against him before handing him and the evidence over to the US government. Peter says, his image being broadcasted all over the world. This was the first mission of the Avengers and I'd say it was a successful one. I'm afraid that's all we have for you today though. Peter says with a wave goodbye as he walks off stage. Have a good day. It was this huge abomination. It fell from the sky and flattened the taxi. I'm pretty sure whoever was inside is dead. News clips played on the TV in Peter and May's living room. This abomination just came out of nowhere and scared me half to death. May slept through the whole ordeal last night, but as soon as she woke up, she saw a recording of Peter on TV as Spider-Man addressing some sort of monster attack in Harlem that he was involved with. It was crazy for her to watch the footage of the two monstrous entities destroying the city with their battle. Thankfully, not too many people were hurt, and even fewer were killed, so she wasn't called into the hospital to help out. It's at times like this that she, and everyone else that loves Peter, worries for his safety. After all, this all started with normal criminals, but recently the types of characters that Spider-Man faces have been ramping upward in quality. First, it was normal criminals. Then, a man in power armor, and now a literal science fiction monster. It's a miracle that not a single metahuman has tried anything like this yet, either. When will things go back to normal? May couldn't help but think as she watched the clips on every news channel. Although she is happy that Peter is out there saving people, May just sometimes wish that it was someone else out there. Though, if things like this happened and Peter wasn't a hero, many more people would have been injured and killed last night. Of course, with the Avengers thing that Peter has been building for these past months, he may not have to be the one handling all of these situations anymore, so things may be looking up in the future. Not expecting him to be there, May checks Peter's room to see if he was home yet and found him sleeping on his bed in his spider suit. Only his mask was removed on the floor by the bed. Sighing to herself, May sat at Peter's bedside and played with his hair as she looked down on him with a proud yet worried look on her face. After finishing with the press conference, Peter waited another hour for the Hulk-proof reinforced cage. Once it finally arrived, Peter wasn't surprised to see an almost replica of what S.H.I.E.L.D. used to hold Loki in the Avengers movie. Knowing that the Hulk was able to break out of the cage in the movie, Peter had Abomination locked inside with his metal bondage in place and had Magneto use some metal from Stark Industries to reinforce the cage even more. Just to be safe, Abomination's cell was moved into Eric's penthouse for now. Magneto would have a roommate close by until a more long-term form of detainment was made. Of course, they had to break a hole on the side of the building in order for the cage to get inside, but that would be fixed in a day or two. With the world informed and Abomination under lock and key, Peter was finally able to return home and sleep. The only one of the Avengers that wasn't sleeping by this point was him and Fury. Eric went straight to bed as soon as Abomination was plopped down into his living room, and everyone else was lucky enough to not have any responsibilities. Magneto would usually be amongst this group, but his power came in handy today. Returning home through a portal, Peter texted Tony and told him to work on a good long-term way to contain Abomination when he wakes up. With Tony on it, Peter was sure that this problem would be solved within 48 hours. Possibly soon. Taking off his mask, Peter hopped into bed and fell asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow. By the time Peter woke up, it was dark outside, and he could feel something on the left side of his chest. Not only that, but Peter could also hear the TV in his room on, which wasn't on when he was awake earlier. Opening his eyes, Peter turned to see MJ cuddled up next to him with her head on his chest, watching what appeared to be Game of Thrones. It was a Dothraki adult scene as well. I didn't know this world had Game of Thrones. Peter thought as he turned to see MJ watching the scene with a heated look. Her face was a bit red and she seemed to be very interested in the TV, still probably thinking that Peter was asleep. Are you watching adult entertainment? Peter asks with a teasing smile as he snakes his arm around his beautiful girlfriend. As soon as she hears his voice, MJ freezes in place and turns her head robotically toward Peter. Everything goes silent except the TV as moans from the mating of a Dothraki couple become louder and louder. Jumping into action, MJ uses the controller to change the channel and a Spongebob episode begins to play, but she soon lowers the volume. P. Peter, it's not what you think. MJ says as she tries to explain what Game of Thrones is, knowing that Peter doesn't watch much TV. I see. Peter says as he pulls her closer and puts his face into her neck. You were watching that scene fairly closely though. We haven't done that yet, but I'm ready when you are. I I. MJ didn't know how to answer, and soon all cohesive language failed her as Peter began kissing her neck. 
It's okay? Peter stops and pulls back, resting his head back on the pillow. Just let me know when you're ready. Unless that time is now? Instantly, MJ started shaking her head. She may love Peter at this point, but the thought of shaboinking scared her. She has heard a bunch of awkward first-time stories, not to mention the pain that comes along with it. Peter was a virgin in his previous life as well, so he was eager to do the deed, but he could wait. His hand is always a viable option, after all. Alright, we can wait as long as you need. Peter says as he steals the controller and switches the channel back to Game of Thrones. What's this show about? Peter asks as he puts up the volume once again. Maybe this universe will end the series better than the last. Thankfully, the adult scene was over, so MJ wasn't embarrassed any further. Ignoring his phone, which blew up with texts from Tony, who was trying to weasel his way out of doing any work, Peter stayed up most of the night and caught up on the latest episode of Game of Thrones with MJ. MJ's mom didn't have a single problem with her staying the night and May was the same. They both thought that the two were shaboinking by this point in their relationship, but they were usually watching something or playing games. Within two days since the abomination appeared in New York City, Tony came up with a perfect way to detain the big guy. He created a cryogenic cage that would freeze Abomination's body just as Peter thought. Blonsky would live his life like a paraplegic. His entire body below the neck would be frozen solid, leaving only his head unfrozen. Normally, this would kill any living creature, as the heart wouldn't be pumping blood anymore, but Blonsky's body is enhanced by a large degree. He should be fine, maybe, Tony said with a shrug. Good enough for me, Peter says with a shrug of his own. Try to get some blood and tissue samples before locking him up. Already done. Tony says as he opens a nearby lab fridge and shows multiple vials filled with blood and sealed containers of lizard-like skin. Good, keep that locked up safe somewhere though. Those samples could be dangerous in the wrong hands. Peter says as he grabs half of the samples for himself. Hey, get your own monster parts. Tony says and fails to take them back, as Peter ducks out of his way and opens a portal. Thanks. Peter says as he steps through the portal and waves as it slowly closed before Tony's eyes. Good work. Keep it up. In a rundown apartment in Russia, an elderly man was tucked into a small worn-out discolored bed. His face was turning pale and it was hard for him to keep his eyes open for long periods of time. He coughed regularly and looked to be on his last legs of life. Insert picture of Anton Vanko here, this is Anton Vanko. A former Soviet scientist. Upon moving to the United States of America in his youth, Vanko became partners with Howard Stark at Stark Industries where he and Howard created the first arc reactor. However, when Vanko sold his designs on the black market, Stark had him deported back to Russia, where Vanko spent decades drinking himself to death. The fruit of that labor was showing now. The alcohol has taken its toll, draining the man's life day by day. Now he's just a husk of his former self, ready to die at any moment and even hoping for it on most days. The TV at the end of the bed was tuned into a news channel, where Tony Stark was speaking to a news reporter in his Iron Man suit. They were talking about the recent attack in New York from the now officially named Abomination. As he was watching with a scowl on his aged face, the door opens, and in comes a man about Tony's age. Insert picture of Ivan Vanko here, the relationship between the two men was hard to see, as the alcohol and age have morphed the elderly man's body, but this is Anton Vanko's son, Ivan Vanko. Ivan is a Russian physicist, but it was hard to get a good job in his field as he is the son of a disgraced scientist. Who would want to hire or work with a man that could steal or sell your research? Ivan isn't his father and wasn't the one to sell blueprints on the black market, but the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. That should be you. Anton says weakly from his bed as he shakily lifts his finger towards the TV. Don't listen to that crap. Ivan takes a seat at his father's bedside and shakes off his words, as he has heard them a million times by now. Suddenly, Anton grabs Ivan's hand with two aged hands of his own, grasping them as tightly as he could. Looking down at his father, Ivan could see a tired and apologetic look in his eyes. I'm sorry. All I can give you is my knowledge. Anton croaks out his last words. The sound of coughing fills the room for a brief moment before silence returns and Anton's body stills. He wasn't breathing. His heart wasn't beating and he already looked like a corpse. Ivan is naturally distraught. His father just died in front of him and all he could hear was Tony Stark's smug voice from the TV at the end of the bed. Staring at the TV with a vengeful look in his eyes, Ivan pulls out a set of blueprints for an arc reactor and gets to work. A week after the Abomination incident, the Avengers were surprised to find Blonsky turned back into his normal human form. He tried to escape from his prison by slipping through with his smaller body, getting the idea from Banner who could switch back and forth as well. Though, Blonsky seems to have far more control than Banner does. 
Blonsky succeeded in changing but failed to escape as his body was still frozen. The cameras picked up on this instantly and Jarvis notified the Avengers. Since he was being held in Avengers Tower's detainment floor, a new cage was swiftly made and Blonsky was loaded in by the end of the day. There is a silver lining to this change though. Blonsky seemed to become less erratic ever since changing to his human form. If they can rehabilitate the man, then the Avengers may have a strong member in the future. The council didn't like the idea, but Peter contacted a therapist to come in on schedule to see Blonsky. Hopefully, he can show good results within a year and Peter can use that to bring this idea to the council once again. It would be hard to disagree at that point. After going through all of General Ross facilities, including the one in New York where Abomination was made, Fury brought back mountains of evidence against Thaddeus but that wasn't all he found. The General's years of work toward perfecting the Super Soldier Serum were now in the hands of the Avengers. Compared to the research Betty gave them, the up-to-date research was leagues ahead. Five years is a long time after all. Peter and Tony took a copy of each set of data before calling Banner to talk. Walking into Tony's workshop after going through multiple layers of security, Bruce found Spider-Man and Tony waiting for his arrival. Banner has been staying in one of the apartments in the tower for the past week and found the place very luxurious. Well, anything would be luxurious compared to the room he rented in South America. Just give the guy some air conditioning and a strong Wi-Fi signal and that would be heaven. You called for me? Banner says as he walks in. Bruce, take a seat. Tony calls out and gestures to a rolling chair at a computer desk. What's this all about? Bruce asks as he turns his head to Peter. Are you finally giving me the research Betty gave us? Yes, but we have to get through some things first. Peter says as he taps a button and the video of Abomination being made starts to play on a loop. Why are you showing me this? Banner says as he and everyone else in the world have seen this video a thousand times already. Do you know who this is? Tony says as the video freezes on a full-screen image of Dr. Stearns. No idea. Banner answers after a moment's look. That is Dr. Samuel Stearns otherwise known to you as Mr. Blue. Peter informs him. What? Banner exclaims with an incredulous look on his face. It seems like since your last conversation back when we first met, Stearns didn't see any progress in working with you anymore and went to your enemy. Peter says as the video switches to a zoomed-in image of the syringe Stearns used on Blonsky. Did you send your blood to Mr. Blue? Tony asks as Banner's eyes widen upon seeing the image. Yes. He answers as realization dawns on him. Is that my blood in there? Yes. Peter says as Banner starts cursing and pacing around the room, causing his watch to begin beeping. Bruce, calm down. All right? He says as he forces himself to sit and breathe like a meditating monk. Once he was finally calm, Peter got straight to the point. Listen, I have no problem giving you the research that you need and a place here to work on it, but you need to keep it to yourself. Stearns wasn't captured so he may contact you. If he does, pretend to not know of his involvement and alert us immediately. Peter says as Tony nods along beside him. We'll help with your research when we can as well. Your condition is interesting so I don't mind lending a hand. Tony says with an interested look in his eyes. Thank you. Banner says sincerely. With someone as experienced and skilled as Tony Stark helping him, then Banner felt like they had a chance to actually fix himself. Personally, I don't think you should get rid of the Hulk. Peter drops a bomb that shocks both Banner and Tony. Why? Bruce says incredulously. He's a monster. A monster that helped us a week ago. Peter corrects with a shrug. Does he have problems? Definitely. Though that's not his fault. You have to look at Hulk like a child. He's been fighting since his birth. I think that if we use meditation and therapy, you and the Hulk can form a friendly relationship. Both Tony and Banner looked at Peter as if he were telling them that the Earth was flat. Look, I'm not saying you can't continue your research, but maybe give the Hulk a chance while you're at it. You never know. He might just surprise you. Peter didn't plead this case any further. It would take time for Banner to accept the Hulk. All Peter is trying to do is plant those seeds early on. Will Banner and Tony find a cure before then? No, Peter didn't believe there is a cure for the Hulk to begin with. With Tony and Banner working on curing the incurable, Peter and Fury started focusing on organizing the evidence against General Ross. The man has a lot of connections in the government, so they wanted to be sure that the evidence was in order and easy to understand. After all, even those in power can be downright idiotic at times. Almost every day since Peter announced that they had General Ross in custody, different government officials called and tried to persuade them into handing over the general for an internal investigation or some other nonsense. Peter and Fury knew that these were just excuses to get the general out so they can minimize the damage as much as possible. After all, a high-level military scandal doesn't look good for the US government. 
Even Obama called to ask about the situation in depth. He didn't ask for the general to be released or anything, but he would have zero power to do so even if he tried. The Avengers are sanctioned by the United Nations as a whole, so it would take a big meeting and majority vote for anyone to tell them what to do, which would almost never happen. It took Peter and Fury a few days to get the evidence put together. They had some help from people like Natasha and Mystique, who offered their help in organizing everything, but most of the work fell on them for the most part. They separated the evidence into two parts, the evidence that would be released to the media, which would be unclassified information, while the rest would be given to the government. Of course, Peter and Fury wouldn't be handing over any of the research data on the super soldier serum. Neither of them trusted the idiotic politicians with something that could possibly produce more hulks or abominations. With all evidence gathered, Fury called the military police to come and arrest General Ross, who has been in the tower's detention center all this time. He was imprisoned only a hallway away from Blonsky, who he could hear roaring and growling for the first few days of his detainment. Thankfully, Blonsky calmed down later on. Once the military police came and took him away with a flash drive full of carefully organized evidence, Peter tweeted out the unclassified evidence as they planned. At Spider-Man, General Thaddeus Ross has been officially detained by military police. Here's some unclassified evidence, smiley face. Link, within minutes of pressing tweet, every news and political commentator pounced like hungry lions. News channels and live streams were going over the evidence live and giving their opinions of the whole situation. Peter wasn't phased by the attention his actions would receive anymore. He could be tweeting about a burger he likes or evidence on a military general, but both tweets would end up being talked about in some way or another. Stashing his phone away, Peter and Fury watched a military convoy drive off with General Ross in tow. Is it done? Fury asks. Yeah, the evidence is public now. Peter says as the convoy turns away and disappears behind a building. Good, let's get to the meeting. They're probably waiting for us. Fury says and the two head back inside, taking the elevator up to the higher floors of the tower. They specifically called a council meeting for when the general would leave, as that would wrap up everything from the abomination incident. Arriving at the council room, Fury and Peter found the rest of the council members waiting for their arrival, not knowing the reason for the meeting except Tony, who seemed to vibrate with excitement. Finally, Charles says with a tired sigh. What's this meeting about? Charles has been a very busy man ever since Spider-Man endorsed his school. That was also magnified after taking in Magneto's problem children, who have caused nothing but trouble ever since their first day of school. The exasperated attitude that Charles was radiating throughout the room was due to those problem children as well. Getting straight to the point, the general is gone and now we need to vote on whether to continue his research into the super soldier serum. Peter says as he and Fury take a seat. Once again, Peter isn't the leader of the Avengers. He may be the one they look to for leadership most of the time, but that doesn't mean he can just make decisions like this without consulting the council. Is there a need for it? Charles says with a hesitant look in his eyes. The damage that research has brought far exceeds the good. I would disagree. Fury cuts in with a shake of his head. World War II was won off the back of the super soldier serum. Captain America was a weak and frail man before he was turned into the hero we know today. Don't let the work of a power-hungry idiot ruin what could be a strong force for good. I agree. Tony speaks up, wanting to enhance himself so Peter can't make fun of him for not having powers anymore. We would obviously have to be far more careful than General Ross was. Procedures and safety measures would have to be put in place. Testing would have to start with mice and other animals before getting anywhere near humans. Everyone in the room was slowly nodding unconsciously as Tony finished speaking. Who would we even use the serum on? Eric asks, almost convinced. Those we find worthy and trustable. Peter answers instantly. Natasha, Clint, Fury, and Tony would be prime candidates. Other candidates can be vetted later on. We may also be able to take it ourselves, but testing would have to be done to see how the serum would interact with our already existing powers. Who knows how the X-Gene would react after all. Tony nods excitedly while Fury looks surprised by Peter's words. He didn't expect to be one of the candidates for the serum but didn't voice any disagreement. Becoming a super soldier would help in his duties for S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers. Peter also planned to offer this serum to his loved ones. He already has the resurrection elixir, which he plans to give them as well, but that would take time to make the way he wants. The super soldier serum could be a good starting point for them before he can finish the elixir. After all, with what Peter has planned, his resurrection elixir would be far more powerful than the original. As long as we get regulations put in place as Tony described, I have no problem with us making this serum. Eric says in full agreement at this point. 
I would also like to add that we don't broadcast this to the world. If others know we can make our own Captain Americas at will, then countries, companies, and powers all around the world would come knocking. But we can handle that easily. Tony says with an uncaring shrug. True, but do we want to deal with it? Magneto asks with a raised eyebrow. Everything would be far simpler if this remains between us and those we choose to enhance in the future. I agree, let's vote. Peter says and a few moments later a decision was made. The vote was 4-5 to five in favor of completing the Super Soldier Serum research. The only one to vote against it was Charles, whose vote could probably be attributed to his bad mood. Though, the vote didn't really matter. Peter knew that Tony and Fury would vote his way, so he already had enough votes to pass before walking into the council room. This was just a formality that needed to be done. With the vote passed, Peter and Tony decided to move everything Super Soldier Serum related to Tony's workshop. It was the most secure place in the entire tower. Even more so than the detainment floor, which was built to hold super-powered criminals. Safety regulations were written up and agreed upon by the council, while Peter and Tony agreed to only work on the serum together. Accidents happen as shown by what happened to Bruce, so they decided that it would be better to have two minds keeping track of any possible mistakes the other could or would make. He he ha 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 ha. Tony laughed like a madman as he and Peter started working on the serum for the first time. Maybe this was a bad idea. We'll miss the expo if you don't hurry up. Peter reminded MJ, who was sitting in her room in front of a mirror doing her makeup. I'm almost done. Be patient. MJ says as she follows a YouTube tutorial to get her makeup just right. She wasn't always a fan of intricate makeup, usually going for a more natural look, but that all changed during the past summer. MJ went down a YouTube beauty rabbit hole, which sparked an interest in her. Now she likes to try new techniques and products, which Peter didn't mind. After all, it was nice to look at when she was done. Peter only wished that she would do it quicker, but doing her makeup became a time of relaxation for MJ. Not only does she enjoy the result but the time spent putting it all on as well. Not wanting to bother her, Peter whips out his phone and scrolled through Twitter. Today is the Stark Expo and Peter decided to go and enjoy the night with MJ. Tony invited him to tag along as Spider-Man, but Peter needed some time away from Tony for a night. They spent the last week locked in Tony's workshop, tirelessly working on the Super Soldier Serum. Tony is a good friend but he can be annoying as hell. Especially when you spend every night with the man locked in a room for hours on end. He would still go to the expo to support his friend. Just not as Spider-Man, which means he would be able to enjoy the night without any responsibilities, hopefully. The Stark Expo was an event originally started by Howard Stark to display the latest and greatest technology that could potentially create the future. It's an event where Stark Industries can show off their many prototypes. Like hover cars and other attractions that would draw in the public. This year's Expo is supposed to be very big for Stark Industries, as they have stepped away from their main revenue source, which was arms dealing. Tony and Pepper want to use this expo to show off the new things Stark Industries would be selling. Though Peter has no idea what that would be. Probably cell phones and other appliances if Peter had to guess. The Avengers and Stark Industries may share a building but Peter doesn't have the time or that high of interest to know what they've been working on. Though he would find out today. Am I going to meet Tony Stark? MJ asks as she applies eyeliner. No, I'm going as Peter Parker, not Spider-Man, Tony doesn't know my real identity. Peter says with a shake of his head. Why? Do you want to meet Tony? I mean. Yeah. MJ says with a shrug. He's your friend so I want to meet him sooner or later. Also, he's Tony Stark. I see. Peter rolled his eyes at her. Tony was famous even before he became Iron Man. If Peter could compare his fame to someone from his past life, it would have to be something close to Kim Kardashian. Everyone wanted to hear which model or actress Stark betted or what scandal ensued soon after. That behavior has calmed down severely since Tony returned from Afghanistan, but the reveal of Iron Man certainly helped keep the people interested. We could try to meet Tony while we're there, but I doubt we'll get past security. Just don't tell him I'm Spider-Man. Peter offers, getting an adventurous smile from MJ. Alright, let's infiltrate the expo and meet Tony Stark. We'll see how long it takes before we get kicked out. MJ says with a laugh. Well, you better hurry up then. I doubt he'll be there all night. Peter says as he checks the time on the watch she gave him for Christmas. I told you we'd make it on time. MJ says as she and Peter watch a brightly lit stage from the back of a large crowd. After waiting another 20 minutes, Peter and MJ took the subway to the expo. The second they joined the crowd, ACDC started playing over the speakers as an image of Iron Man jumping from a plane played for the crowd to see. Watching and hearing the rock music blasting, Peter couldn't help but roll his eyes. Tony truly has a boomer's taste in music. 
Peter couldn't count the number of times he has been subjected to listening to ACDC on repeat while working with Tony, which is one of his friend's most annoying qualities. As the image of Iron Man falling continued, the crowd looked up and could see something falling from the sky toward the stage. The crowd put two and two together and begins cheering as Tony does your average superhero landing on the stage. Fireworks start flying and scantily clad women dance their way onto the stage, surrounding Tony as his mask opens and he smiles at the cheering sea of people. Tony. 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 Pretty much the entire crowd was chanting by this point. It's good to be back. You missed me? Tony says as the crowd goes wild. Blow something up. One guy yelled over everyone else. I missed you too. Blow something up? I already did that. I'm not saying that the world is enjoying its longest period of uninterrupted peace in years because of me. I'm not saying that from the ashes of captivity, never has a greater phoenix metaphor been personified in human history. I'm not saying that Uncle Sam can kick back on a lawn chair, sipping on an iced tea because I haven't come across anyone who's man enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me on my best day. Tony starts bragging with a smug look. Man, his ego has gone through the roof. Peter thought as he planned to make fun of him for this later. Do you still want to meet him? Seeing Tony in person and hearing Peter's question, MJ couldn't help but second-guess herself. He is a bit of a tool, isn't he? MJ comments with a small laugh. Yup, that's Tony. Peter nods in agreement. He's a good guy at heart though. Whatever, let's continue the plan. MJ says as she drags Peter through the crowd. Put your powers to use and help me find the backstage entrance. Yes, ma'am. After pushing through a crowd of mindless Iron Man fans, Peter and MJ managed to find the entrance that lead backstage. It was guarded by a handful of very big and very armed security. They certainly looked serious and definitely wouldn't just let them pass. Come with me. Peter says as he drags MJ to a line of porta potties, where he dragged her into one and locked the door. W what? You. MJ says as she covers her nose. It stinks in here. Without another word, Peter waves his hand and a spell circle appears, attaching to both of them before disappearing. What's this about? MJ asks, not used to seeing Peter do magic very often. You said you wanted to meet Tony. Peter says with a shrug as they exit the toilet and walk back to the security. Just walk by and don't say a word. The two pass by the security with ease. No one seemed to notice their entrance, which brought a smile to MJ's face. This is so cool. She thought as they maneuvered backstage, looking for Tony. Hi. And you are? Tony says flirtatiously. After searching for a minute they found Tony and his driver slash bodyguard Happy Hogan speaking to a woman. Marshall. She replies with a smile and an outstretched hand. Irish. I like it. Tony comments as he shakes her hand. Pleased to meet you, Tony. She says as their hands separate. Where are you from? Tony asks as Peter and MJ sit back and eavesdrop. Bedford. She answers. What are you doing here? Tony asks curiously, as his security would have notified him of her arrival, meaning that she snuck in. Looking for you. She says as she reached into her bag and pulls out some papers. Yeah? You found me. What are you up to later? Tony says with a flirty wink, causing Peter to roll his eyes once again. Meanwhile, MJ found Tony's behavior very entertaining. Serving subpoenas. She drops the bomb and hands over the papers. Yikes. Tony comments as he avoids touching the papers at all costs. He doesn't like to be handed things. Happy says as he takes the papers. I see, you're hereby ordered to appear before the Senate Armed Services Committee tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. After dropping the bomb that Tony was being called to appear before the Senate Armed Services Committee, the woman who called herself Marshall walked out after some more flirtatious words from Tony. Excuse me, she says as she passes Peter and MJ on her way out, which alerts Tony and Happy another visitor. Peter removed the spell that got them past the guards after getting backstage, so they weren't as stealthy as before. Who's there? Happy asks, annoyed that so many people have somehow made it past security. Hi? Peter takes the lead and walks in with MJ following close behind. Let me guess. You snuck in as well? Happy says, getting a nod from both teenagers. Don't tell me you have a subpoena for me as well? What's next? Does the Supreme Court want something too? Tony jokes, but the annoyance from his last guest's gift was clear to see. No, we just came to meet you. Maybe get an autograph, but it seems you have more to worry about than us. Peter acts like a fan, hinting that they heard the earlier conversation. Yeah, tell me about it. Tony says as he looks at Peter weirdly for a moment. Do I know you? No, I don't think we've met. Peter says with a shake of his head, hiding his shock at how Tony somehow noticed him. I've been on the news a few times though, so maybe you saw me there. Really? 
What for? Tony asks curiously. I made a popular mobile game. Peter says with a shrug. Don't act like it's not a big deal. MJ says, joining the conversation. He made Candy Crush. Ned helped. Peter shrugged again, not thinking that Tony would care so much about a random mobile game. Really? My assistant is addicted to that game. Tony says with an impressed nod. Whenever I annoy her, she opens Candy Crush and ignores me. Everyone knows Candy Crush after all. It's the most popular mobile phone game in the world. Even Tony has played the game here and there during times of boredom. Well, it was nice meeting you. Peter says as he and MJ make their way toward the door. We know that you're busy so we'll leave you alone. As they were about to leave because Peter didn't feel like risking Tony figuring out that he's Spider-Man any longer, not that he would really mind at this point in their friendship, Tony called out and stopped them in their tracks. Wait. Peter turns, thinking that Tony may have figured it out. You two wanted autographs, right? Tony says as he grabs some headshots of himself, which were made for this type of occasion. Here. Signing the two photos that made Tony look like a member of a boy band, they took a picture each and left with a quick thank you. Nice kids. Happy comments when they were gone. Yep. Tony says as he snatches the subpoena papers from Happy's grasp. How far are we from DC? DC? 250 miles. Next day, 7 AM, although the Senate Armed Services Committee blindsided Tony by serving his subpoena only one night before he was required to attend the committee meeting, that didn't slow down the media from attending as well. Tony, Pepper, and Happy arrived just in time, which prompted every camera to turn their way as they entered the committee chambers and took their seats in front of a panel of high-level government officials. At the head of these government officials was Senator Stern, a senator from Pennsylvania and a covert member of HYDRA. Using his position, Stern is the leading force behind everything happening today. His goal is to convince the American people that Tony Stark is a threat to their safety, ultimately leading to Tony handing over his Iron Man suit, intending to use it to mass-produce power armor for Hydra. As soon as Tony took a seat, he didn't show a speck of respect for the committee before him. Rather, he took out his phone and started playing Candy Crush, flirting with Pepper every once in a while as well. Mr. Stark, could we get started, please? Stern says as he tries for the tenth time to get Tony's attention away from his phone. Mr. Stark. Please. Yes, dear? Tony looks up from his phone and answers the senator. Can I have your attention? Stearns asks in exasperation. Absolutely. Tony says as he finally sets down his phone. Do you or do you not possess a specialized weapon? Stearns asks. I do not. Tony replies with a smirk that digs straight into Stern's soul. You do not? Stearns replies with an air of disbelief. I do not. Tony repeats with an uncaring shrug. Well, it depends on how you define the word weapon. The Iron Man weapon, Mr. Stark. Stearns finally states what he is after. My device does not fit that description. Tony replies with a shake of his head. Well, how would you describe it? Stearns asks. I would describe it by defining it as what it is, Senator. Tony says, knowing that this dance they were having was annoying the senator, and loved every minute of it. As? Stearns asks, seething on the inside. It's a high-tech prosthesis? That's actually the most apt description I can make of it. Tony explains with a smirk. It's a weapon, Mr. Stark. Stern states plainly and clearly. Please, if your priority was actually the safety and well-being of American citizens. Tony starts to rant, but Stern speaks over him. My priority is to get the Iron Man weapon turned over to the people of the United States of America. The senator says, but before Tony could rebut, the large wooden doors of the committee chambers swung open. Does that mean all Americans would be able to buy their own Iron Man suits? Do you want to place them in gun stores next to the M4S and Desert Eagles? Peter says as he strolls into the room, dressed head to toe in a lawyer-like suit over his spider attire. The cameras that were once on Tony and the committee members panned over to show Spider-Man's arrival to all who were watching. Yo! Peter greets his friend as he walks over and takes a seat beside Tony. What are you wearing? Tony asks incredulously as he eyes Peter's suit up and down. What? Peter says as he fixes his collar and tie. I thought you could use some representation. Pfft, how did you even know this was happening? Tony laughs, thoroughly entertained. The spider has many little birds that sing all sorts of tunes. Peter references the show he has been watching lately. Game of Thrones? Pepper asks from the side. Yeah, I've been watching with my girlfriend recently. Peter reveals as he turns to Tony. I saw some of your expo last night on TV. Did you refer to yourself as a phoenix personified, or was I dreaming? 
This whole conversation was being transmitted around the room for everyone to hear, as many in the room laughed at Peter's question. As much as we all love Game of Thrones, we should get back on track. Stearns tries his best to get everyone back on topic, saving Tony from answering an embarrassing question. You're right. Peter nods and turns his attention back to the senator. Tell us more about how you want every American citizen to be equipped with Iron Man suits. That's not what I want. Stearns tries to clarify, but Peter cuts him off. But it's what you said, Senator. Peter says as he leans back in his chair. Just to be clear, you don't want the Iron Man suit turned over to the people of the United States of America? No. Stern says through gritted teeth. Then why did you say so? Peter says with a smug look under his mask. Was that all this was about? Can we leave now? No, I merely misspoke. Stearns refuses as he takes a deep breath. What I meant was to have the Iron Man weapon turned over to the American government. Oh, I see. Peter says with an understanding nod. Give me a moment to speak with my client. Peter turns to Tony and doesn't bother to lower his voice as he speaks for all to hear through the microphone. Is it a no or a hell no? Peter asks, causing Stearns to brow to crease in anger. Hell no. Tony says with a smirk. I'm afraid my client would have to decline. Peter says as if he were heartbroken to turn the man down. Tony Stark is Iron Man. To turn over the Iron Man suit would be to turn over himself. He just couldn't do it. Look, I'm no expert in weapons, but we do have somebody here who is an expert. I'd now like to call Justin Hammer, our current primary weapons contractor, Stern says as the doors open for a second time. I'd now like to call Justin Hammer, our current primary weapons contractor. Senator Stern says. As the big wooden doors swung open, in walked a blonde man with glasses and a very expensive looking suit. He looked to be in the same age range as Tony, whom he was staring at with a smug smile on his face. Insert picture of Justin Hammer here, Justin Hammer is a military contractor, and the CEO and majority shareholder of Hammer Industries, which had formed a strong business rivalry with Stark Industries. Seeking to improve his own position as a contractor for the US government and get one over on Tony Stark, Hammer is working alongside Stern and attempting to damage the public's view of Tony. Not to mention the fact that he was promised to be able to study and replicate Stark's Iron Man suit and arc reactor upon their combined success. Hammer was called as an expert to prove that Tony Stark's ego and his monopoly on his Iron Man armor was now a danger for the United States of America and its people, as part of Stern's attempt to force Stark to give the Iron Man suit technology to the government. Though, in Peter's opinion Stearns could have chosen a better partner in crime than Justin Hammer. Whilst overconfident, Hammer is also incompetent in terms of the quality of his technology, some of which are faulty altogether and even dangerous to the user. Even the normal guns that Hammer Industries sells have a 50-50 chance of jamming during usage. This is why, although, Hammer sees Tony as a rival, Tony doesn't reciprocate that feeling whatsoever. In his eyes, Hammer is nothing more than a wannabe that couldn't make a working piece of tech to save his life. Let the record reflect that I observed Mr. Hammer entering the chamber, and I am wondering if and when any actual expert will also be in attendance. Tony comments, causing many to laugh and Hammer to scowl as he made his way up to a podium in front of the panel of government officials. Senator, if I may. Hammer says into the microphone, doing his best to ignore Tony's remark. I may well not be an expert, but you know who was the expert? Your dad. Howard Stark. Really a father to us all, and the military industrial age. Let's just be clear, he was no flower child. He was a lion. Senator, did you invite this man, who just admitted to not being an expert, here to monologue about his weird fantasy for Tony's father? Peter cuts Hammer off before he could continue rambling. Since he isn't an expert as you've said, maybe he should leave so we can finish this. Hearing Peter's words, Stearns didn't know how to legitimize Hammer being there anymore, which goes to show that he shouldn't have worked with Justin in the first place. The man is simply incompetent. Before Stearns could form a rebuttal for Peter's words, Hammer just steamrolled ahead, ignoring the opposition. We all know why we're here. Last year, Tony Stark created a sword with untold possibilities, yet he insists it's a shield. He asks us to trust him as we cower behind it. I wish I were comforted, I really do. I'd love to leave my door unlocked when I leave the house, but this ain't Canada. We live in a world of grave threats, threats that Mr. Stark will not always be able to foresee. You're right, but that's what the Avengers are for, not Tony or Iron Man. Peter cuts him off once again and turns to the Senator. Senator, let's move on from this one. He's obviously not an expert, so I see no point in hearing him ramble any further. As Peter finished speaking, Tony was smirking like a madman while Stearns and Hammer were turning red from anger. 
The committee would now like to invite Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes to the chamber. Stern says through gritted teeth. Tony's head snaps backward as the doors swing open for a third time and Rhodes walks in wearing his military uniform with an ever-present scowl on his face. He looked like he didn't want to be here and most likely was ordered to attend by his superiors, but Tony was currently blinded by the feeling of betrayal so he didn't seem to notice. I have before me a complete report on the Iron Man weapon, compiled by Colonel Rhodes. Colonel, for the record, can you please read page 57, paragraph 4? Stern says as Rhodes takes Hammer's place at the podium. Shuffling through his report, Rhodes finds the exact paragraph and starts reading. Very well, as he does not operate within any definable branch of government, Iron Man presents a potential threat to the security of both the nation and to her interests. I did, however, go on to say that. Rhodes says but the senator cuts him off. That's enough Colonel. Stern says, getting exactly what he wanted. You can step away from the podium now. Rhodes stood rooted to the ground, shocked that the senator would act so shamelessly with this whole situation. This is all very confusing to me because Iron Man is a member of the Avengers. As an Avenger, we operate at a higher level than any single government branch. Although you have the power to summon my good friend Tony here, as he's an American citizen, Iron Man is already a member of an extra-government agency Dash, you know, the longer this farce goes on, the more it starts to look like you and that idiot over there Dash, Peter gestures to Hammer, who sat at the side. Simply want to take what doesn't belong to you. While I agree with you, Spider-Man, we do have a problem. Rhodes says as he digs through a folder and pulls out some pictures of human-like robots. Intelligence suggests that the devices seen in these photos are, in fact, attempts at making manned copies of Tony's suit. This has been corroborated by our allies and local intelligence on the ground indicating that these suits are quite possibly, at this moment, operational. Just like in the movie, Tony starts doing something on his phone, which triggers the TVs in the room to light up and start playing videos of different military tests from the pictures that were shown. Time for a little transparency. Now, let's see what's really going on. Tony says with a smirk. What is he doing? Stern asks in bewilderment. If you will direct your attention to the screens, I believe that's North Korea. Tony says and the robot starts to walk before stumbling and exploding in a fiery mess. Stern starts yelling for someone to turn off the TVs and stop Tony from continuing as more and more examples of failed Iron Man copies were shown. All of them ended in destruction. No grave threats here. Tony says as the screen changes to a video with Hammer in it this time. Is that Justin Hammer? How did Hammer get in the game? Look, you're on TV. How exciting. The video plays and shows a test pilot in some clunky Iron Man copy. Hammer directs him to twist his body, which causes the armor to overturn and snap the test pilot's spine with a sickening crack. The screams of the poor guy fill the room as Hammer finds the TV's plug and pulls it out. Wow. Yeah, I'd say most countries are 5 or 10 years away. Hammer Industries, 20. Tony states as he sets his phone down. I think the point that he's making. Stearns tries to speak but Tony cuts him off. The point is, you're welcome, I guess. Tony stands up with his hand spread. For what? Stearns asks incredulously. Because I'm your nuclear deterrent. It's working. We're safe. America is secure. You want my property? You can't have it, but I did you a big favor. Tony says as he turns to the cameras. I've successfully privatized world peace. I've successfully privatized world peace. Tony's image plays on an old TV in a rundown Russian apartment. Ivan Vanko stands in the center of the room, where his father died before his very eyes, dressed in metal straps and mechanisms with an orange glow on his chest, similar to Tony's arc reactor. Holding two lightsaber-looking objects in his hands, which were wired to the device on his chest, Vanko presses buttons in each hand, causing the two hilts in his hands to ignite in orange light. Insert picture of suited up Vanko slash Whiplash here, as Peter portaled Pepper and Tony back to the tower in New York, Pepper stepped through the portal with a nervous look on her face. This was one of the very rare occasions that she was able to use Peter's portal. As she watched the portal close behind them with a look of awe, Tony just strolled through casually and made his way to a nearby minibar, where he poured himself a very large glass of whiskey. Peter removed the lawyer suit and found a place to sit while thinking of what today's events mean. Iron Man 2. He thought. Vanko or Whiplash would come after Tony soon enough. This whole debacle with the Senator and Justin Hammer was like a flag telling him that Iron Man 2 would be happening soon. Using his intelligence and patience, Vanko vowed revenge against the son of the man that ruined his and his father's lives. His goal is to destroy Howard Stark's legacy, Tony, and the Stark family's reputation altogether. Sadly, Vanko is a pretty low-level villain, 
and even when he teams up with Justin Hammer, Tony should still be able to handle the situation on his own. Especially since Tony has gone through the Avengers training program and the design of his suit is ahead of what he had in the movie. Peter would know as they work on his suit together every once in a while. Maybe this would be a good test for the more inexperienced Avengers? Peter thought as he and anyone on the council could probably handle this situation on their own. Even Fury, who's a human with no powers or advanced armor like Tony, would probably be able to handle this situation if given enough time and recourses. The only problem is Tony's arc reactor. He is using palladium as the core, which is poisoning him and increasing his blood toxicity as the core degrades. After researching and testing every known element, Tony still could not find one that could work in place of palladium, so he had to remain with what worked, even if it was bad for his health. Although Tony doesn't need the arc reactor to keep the shrapnel away from his heart, as he had that surgically removed in preparation for meeting Magneto, that doesn't mean the reactor isn't still poisoning his body. Tony still wears his reactor at all times in preparation for any possible situation that could break out, so he still needs to discover a better element before he kills himself. Tony would have to make a new element as he did in the movie, which he unceremoniously dubbed Badassium. Thankfully, Peter knows how he figured it out so this can be solved easily. Taking out his phone, Peter sent everything he knows about Ivan Vanko to Scythe and asked him to track him down. Once Peter has a handle on the situation, he can bring it up to the council and have an Avengers team take care of it or work out some chance meeting between them. It's the perfect test for them after all. With that settled, Peter turned to Tony and Pepper who stood by his side and spoke. So, Tony. Do you plan to tell us about your most recent problem? Peter says, causing Tony to freeze mid-drink and Pepper to look at him in confusion. What's he talking about, Tony? Pepper asks as Tony averts his eyes. I don't know what you're talking about. Tony says as he tries to avoid this conversation. Okay. Peter says with a nod as he shoots a web at Tony's shirt and pulls, yanking the billionaire's upper clothes clean off. As Tony's naked chest was revealed to the world, the veins surrounding the arc reactor, which was still attached to his bare chest, were clearly visible and dyed black like ink. What the? Pepper gasped as she stepped closer to get a better look. What happened? It's just some palladium poisoning. Tony says as he covers his chest with his arms and glares at Peter. I'm working on a fix. There's no reason to worry. Why didn't you tell me? Pepper asks as she moves his arms out of the way and touches the black veins. Well, you've been busy with becoming CEO of the company, so I didn't want to add more to your plate. Tony says as he looks away awkwardly. Are these two making this an intimate moment somehow? Peter thought as he watched them interact. They should just get together already? That's not an excuse. You're killing yourself. Take it off. Pepper says, knowing that Tony doesn't need the arc reactor as he removed the shrapnel long ago. I'd rather not. Tony says as he backs away. Why? Pepper asks confusedly. I just feel naked without it. Tony says as he looks down at the glowing blue object on his chest. What? It's killing you? Pepper states plainly. Yes, but I'm working on a solution. Tony says defensively. Without it, I feel like I'm unarmed. I need to be ready for any dangerous situation. At this point, it all made sense for Pepper. Tony has some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. He's acting like a veteran soldier that refuses to part with his service pistol. Peter already knew this from his time spent with Tony and his character in the movies. Look, I get it. Peter joins the conversation as Tony puts his shirt back on. I know that I joke about this a lot, but you don't have powers like the rest of the Avengers, so I understand why you feel so attached to the source of your power. However, you shouldn't be hiding such a huge problem like this. There are many people in the Avengers that are qualified and would be glad to help you, myself included. Tony has no words to fight back and Pepper nodded alongside every word that came out of Peter's mouth just now. Fine. Tony gives up with a tired sigh. I need help, but I still refuse to remove the arc reactor. Tony. Pepper goes to speak but Peter cuts her off. Fine, how much time before the poisoning gets bad? Peter agrees and asks, causing Pepper to turn to him with an imploring look. What? He's far too stubborn to see reason. Let's just focus on a fix before it's too late. I resent that. Tony says as he pours himself a new drink. You didn't answer the question. Peter says. I have about two weeks to a month before we have to start worrying. Tony says after sipping his liquor. Okay, let's recruit Banner, Charles, and Beast. With a stack team like that, we'll have a fix for this in no time. Peter says as he takes out a phone and sends a message to the Avengers group text, causing Tony's phone to vibrate. Pulling it out, Tony reads the text out loud. Yo, Tony is dumb and dying. 
I hereby summon all big brains to the tower. Get here ASAP before he croaks, Tony reads the message that was sent to every Avenger with an unamused look on his face. Seriously? What? Peter says with a shrug. You are dumb for keeping this from us and you are dying if we don't figure this out. I agree, this was a very stupid thing to hide from us. Pepper starts reaming into Tony as Peter gets up and slowly sneaks away. I may not be able to help but the Avengers could. You just don't think about anyone else. I mean really how could you? You could have died? Why can't you just, so irresponsible of you? Tony was stuck there taking the sharp words from Pepper, while Peter snuck away to relax before they all got to work. Peter could feel the pleading look that Tony was giving him as he left, but simply ignored it and went on his way. He would have to get used to such treatment when they're in a relationship anyway. It would only get worse at that point. After sneaking off, Peter made his way through the tower, looking for the model of the Stark Expo that Howard Stark left behind, as it held the secret to making the element Tony needs. Howard believed it to be the key to limitless, renewable, clean energy. However, limited by the technology of his time, Howard was unable to create the element for himself and instead left the blueprints for the element hidden in the model that Peter is searching for, hoping that his son would complete his creation in the future. Within the next two hours, Bruce, Charles, and Henry, Beast, rushed to the top of the tower with confused and worried looks on their faces. At first, they thought this was a joke, but after getting some more information from Peter and Pepper, they fully understood the problem. Why can't you just take it off until we find a replacement? Banner asks as if it was a simple solution, which it was but Tony was as stubborn as a mule and extremely paranoid from his recent experiences. I refuse. Tony says plainly, guarding his arc reactor against everyone's prying eyes. We refuse your refusal. Beast says as he tries to rush at Tony to take it off of him. Keyword tries. As soon as Henry's hairy blue form moves toward Tony, the floor opens up and a red and gold piece of tech flies. It attaches to Tony's outstretched hand and turned into a glove, matching the one on his Iron Man suit. Instantly, the center of his palm glowed blue and fired a blast of energy, which impacted Beast and launched his body across the room. As Henry impacted the wall, the putrid smell of burned hair fills the room, causing some to cover their noses to block out the smell. Peter just stood at the side watching the whole situation play out. If Tony wouldn't give up the reactor after Pepper pleaded to him, then he wouldn't give it up for anyone. Tony wasn't playing around and called the rest of his armor, which shot into the room and attached to his body one piece at a time. The only piece that didn't come was the helmet, leaving Tony's head as the only exposed body part. Ugh, my fur. Henry says as he stands back to his feet and sees the singe marks on his chest. Well, don't attack me again and you won't lose any more hair. Tony says as his palm thrusters pulse threateningly. I'll keep that in mind. Henry mutters as he brushes the singed hairs off his chest. As this was happening, Fury and Natasha walked into the room. Fury held a closed cardboard box in hand as Natasha walked up behind Tony and poked his exploded neck with a needle, injecting him with some sort of fluid. Out of reflex, the thrusters in Tony's palms fired and hit the floor as he turned to see Natasha with an empty syringe in hand. Oh, God. Are you gonna steal my kidney and sell it? What did she just do to me? Tony begins to panic as he looks around the room in dismay. What did we just do for you? That's lithium dioxide. It's gonna take the edge off. It'll help with the pain and discomfort. Fury says, which causes Tony to notice the ease in the pain he's been feeling recently. Give me a couple boxes of that. I'll be right as rain. Problem solved. Tony says as he points to the needle in Natasha's hand. It's not a cure, it just abates the symptoms. Natasha reluctantly informs him. You're still poisoned. That thing in your chest is based on unfinished technology, Stark. Fury says as he walks forward and hands the box over to Tony, who took it out of reflex. No, it was finished. It just wasn't particularly effective until I miniaturized it and put it in my chest. Tony rebuts as he looks down at the box as if to say, what's this? No. Howard said the arc reactor was the stepping stone to something greater. He was about to kick off an energy race that was gonna dwarf the arms race. Your father was on to something big, something so big that it was gonna make the nuclear reactor look like a AAA battery. Fury ignores Tony's look and gains the attention of all the scientific minds in the room okay. Tony says almost unbelievably. Well, I've tried everything. I doubt there's something the old man saw that I didn't. You haven't tried everything. Fury says as he walks to the door. What do you mean I haven't tried everything? What haven't I tried? Tony asks as Peter walks up and takes the box from him. Tony was too preoccupied with Fury to care as Peter walked over to the couch and started curiously going through the box. He said that you were the only person with the means and knowledge to finish what he started. 
Fury says as he keeps walking away. He said that? Tony asks as Fury stops at the door and turns around. How do you know my father so well? Howard Stark was one of the founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. We worked together a lot before his untimely death. Fury reveals, shocking everyone, especially Tony. What? Tony mutter as Fury turns around and leaves. I got a two o'clock meeting. Fury calls out with a wave as he rounds the corner and disappears from view. Wait, what's with the box? Tony calls out but Fury doesn't come back. So, Peter says as he looks up from the box and at Tony. Your dad was a super spy, huh? Shut up, webhead, Tony says in exasperation. At most my dad was probably just a glorified money and gadget supplier. Trust me, he wasn't some type of James Bond. He was cold, he was calculating. He never told me he loved me. Hell, he never even told me he liked me. Sounds like the personality of a busy spy to me. Peter says jokingly. No, more the personality of a busy CEO who took every opportunity to avoid his family and their problems. Tony says as his suit is removed by robotic arms and he walks over to Peter and looks through the box. What's all this? He asks as Charles, Beast, Pepper, and Banner circle around to see as well. It's just files from your father's time working on the arc reactor with someone named, Anton Vanko. It's all just files and blueprints. Peter says as he already took a look inside. Is that film for a projector? Charles asks as he sees circular tins, which held old school film for videos. It took almost an hour, but after going through the box with everyone, Pepper finally arrived with an old school projector for them to use. She left to find one so that everyone else could go through the box together. Hooking up the projector, they all sat back and watched but soon felt awkward as the film kept played. It seemed to be the outtake slash bloopers for a video that Howard Stark was filming for the expo back in the day. When it got awkward was when Howard suddenly started talking to Tony through the video, as they could all tell that Tony was feeling emotional from it. Tony, you're too young to understand this right now, so I thought I would put it on film for you. I built this for you. Howard gestures to the model of the Stark Expo behind him. Someday you'll realize that it represents a whole lot more than just people's inventions. It represents my life's work. This is the key to the future. I'm limited by the technology of my time, but one day you'll figure this out. When you do, you will change the world. What is and always will be my greatest creation is you, Tony. Remember that. As the video came to an end, Peter could see the mist appear in Tony's eyes but he did a good job at hiding it. That was nice of him. Peter comments as he finds the silence uncomfortable. Shut up, webhead. Tony uses that moment to laugh and wipe the mist from his eyes without anyone noticing. What, you said he was a bastard, but now I think he was just what the anime community would call a tsundera. Peter says, confusing everyone in the room. What the hell is a tsundera? Bruce asks for everyone. Just think of it as someone that has a hard time showing their feelings. They use a hot and cold attitude to mask what they truly feel. Peter explains. Or he was just a bastard. Tony jokes. No, I think that video showed how much your father cared about you. Peter says as he walks up to the projector and rewinds the video. Now there's only one question. Peter pauses the video as it shows a good view of the model behind Howard Stark. Why is that miniature model so important? After dropping that hint about the old Stark Expo model, as no one seemed to pick up on the hint that Howard was broadcasting in the video, Tony had the model brought over as they all got to work trying to decipher what it meant. Peter didn't stick around for long, as he knew that Tony could figure it out on his own, but it was already a done deal with all the helping hands he had at his disposal. As he returned home that night, Peter found May sitting in the living room, laughing at the video of him in his lawyer's suit from earlier in the day. The newscasters were talking about whether Tony Stark should hand over his invention to the government or not, but most seemed to be on the side saying that it's his property and he can do what he wants with it. Of course, as long as he doesn't break any laws in the process, which is almost impossible as Tony's a member of the Avengers. He would have to commit some villainous acts, and the UN would need to get involved for Stearns and Hammer to get what they want. Though that's obviously not happening. Welcome back. May says as she pauses the TV and gestures to the kitchen. I made dinner if you're hungry? Sounds good, I haven't eaten since breakfast. Peter says as he rushes into the kitchen to fill his stomach. You know, I remember telling you to become a lawyer, but I didn't think you'd do it without going to college. May follows behind him. Well, Tony needed help. Peter shrugs as he sees some juicy looking ribs on the countertop and starts eating them then and there. Can the government take his armor? May asks curiously. No, he's an Avenger. We work outside the construction of any government. This was all just a big farce. I'm certain that Senator Stern is getting an earful from the president for all of this. 
Peter says as he cleans the bone and moves on to another rib. If it was a farce, then why didn't you guys just leave instead of going along with it? May asks as she hands Peter a napkin for the barbecue sauce that covered his hands and lips. Because it was live on camera. Peter says with a shrug. It wouldn't look good to the public if I went in and dragged Tony out, so we just had to beat them at their own game. <laughs> May nodded in understanding as she walks over and uncovers a bowl filled with cooked vegetables. Here, don't forget your veggies. Danksh. Thanks, Peter says with a full mouth, accepting the food gladly. In the days to come, Tony and the gang ended up figuring out the secret of the model and started working on making the new element that Howard thought up. Peter helped here and there, but even in this world, Tony was the real brains behind figuring it all out. Of course, Peter already knew the answer but just giving it would be too easy, so he mainly focused on hints to lead them in the right direction. Now, Tony and the rest were rigging up his workshop with all sorts of equipment to actually make the element. While this was all happening, Peter was receiving daily reports from Scythe about Ivan Vanko's movements. Apparently, he's trying to find transport out of Siberia, which wasn't an easy feat for a man with no connections or money. Scythe hasn't mentioned anything about the energy whips and arc reactor that Vanko is supposed to have, but since he's looking to leave his home, that means his equipment is probably finished already. Vanko is definitely on the warpath. Now I just need to figure out where he'll attack Tony and make sure some Avengers are there to intercept. Peter thought, as he still planned to use this as a test for the less experienced members. Vanko may be a villain, but he was fairly weak. In the second Iron Man movie, the public was in a frenzy about Vanko having similar tech to Tony's suit, as they were told everyone was years behind, but Peter always found that really dumb. Vanko's weapons were nothing more than some energy whips and an arc reactor, which happened to be a weaker version of Tony's. Not to mention that, that gap would infinitely widen when Tony upgrades his reactor with potassium. The difference in quality between the two suits was absolutely night and day. Speaking of upgrades, within two days of figuring out the formula, they finished building the huge rig that would create potassium. Peter was sure to come and help during the last moments, as he wanted to see a big moment in history take place. It's not every day that a new element is introduced to the world, after all. Where have you been? Tony asks with a healthy bit of sass in his voice as Peter enters the workshop, where he and everyone else had been working. Lazing around and watching TV. Peter says without an ounce of shame. What about you? Oh, nothing. Tony says with a thick layer of sarcasm. Just tirelessly building a damn particle accelerator for hours on end, so I can save my life. Nothing special. Peter was loving this whole situation. He couldn't count the number of times that the responsibility and work were thrown on his shoulders, so seeing Tony annoyed right now was like icing on the cake. Cool, we gonna fire this baby up? Peter acts oblivious as he walked over and admired their work. Wires were all over the place and there was a big metal tube that was connected in a circle around the entire room. Tony just looked at Peter for a moment before taking a deep breath to calm himself down. He knew that this was revenge for all the work he himself constantly ditches on, so Tony decided to take it in stride and move on. He has a new element to forge, after all. Let's fire it up! Tony exclaims, gaining everyone's attention. Professor X, Beast, and Banner helped a lot so they would stay to see the results of their hard work. You do the honors. Charles says as he gestures to a lever that was connected to the whole rig through many wires. Walking over, Tony reaches out and grasps the lever, pausing for just a second before ripping the lever backward. Instantly, the whole thing powers up, and a blue laser shoots through the particle accelerator's tubing. When the blue laser made its way fully around the tubing, it reflected off a mirror-like piece of metal and shot out of the tubing and toward the center of the room. Suspended in the air where the laser was headed was a triangle-shaped piece of metal. As the laser hit the metal triangle, it seemed to charge up and glow brighter and brighter by the second. Soon, Tony flipped the lever a second time and the laser died off. Though the triangle was still glowing in place at the center of the room. That was easy. Peter commented, gaining a scornful look from Tony as he walked over to the triangle. Using some metal pliers, Tony took the glowing metal piece out of its holders and held it up for a closer look. Congratulations, sir. Jarvis says from the nearby speakers. You have created a new element. Without uttering a single word, Tony took the triangular element and placed it in a nearby arc reactor. The arc reactor casing closes and accepts the element, glowing a bright baby blue soon after. Sir, the reactor is compatible with the modified core. Jarvis' voice fills the room once again. I will run diagnostics. Nah. Tony says as he yanks his own reactor out of his chest and switches it out with the new one. Sir, we are unclear as to the effects. Jarvis tries to dissuade him, but Tony doesn't listen. 
I don't want to hear it, Jarvis. Tony says as the new arc reactor glows brightly and the black veins on his chest begin to recede and disappear. Wait. Banner says as he runs over. That tastes like coconut and metal. Oh wow. Yeah. Tony exclaims excitedly as the arc reactor shines brightly. Peter stands at the side and watches without interfering. Tony was smart enough to know what he was doing, and Peter knew how this would end from watching the movie. Oh wow. Yeah. Tony exclaims as the light of the arc reactor blinds those in the room. Since every part of his body is enhanced, Peter could still see and was surprised to witness the black veins on Tony's chest recede and disappear. It was like the new reactor was affecting his body and cleaning the toxicity from his blood in some way. Peter didn't understand how it could actually do that, though, and he wasn't sure anyone else in the room did either, including Tony himself. Once the light dimmed, and they all could see, Tony stood there breathing heavily with a layer of sweat on his body. He looked far healthier than before. His skin was clearer and had a pinkish hue to it instead of the pale whiteness that it was before. The effects of palladium poisoning seemed to just disappear in mere moments. He almost looked a few years younger as well. I need to study potassium. It could help with both the super soldier serum and the resurrection elixir. Peter thought as he observed the shocking result. Tony. Banner asks as he makes it to Tony's side. Are you okay? Yeah. I think so. Tony replies as he checks over his body. Good. Banner sighs in relief as he smacks Tony upside the head. You idiot. You could have gotten yourself killed. Look what happened to me, and learn from my mistakes. Always double, triple, quadruple, and quintuple check before doing anything. Especially when you're dealing with something like a new element. While Banner was yelling and lecturing Tony for his idiotic behavior, Peter walked over to Tony's computer and started looking into Bedassium. It didn't take long for the others to notice his actions. What are you doing, Spidey? Tony asks as everyone turns to see Peter scrolling through the PC. I'm looking at the structure of your new power source, Peter says as his eyes are glued to the screen. Why? Banner asks as they all walk over. Because if you haven't noticed, Tony is completely healed. Even the poisoning in his blood is gone. Test his toxicity levels and you'll see. Peter says, and Tony grabs a device with a needle attached to it, poking his finger with it. Toxicity, 0%, shit, he's right? Tony mutters as he shows the test to everyone else. The new element somehow healed and purged the poison from your body. Peter says as he turns to Tony. Did any liquid or something exit your body? No. Tony says as he feels around and checks himself over. Then it wasn't purged but destroyed in some way. Peter says, getting everyone else interested in the mystery as well. That's amazing. Banner says as he thinks this could help solve his Hulk problem. This could be a cure for cancer. Beast comments from the side and he was right. This could be a way to cure a lot of diseases. If the element could destroy poison and heal Tony's body, then it could possibly destroy other bodily afflictions as well. Yup, we need to do some testing, but cancer isn't the only disease this could cure. Peter says as he turns to Tony. It could also help our little side project as well. Of course, Peter was referring to the super soldier serum. He just didn't want Beast and Banner to know about it just yet. We should run some tests on Tony to make sure he's alright before jumping into this. Peter says as he forcibly detaches himself from the computer. Those tests can also help us understand the effects of the new element. Whatever you want to call it. With that, everyone jumped to work and started running diagnostics and tests to make sure Tony was okay. During this time, Tony had nothing to do as they worked so he came up with a name for the element. Bedassium. Of course, many didn't agree with such a joke of a name for something so important, but Tony's father was the founder of all of this, so they couldn't force Tony to change his mind. After the tests were finished, they found that Tony's body was completely healthy, almost too healthy. Tony is a big drinker and smokes on occasion, not to mention the drugs he's taken during his partying years, so seeing such a healthy liver and lungs was crazy. His body is in perfect condition. To further test this, they had Tony drink heavily and found that the damage to his liver was healed in an instant. The arc reactor would radiate its energy through his body and slowly heal any damage. Thankfully for him, this didn't speed up his liver, so he could still get drunk all he wanted. Tony just doesn't have to worry about the ramifications anymore, which wasn't good for Tony, who was already a big drinker. I'll have to watch and make sure he doesn't start overly drinking. Peter thought, as he didn't want his friend to become an addict. They also found out that Tony's body heals faster than before. It's not anywhere near as fast as Peter or someone like Deadpool that could heal at crazy rates, but he could heal about three times faster than the average human. Nothing that can be called super but certainly a good improvement. 
A week later, the Avengers were invited to the annual Grand Prix in Monaco. No one wanted to go but Tony, as he already planned on attending for the fun of it. Though, Peter knew that this would be when Vanko attacked Tony. Both from the movie and the hand members that were currently tracking his every movement. Ivan Vanko doesn't empty his bladder without Peter knowing about it, after all. Seeing that this would happen, Peter took the opportunity to accept the invite and form a team that would accompany them. Nightcrawler, Wolverine, Sabretooth, and Storm would be the team. Mystique was a possibility, but her power is better used for espionage, which wasn't needed in this situation. Speaking of Mystique. Flashback. After the Senate Armed Services Committee meeting, Peter called Mystique for a mission. It would be her first mission as an Avenger. Waiting in one of the many meeting rooms in Avenger Tower, Peter sat with a manila folder in hand. Only a minute later, a beautiful blue woman came strutting into the room naked. At first, Mystique wasn't comfortable showing her true form in the tower, as she's used to constantly hiding. The only person that saw her real form constantly was Magneto, but thankfully she's gotten more comfortable in the tower. Do you need something? She asked as she waltzed in and looked at Peter questioningly. Yes, you have your first mission. Congrats. Peter says as he slides the file across the table. Hammer? Mystique says as she opens the file and schemes through it. Yep, his involvement with Tony's hearing was odd. I want you in his circle. Assistant, bodyguard, whatever. Just get close and inform me of his every move. Peter explains. I can get that done. She says as she closes the folder. Good, if you need more information, feel free to ask Jarvis. He can get you information on the people you need to switch out with. Peter says as he stands up to leave the room. Just remember no killing or hurting the people you switch with. I know. Mystique rolls her eyes as she and Sabretooth have to deal with warnings like this all the time. I'll send them on a vacation like the last guy. She understands the warnings when it comes to Sabretooth though, as he is far more wild and bloodthirsty than she could ever be. Good, thanks for the help. Let me know if you need anything. I should have brought my suit. Tony says as they pull up to the hotel they would be staying at in Monaco in a limo. Oh relax. Peter says from beside him. There are five super-powered Avengers here with you. You don't need your suit for this trip. Just enjoy yourself. Tony was having a bit of a panic attack without his suit in arm's reach. Peter specifically dragged him here without the suit on purpose. He had to literally drag him kicking and screaming. Let's just say that there was a fight and Tony didn't win. Tony was like a man that borrowed from the mafia and lost it all, twitching and looking over his shoulder at every possible moment. Tony, relax. Peter says soothingly. Look, I understand you feel unsafe, but that's all in your head. You need to get over this. Look around you. Gesturing across the limo, Tony could see Sabretooth, Wolverine, Storm, and Nightcrawler. Sabretooth and Wolverine were glaring at one another, but that's a problem for later. Including myself, we have enough power in this car to take over a country. Breathe and ask yourself, am I really in danger? Peter says as he pats Tony on the shoulder. You're smart enough to know this. After Tony started to calm down, thanks to Peter's words, the group got settled into their hotel rooms. While this was happening, Peter had to constantly police Logan and his brother Victor. The two have had bad blood between one another long before Peter came around, not to mention the fact that Logan doesn't remember that Victor is even his brother in the first place. Logan was mad and watchful of Victor because of his experiences fighting Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants, while Victor was pissed off that his own brother would completely forget that he existed. Yeah, they didn't have the best relationship. Victor was a very bloodthirsty and almost evil person, but they were brothers to the end. The fact that Logan, which wasn't even his real name, looked at him like a stranger constantly irked something inside Victor. So much so, that a fight broke out soon after they checked into the hotel. Since he knew that his friend was having a hard time, Peter decided to stick close to Tony. He wanted to prove that Tony was safe without the suit, but not go so far as to send him into a full-blown panic attack. While they were hanging out, as the race doesn't start until the next day, the sounds of destruction and animalistic grunts could be heard outside the hotel room. Those bastards just won't quit. Peter mutters as he hops to his feet and runs to the door, with Tony following behind. Outside in the hallway, Sabretooth merely threw his bag in his room and proceeded to make his way over to his brother's room, where he would lay in wait outside like some deranged stalker. This wait didn't last long as both brothers had an animalistic sense and could smell, hear, and sense the other nearby. Logan knew he was outside the door, but instead of acting rationally and contacting Spider-Man to resolve Sabretooth's odd behavior, he instead extended his metallic claws and growled as he rushed to the door, yanked it open, and leaped outside to fight. He knew why Sabretooth was there and was glad to give him exactly what he wanted. A fight. 
They both have been heavily guarded throughout the entire trip by Spider-Man, who wouldn't let them so much as argue, making this moment feel like a long time coming. Hours of tense staring and reprimands from their boss finally culminated in this very moment. Rarg. Logan roars as he leaps out of the room and stabs his claws in Victor's direction. Victor, being used to fighting his brother throughout the many years they've been alive, saw this coming a mile away and retreated backward, causing Logan to embed his claws into the walls of the hotel hallway. Not letting this stop him for a single second, Logan ran at Victor with his claws still in the wall, cutting through it like butter as he closed the distance between him and his most hated enemy. Seeing his brother rushing at him like an angry bull, Victor's own bone claws ejected from his fingernails. Sabretooth didn't get the same adamantium upgrade his brother received all those years ago. Though that doesn't mean he didn't want it. Who would want to fall behind their sibling, after all? No, Victor demanded the adamantium procedure be done on him as well. Sadly for him, he couldn't merge adamantium to his skeleton because the procedure would have killed him. Sabretooth's healing factor just isn't as powerful as Logan's. Wolverine's insane healing ability was the only reason he survived that procedure in the first place. As his brother rushed at him with the intent to kill, Victor glanced between Logan's metal claws and his bony ones and felt extreme jealousy even to this very day. I should have just forced Stryker to do the damn thing. Sabretooth thought as Logan's claws exited the drywall and swung towards his chest. Lifting his foot, Victor Spartan kicked his brother in the chest, causing Logan to launch backward. Though before he was sent to far back, Wolverine's claws managed to graze Sabretooth's chest, tearing through his clothes and leaving three long cuts where each one touched along the way. Ugh? Victor grunted in pain. This is another reason Sabretooth felt so annoyed with his brother's adamantium upgrade. Not only does it give him an unbreakable advantage, but he couldn't block the damn things. Adamantium is the strongest known metal and when sharpened to this degree it can cut through anything like a 1000 degree knife through room temperature butter. Every attack would have to be expertly dodged or redirected somehow. Blocking was simply a losing tactic. As Logan flew backward, he crashed back first into a hotel room door and broke the whole thing off its hinges, landing inside the hotel room. Eha! What the hell? A high-pitched female scream rang out as a man's voice cursed soon after. Logan looked to the side and could see two naked people on the bed. A beautiful blonde woman riding cowgirl on top of a balding middle-aged man. Not only that but the man's arms and legs were handcuffed to the bed and the woman had a small whip in hand. Obviously, these two weren't praying to Jesus or reciting Quran in here. They were shameful sinners indeed. Ignoring these two, Logan jumped to his feet and ran out of the room, where his gut met the clawed fist of his brother, which sent him into the hallway wall. As the wall dents and crumbles a bit, a nearby hotel room door opens, and out comes Spider-Man, seeing the destruction left by his two subordinates battle, Peter was annoyed beyond belief. After keeping them in check all this time, for them to have the nerve to do this while he was away for barely 20 minutes. If he wasn't masked up, then everyone would see a very cross Peter Parker right now. Especially since now, he has to go and apologize to a bunch of people and fork over money for repairs. Peter didn't want to do that. He wanted to hang out with Tony and watch some TV or play some games, not try to cover up the unhinged actions of his subordinates so that this doesn't air on every news channel across the world. There are even a couple of cameras in the hallway. Just as Peter was taking this all in, Tony peeked his head out of the door and saw everything. Logan and Victor haven't even stopped fighting and didn't notice their arrival in the hall. Oh, shit? Tony muttered as he could tell that Peter has had enough of dealing with them. Webhead? Without a word, Peter kicked off the floor and lunges forward. Shooting a web at the two brothers that were brawling along the hallway, Peter pulled them apart before yanking Logan's body back toward Victor, smashing the two together and sending them flying down the hall together. I've had enough with you too. Peter talks normally, knowing that they could hear him even if he whispered. Walking over to them at a normal pace, Peter watched as they stood up and turned to see the person that sent them flying. First, I have to babysit you all the way here and now you have the audacity to fight like a bunch of animals? Peter says as he gets closer and closer. Look, we're sorry, just calm down, okay? Logan tried to use reason for once, forgetting about his earlier fight with Victor. He has a plethora of experience challenging Peter to a fight and knew exactly where this was headed. Hey, to hell him. Victor says to his brother as he glares in Peter's direction. I've been waiting for an opportunity like this. Let's gut this overgrown spider. Sadly, Victor doesn't have that well of experience. He only fought Peter once, and Magneto got involved before it could really get anywhere. No, you don't get it, we won't win, and it won't even be fun. Logan tries to stop Victor, but it was too late. Peter shot a web at the floor in front of him and yanked on it, launching himself forward and appearing before Sabretooth. 
Learn when to shut your mouth. Peter says as his fist collides with Victor's face. Crack crack crack, audible cracking sounds are heard as Sabretooth's nose breaks, and a few of his teeth are chipped and broken as well. The momentum of the punch sends the big guy barreling into the wall, which dents and crumbles as he falls to the floor completely unconscious. Wait, I give up. Logan says with his hands up as Peter turns his attention toward him. Take your punishment like a man. Peter says as he walks over, cracking his knuckles along the way. Ah, uh, my head? Sabretooth grunted as he woke from his forced sleep. What the hell, rattle rattle the sound of chains shaking could be heard as Victor tries to move, opening his eyes to see a dark room with one other person in front of him. Wolverine. After knocking the two out at the hotel, Peter portaled them to an abandoned warehouse, tied them in chains, and left to deal with the mess they made. Ugh hi. Victor grunted loudly as he tried and failed to break the thick layer of chains that bound his entire body. Trying for a while longer, Sabretooth gave up and looked toward his brother, who was still knocked out and tied similarly to himself. Hey, wake up! Victor called out but received no response. Mother schmucker. Wiggling over like a worm, Victor positioned himself close to his brother and nudged his head with his foot, as it was his only body part besides his head that was unchained. Wake up, dumbass! Sabretooth yelled as Wolverine began to stir. What the? Get off me! Logan yells as he tries to move away, but soon finds his body trapped in chains as well. What the hell? Even his hands were positioned in a way that made his claws completely useless. His hands were outside the chains and angled in a way that he couldn't himself free. Good you're awake. Victor says as he turns to look at his brother. Now, help me figure a way out of this. Before either brother could say another word, a portal opened in the center of the warehouse, and out walked Peter and Tony. Peters held two VHS tapes in hand, while Tony was tucking his checkbook back into his suit jacket's inner pocket. Ah, you two are awake, good. Peter says, as he crushed the plastic, takes it in his hands and throws the remains at the two brothers. We just got done covering up the bullshit you idiots caused. Tony had to pay off the hotel staff, owners, and witnesses. Meanwhile, I stole the security tapes because you idiots decided to fight right in view of multiple cameras. Damn you! Sabretooth says venomously as he wiggles in his chains. Unchain me, so I can tear your head off and shit down your neck. You, kinky! Tony comments from the side. Yeah, no thanks. Peter says as he walks over. You two need to resolve your issues because this type of behavior can't happen during future missions. Are we giving them counseling now? Tony asks jokingly. If we have to, Peter says as Sabretooth starts wiggling in his direction, intending to bite his ankles. Seriously? What are you, a child? Whack, as soon as Victor brought himself in range, Peter wound his foot back and kicked his head like a pro soccer player, sending him rolling across the floor and crashing into Logan. All right, he'll give you two a helping hand to kick this off. Peter says as he looks down at both of them. Logan, meet Victor, your brother. What? Logan exclaims in confusion as he looks at Victor. Hey, little brother. Victor greets as the damage to his face from the kick slowly heals away. If you'll remember, when you two were joining the Avengers, you were put through extensive tests and questioning. Peter explains as Logan looks to him for answers. Victor explained a bit of your backstory together during that. We also received information from his comrades. Not to mention, your blood test showed that you two are related. Half-brothers, to be exact. I, I can't remember. Logan says in shock, causing Victor to scoff at him. Yeah, I know. Victor says in distaste. Well, it's probably for the best that you don't remember. From what I've heard, Victor has been a fairly shitty brother, but I'm sure you can imagine. Peter says, getting a nod from Logan and a glare from Victor. I'm sure you still want to remember, though. I would feel the same. As Peter says this, he shoots some webs at the two, sticking them to the ground so they have even less of a chance to escape. They could do nothing but lay on the floor and look at one another. What's that for? Logan asks. You two will spend the night here talking and resolving your issues. Peter says as he opens a portal behind Tony. We'll see you two in the morning for the races. Wait! Don't you dare leave me here! Victor yells, but Peter just waved as they walked through the portal, leaving the two alone in the quiet warehouse. So? Logan says, unsure of what to say at this point. You're my brother? Damn you! Returning to the hotel, Peter and Tony hung out for the rest of the day with Storm and Nightcrawler. Thanks to today's events, Tony seemed to forget his own problem and calm down a bit. Although he didn't stop looking over his shoulder or worrying, the frequency at which he did so slowed by a good bit. Paranoia can be good in moderation, but the level that Tony has even now is just far too much for a person to handle. Maybe I should get him a therapist when we get back. 
Peter thought as he worried about his friend's state of mind. An official Avengers therapist doesn't sound like a bad idea either. It shouldn't hurt for the team to have someone to talk to. After all, superpowered individuals with mental problems is a possible villain in the making. So many problems could come from that. Next morning, after a good night's sleep, Peter portaled back to the warehouse and found both Logan and Victor staring at each other in silence. How was your night? Peter says as he steps out of the portal. Great, now untie me. Logan says, as he's tired of staring at his long-lost brother's face. Victor doesn't say a word this time, which was odd, but Peter just let it go with a shrug. Sure, but I want to make something clear. Peter says as he walks over. If you cause trouble again, no matter what it is, the punishment will be worse than a night in a warehouse. I'll lock you two up in a room with a therapist for weeks. You'll be forced to talk about your feeling and understand each other. Wouldn't that be nice? God no. Logan mutters as his brother pales. There's one thing that two gruff, manly, men are afraid of, and that's exactly what Peter just described. Logan and Victor would rather die than express their feelings and look deep within themselves. Then don't cause any more trouble. Your brothers, after all, act like it. Peter says as he breaks the chains that held them in place. Let's go, you two need to get ready for the races. A limo pulled up to an expensive-looking restaurant, which was surrounded by photographers and press. This restaurant has the best balcony view of the race, where everyone who is someone or has connections would sit, eat, and watch the race. As the door to the limo opened up, a surprising group of people exited one after another. First, it was Tony Stark, but the next person shocked everyone. A blue man exited the limo, Nightcrawler. The world hasn't been exposed to many of the Avengers members just yet. Yeah, Nightcrawler was at the UN meeting last year, but that wasn't shown to the public. Neither did he stick around long enough during the Abomination incident to end up on the news. As every Avenger exited the car and walked inside, the flashes of cameras surrounded their every movement, especially Nightcrawler and Spider-Man walking inside, Pepper Potts met up with them as they would all sit together. She was here on Stark Industries business as she is becoming the CEO. Tony. Hey, pal. Someone called out to them as they were walking past the many famous and rich people toward their table. Peter could even see Elon Musk seated at a table across the room. Sadly, Elon wasn't the one calling out to Tony. Justin Hammer. Tony says as he turns to see Hammer walking over with a woman at each side. One seemed to be his date by the dress she was wearing, while the other looked to be his assistant. How are you doing, buddy? For some reason, Hammer was pretending to be Tony's friend. You're not the only rich guy here with a fancy car. While Tony and Pepper were reluctantly speaking with Justin Hammer and his date, the assistant that accompanied them looked toward Peter and winked. Mystique, Spider-Man. Justin Hammer turns his attention from Tony to Peter. It's good to see you again. Hmm? Peter decided to play dumb and mess with him. Who are you? If he wants to play friends and smile for the crowd, then Peter would make this uncomfortable for him. Boy did those three words work like a charm. Hammer went from having a fake friendly smile on his face to a look of shock and anger. He thought that he could make friends with the Spider-Man and the Avengers through Tony, especially after the failure of stealing the Iron Man suit, but that for sure wasn't happening. Justin Hammer. He says, pointing to himself. We met at that committee meeting a week or two ago? Hmm, not ringing any bells. Peter says as he puts on a thoughtful face. You pretty much called me incompetent the whole time. Hammer was really trying to get Peter to remember. Oh, yeah. Peter says as he puts on an almost dismissive look. Well, it was nice meeting you, again, but we should get to our table. The race will be starting soon. Without waiting for a reply, Peter walked off toward the balcony and took a seat at an open table, where he could see the track where the race would take place on. It didn't take long for the rest of his group to take the same excuse as Peter and follow along. They would rather do anything than deal with such a fake person after all. Tony was grinning like a madman, happy that Hammer didn't get what he wanted and was embarrassed at the same time. As they all ordered food and the cars started to pour out onto the track, Peter received a message from Scythe, stating that Vanko was sneaking in through the employee entrances. How is he sneaking in with two giant electronic whips and all his equipment? Peter thought in doubt. Is he that skilled in infiltration or does he have some sort of plot armor? Of course, Peter was kidding about the plot armor, but he was confused about how a poor Russian scientist could do such a thing. Maybe all big-name Marvel villains get a jack-of-all-trades type of buff that helps them commit their crimes? Peter thought with an uncaring shrug. At the end of the day, it really didn't matter. While the cars were starting to line up on the track, Tony tried to sneak off to the bathroom, but Peter stopped him by grabbing his shoulder. You are not racing. Peter says, knowing that this would put him in danger from his movie knowledge. 
What? I'm just going to the bathroom. Relax. Tony says with a laugh as he shrugs Peter's hand off and strolls away. Maybe I was wrong? Peter thought. Maybe the reason that Tony joined the race in the movie was that he was dying and fulfilling some sort of bucket list. Now that he's healed and running better than ever before, the thought of putting himself in a dangerous situation for the fun of it was stupid. After a while of waiting for Tony's return, Peter learned just how dumb he was to believe in his friend. The restaurant they sat in had flat screen TVs everywhere for the race, and they showed the image of a dressed up Tony Stark hopping into a race car with the Stark Industries logo prominently displayed all over its body. I shouldn't have believed in him. Peter mutters and gets an understanding nod from Pepper, who was more than used to these kind of things happening by now. Want me to go get M, boss? Nightcrawler asks between bites of bread that the waiter brought, as he could just teleport Tony back in a matter of seconds. No, let him have his fun. They'll be ready to help if he crashes, please. Peter says after a moment of thought. He's certainly reckless enough for that to happen. Pepper mutters. She may act like this doesn't faze her, but Pepper was fairly nervous about Tony's well-being. She and Tony have always had a romantic connection with one another, but she refused to admit it due to his playboy attitude and lifestyle. Who would want to date a man that would cheat on you after all? As all of the cars lined up and engines start roaring, the race is counted down and takes off with the wave of a flag. Tony is surprisingly quite skilled at race car driving as he passes a few cars before finding much more skilled opponents in the front half of the race. While the race is happening, a man dressed in orange pit crew clothing walks beside the track. Without a care for his safety, the orange-clad man steps over the barricades and onto the raceway. A car whizzes past the man as he takes off his jacket and unfurls two thick metallic-looking whips, which were held in each hand and connected to a harness on his chest. As his jacket falls to the ground, a circular panel on his chest harness lights up and ignites the whips of blue electricity. What the? Pepper mutters in confusion as she watches this happen. Peter watched as well, confirming that it was indeed Ivan Vanko, Whiplash. Kurt, go and take all the racers to safety. Start with Tony, please. Ignoring all the cars that were in the lead as they pass him by, careful not to run over the lunatic that's trying to kill himself on the track, Vanko winds his arm back and strikes out at a car. Tony's car? The whip hits the front end of the car, slicing through it like butter. As the front half disconnects from the back, where Tony was driving from, the back half flipped forward and launched off the ground. While the car was midair and Tony was screaming in fright, Kurt disappears in a puff of blue smoke and appears on top of the soaring car. Hey, boss! Nightcrawler greets as he touches Tony and disappears just in time for the car to crash into the ground and catch on fire. As Tony and Kurt appeared back on the balcony, Pepper rushes to Tony and started hugging him, but that didn't last long as she began to hit him and complain about taking unnecessary risks. Just going to the bathroom, huh? Peter says jokingly. Hey hey hey. Tony laughs awkwardly as his heart rate slows, calming down from the life-threatening situation he was just in. Ignoring Tony, who was still getting an earful from Pepper, Peter turned to the Avengers and gave out some orders. Alright, this just went from a vacation to an active situation. Let's see how you all handle it. Peter says as they all straighten their backs a bit. Kurt, deliver your comrades to the enemy and then get back to evacuating the racers and anyone else that could get in the way. Remember, I want him captured alive. You're on camera, so act like it. Storm stays quiet as usual and nods to her orders, while Sabretooth and Wolverine simply grunt in affirmation. Though they were excited to fight someone that wouldn't absolutely demolish them like Peter. You got it. Kurt says as he takes hold of the group, and they disappear in a puff of blue smoke. Sitting back down, Peter watched the TVs, which were following Vanko's every move, and saw the team appear before the enemy. Kurt didn't stick around and disappeared, leaving the fighting to the rest while he did as he was told and got the racers off the track. Are you not going to help them? Pepper asks as she fawns over Tony, looking for any injuries. She may not want to admit it, but she loves the guy. Even after yelling at him for so long, she still cares enough to make sure he's alright. Nah, they need the training anyway. Peter says with a shrug. They haven't had a big enemy to test themselves on just yet, so this would be their chance to shine. Are you sure they can handle it? Tony asks as he sits beside Peter and watches the TVs as well. This whip guy doesn't seem very strong, so they should be fine. Peter says as Pepper joins them at the table. My question is how does he have an arc reactor? Hearing Peter's words, Tony took a close look at the screen and saw a glowing object on the chest of the man that cut his car in half. What? As Storm, Wolverine, and Sabretooth appeared before the whip-wielding maniac, they all jumped to do something different. All of them have been trained to the standards of a low-level shield grunt, but never have they worked together in battle before. 
Victor and Logan were the only two Avengers that have a long history of fighting as partners, but sadly Logan remembers none of it. Though that chemistry they once had seemed to still be there, if only slightly, as both brothers rushed forward at the enemy in tandem. Logan's mind may have forgotten, but his body seemed to retain some memory of its own. As the two brothers rushed at the enemy like angry bulls, Storm did what she does best. Using the wind to carry her body up above and out of range of the enemy's whips, she spread her arms and the weather changed in an instant. What was a clear and sunny day turned dark, cloudy, and windy at an abnormal rate. At this point, the thousands of people in attendance, who came to watch the races, broke from their shock and started running to the exits. Screams were heard as they all evacuated in messy groups. As this was happening, Logan and Victor began to close in on their opponent, claws out and feral grins on their faces. I'm not here for you. Vanko says in a thick Russian accent. Go away and bring me Tony Stark. With that said, Vanko winds a whip back and lashed out at both attackers, not noticing the swift change in weather up above him. As the whip swung horizontally toward the two animalistic metahumans, Logan dipped under while his brother jumped over, dodging the whip with ease. Vanko saw this coming and already had his second whip ready to go, bringing it down on the brother that had nowhere to go, Sabretooth. Victor took the high route and was now stuck in the air, unable to dodge. Logan was smart to simply duck under the first attack, as he could still use the ground to maneuver his way around any follow-up attacks. Glancing up to see the second whip, which was falling vertically towards his newfound brother, Logan acted quickly and kicked off the grounds as well. Swinging his clawed hand, Logan went to cut the electrified whip and did so easily. Sadly, the whip was in fact electrified and every bone in Wolverine's body, including his claws, was coated in metal. As Logan's claws sunk into the whip, the current of power from Vanco's arc reactor redirected its course. Flowing down Logan's claws and into his body, spreading to every connected bone it could. As the foreign electricity invaded Logan's entire body, he convulsed midair and fell to the floor with blood leaking out of every orifice of his body. Though, his efforts weren't in vain. Logan managed to cut the whip before it touched his brother, saving Victor from his possible death. After all, Sabretooth's healing factor is nowhere near as good as Logan's. As Victor lands and stops to look at his downed brother's form, Vanko speaks in his deep Russian accent once again. You should have left when I gave you the chance. He says as he spins both whips like helicopter blades and walks toward Victor. Now, you will die like your friend. As he draws closer to Victor, rumbling could be heard from the sky above. Neither Victor nor Vanko seemed to notice as the loud sound of the spinning whips drowned everything else out. When Vanko was almost in striking range, the cloudy sky lit up and a loud crashing sound could be heard. Asterisk crash? Zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Of course, Peter already knows all of this information thanks to his trusty ninja organization, but he won't volunteer any of it. He would rather keep the hand a secret from his fellow Avengers. At least, for now. Facial recognition confirmed, Ivan Vanko. Jarvis says after only a few seconds. Why does that sound familiar? Tony asks with a questioning look. Wasn't Vanko the name alongside your father's in the original Arc Reactor blueprints? From the box that Fury gave you, remember? Peter drops a major hint, which causes Tony's eyes to widen in realization. Wasn't it Anton Vanko though? Pepper says as she remembered. Correct, Anton Vanko was his father. Jarvis says over the phone speaker. Okay, then why is the son of a man that worked with my old man attacking the Grand Pix? Tony asks in confusion. He's not attacking the Grand Prix per se. Peter hints as Pepper begins to realize. He's attacking Tony. Pepper blurts out her thought. Exactly. Peter says with a nod. Why else would he ignore every car but Tony's? At least three cars passed him before Tony came along, and all were left unharmed. Peter says, happy that they were all finally on the same page. Why would he want to attack Tony? Pepper asks in confusion. I don't know. Peter said with a shrug. Maybe his father had a grudge or Tony did something that unknowingly irked him. Jarvis, any ideas? Tony asks, knowing that Jarvis is looking into it. Yes, Anton Vanko was deported back to Russia after selling Stark Company secrets on the black market. This is all the information I have at the moment, sir. Jarvis explains. Makes sense. Peter says with a nod. What makes sense? Pepper asks questioningly. Well, if he was deported for selling Stark secrets, it makes sense that Howard was involved in that process. I'm sure Anton wasn't happy about that. Now, a father's hate is being acted out by his son. Peter says getting a nod from Tony. Though there may be another reason. This one is the most likely. Asterisk crash? Zzzzzz asterisk the sound of lightning striking breaks them from their conversation. Looks like they're done. Making their way through the fairly empty raceway, Peter walked up to the group of Avengers that have gathered around the now detained Ivan Vanko. Logan was awake and sitting on the ground with a tired look on his face. He may be able to heal extremely quickly but the pain and experience of having his entire skeleton electrified seems to have taken a toll. At least mentally. Victor, Nightcrawler, and Storm were standing guard over Ivan, who was tied up in his own whips with a conflicted look on his face. On one hand, he completed what he set out to accomplish. Proving Tony's words at the committee meeting wrong. I'd say most countries are 5 or 10 years away. Hammer Industries, 20. Tony said before the world that no one would be able to copy what he has created. In Peter's humble opinion that's still true, as the only piece of equipment that resembles Tony's Iron Man suit is Vanco's arc reactor, but the public probably wouldn't see things that way. Those with ulterior motives would come out of the woodwork and start making a fuss, which would then rile up those with similar opinions and sway those that are susceptible. On the other hand, he also wanted to injure the son of the man that ruined his and his father's lives. He knew that the odds were against him, as Tony's suit was far better than his own. After all, the man had more money, time, and resources to put into his suit. Although killing him wasn't possible just yet, injuring him was certainly plausible. If you could make God bleed, people would cease to believe in him. There will be blood in the water, the sharks will come. The truth is, all I have to do is sit here and watch as the world will consume you. Ivan said in the movie. In order to truly set the public against Tony Stark, Vanko wanted to show that the hero they worshipped was only human. Sadly, he didn't even get the chance to fight who he wanted. Peter made sure of that. Hello, Ivan Vanko, correct? Peter says as they stroll over, with Tony and Pepper following closely behind him. Huh? What do you want? Vanko says in distaste as he turns to see Tony standing beside Peter. Stark. The son of a thief finally shows himself. Tony doesn't reply just yet as he walks over and takes a look at Vanko's equipment. Pretty decent tech. Cycles per second look a little low. You could have doubled up your rotations. You focus the repulsor energy through ionized plasma channels. It's effective. Not very efficient, but it's a passable knockoff. Tony says as he examines the broken arc reactor on Vanko's chest. I don't get it. A little fine-tuning, and you could have made a solid paycheck. You could have sold it to North Korea, China, or Iran, or gone on to the black market like your father. I'm sure he would be happy to share his connections with you. My father is dead. Ivan says as he glares at Tony. He's the reason you're alive. Well, my condolences, I guess. Tony says, unsure of how to answer that. You come from a family of thieves and butchers. Vanko didn't care for Tony's condolences, as he spat in his direction. Now, like all guilty men, you try to rewrite your own history. 
You forget all the lives the Stark family has destroyed. Mine and my father's are only small pebbles in that mountain. Okay, Tony says, as he doesn't know whether to feel bad for him or not. Well, have fun in your prison cell. I'll send you a bar of soap and some adult entertainment magazines. After stripping Vanko of his equipment and confiscating it, they handed him off to the police and went on their way. Of course, Peter dispatched some hand ninjas to follow and keep an eye on things. Just in case. I was at a hearing where Mr. Stark, in fact, was adamant that these suits can't exist anywhere else, don't exist anywhere else, will never exist anywhere else, at least for 5 to 10 years, and here we are in Monaco realizing that these suits exist now. Stern was giving a speech on the TV in the council room of Avengers Tower. Just as Peter expected, the clowns came out of the woodwork to capitalize on this incident. The snakes are out? Tony mutters as he came to the same conclusion. Yeah, but they can do nothing. Peter says as he gets a text and checks his phone. I have to go. I'll be back soon with a present for you. In a pristine private airplane hangar, armed security patrols the area as Justin Hammer sits at a fancy dinner table with a glass of red wine in hand. Standing beside him like a sort of attendant, Hammer's beautiful assistant waits patiently to help with any of her boss's whims. Moments later, a line of blacked-out SUVs drives in, past the security and park one by one beside a private jet. The doors open and similar-looking security guards come pouring out and escort a bound and blindfolded man to the dinner table, seating him across from Hammer. Ripping off the blindfold, the man is revealed to be Ivan Vanko, freshly broken out of prison. Hey, there he is. What an absolute pleasure. Welcome. Hammer tries his best to make a good impression, but Vanko looks at him as if he were an idiot. Oh goodness gracious. Can we get the handcuffs off my friend here? Forgive me, I'm such a huge fan of yours. I didn't want to make a first impression like this. He's not an animal. Come on, he's a human being. Warily following their boss's orders, guards take off the restraints but stick close by, ready for any possible attacks from their guest. My name is Justin Hammer. I'd like to do some business with you. Please sit. Dig in. What do we have today Jack? Hammer introduces himself and turns to speak to a nearby waiter. Salmon Carpaccio, sir. He answers instantly and dutifully. Anything you want here, we got it. I like my wine first. I had this flown in from San Francisco. It's Italian though. Organic somehow as well. I have a bit of an obsession. Apparently, you do too, for Tony Stark. I couldn't bear to have you shipped off to God knows where. It would have been such a waste of talent, but if I might make a suggestion. You shouldn't just go and try to kill the guy. Go after his legacy. That's what you kill. Then you can off him later on. Hammer says and pauses, hoping for Ivan to join the conversation but he doesn't. You and me, we are a lot alike in a lot of ways. The only difference between you and me is that I have resources. I think, if I may, you need my resources. Someone behind you, a benefactor. I'd like to be that guy. What do you think? Hammer asks. Если меня убьют, не буди меня. Лучше умереть, чем жить в своем мире. Vanko pretends that he doesn't speak English. Okay, do you speak English? Because I can get a translator. I don't know. Have you been understanding everything I'm saying? Hammer asks, hiding his annoyance as best as he can. Very good, man. Vanko says in broken English. Very good, man. Hammer repeats, hoping that meant he understood. Very good, man. Vanko repeats one more time with a nod. Cheers. Hammer holds up his glass toward his new partner. Будем здоровы. Ivan grabs the wine bottle and clinks it against the glass before taking a big swig of it. As Hammer was celebrating internally, Vanko spoke up. I want my bird. Vanko says in his fake broken English. A bird? You want a bird? Hammer asks in confusion. I want my bird. Ivan clarifies. I can get you a bird. I can get you ten birds. Hammer says, hoping to solve this quickly. I want my bird. He clarifies a bit more forcefully this time. Well, okay. Nothing's impossible. I could. What are we talking about? Is this a bird back in Russia? As they were talking, a blue and red clad man in a spider themed suit walks down the runway toward the heavily guarded hangar. He walked casually as one by one the guards noticed his arrival and cocked their guns, aiming them in his direction and calling out over the radio. Sir, we have a problem. A security guard rushed over to Hammer and Vanko, interrupting their dinner. What? Hammer asks in annoyance as he was doing his best to sway his guest to his side. A Spider-Man is here. The guard says with a wary look on his face. Hammer whips his head to stare at the guard, unsure if he heard correctly. Say that again. Spider-Man. He's here, sir. He repeats, gripping his assault rifle tightly in hand. What? 
Hammer drops the glass of wine he was holding and stands up. Where is he? We need to go. As Hammer comes to this realization, the sound of shouting could be heard outside. This is a restricted area. Turn around and leave now. One of the more confident security guards tried to shoo Peter away. This didn't seem to work because only seconds later the sounds of painful screams and gunfire filled the air, frightening Hammer more than he already was. While Hammer started panicking and ordering around his guards, Vanko, who was thankfully unrestrained by this point, stood up and stealthily walked to the back of the hangar, hoping to find a backdoor exit to slip through. As the sounds of screaming and gunfire grew further and further away, Vanko found a door with a red sign above it that read, Emergency Exit. Hee hee, my luck is good. Vanko chuckles lowly as he paces to the door and reaches out to push it open. Not so much. A female voice says from behind as the sound of a taser gun firing could be heard. Asterisk pew. Zzzzzzzzz asterisk a group of small metal darts fires out of a bright yellow gun. Each metal dart is connected to a long and thin wire that connects back to the gun. Each metal dart makes contact with Vanko's unsuspecting back and digs into his flesh. Though, the pain of this was nothing compared to what happened next. Over 50,000 volts of electricity rush from the gun, down the wires, and into Vanko's back. The electricity tenses his muscles and stops him in place before he could touch the door. Ow you! Vanko grunts in pain as his muscles no longer listen to him, and he toppled over onto the hangar floor, shaking from the constant flow of electricity moving through his body. Huh? This thing works pretty well. Hammer's secretary mutters as she walks over and makes eye contact with Vanko, her eyes flashing yellow for only a brief moment. Where do you think you're going? Zakroi kratke svoj rot, suka. Shut your mouth, bitch. Vanko squeezes out through the pain, but shuts his mouth as he sees her eyes change. How rude. She says and stomps on Ivan's head, knocking him unconscious. Load up the plane. Quick. 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 Hammer instructs some guards as the sounds of gunfire and cries of pain outside the hangar lessen by every passing second. No, we don't need that. Just get the plane running. We don't have time. While his employees were working in overdrive to get their boss out of the situation they'd found themselves in, Hammer noticed that someone was missing. Vanko, who was the whole reason that he came here in the first place, was nowhere to be seen. Sir, the jet is ready to go. A guard says as he runs over to Hammer's side. Where's Ivan? We can't leave without him. Hammer asks his nearby guards. Sir, we don't have time. It's either stay and get caught by Spider-Man, or leave now. One guard says it how it is. Sadly, Hammer knew that Vanko was the key to finally outdoing Tony Stark and would do anything for that to happen. He was tired of living in the shadow of that pompous windbag. Now that he has a chance to step out of that shadow, Hammer would do anything to cling to it. Ah. A scream is heard as a guard comes flying into the hangar and crashes into the diner table a few feet away from Hammer. As the guard's body broke through the table and hit the floor, he groggily aimed his gun outside the hangar and began to fire indiscriminately. Bang 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 bang, did I get him? He asks as he ran out of ammo. Seconds later, and a second guard came soaring into the hangar and collided with the downed guard, knocking each other unconscious. You know what? Hammer says as he starts to have second thoughts. Everyone in the jet, let's go. Hammer may want nothing more than to get one over on Tony Stark, but he is also a very self-centered man. Seeing what became of his guards outside made him wonder what Spider-Man would do to him when he arrived. Sadly, it was too late. Hammer stalled for too long. He should have taken off in his jet when the guard said it was ready. As the group of guards surrounded Hammer and rushed to the plane, a web hit the fold-out stairs leading into the plane and yanked it closed, sealing the plane's entrance shut. Darn it. Get this open. Now. Hammer orders frantically but none of his guards would be able to get the door open with Peter's web sealing it shut. What's the rush? Stay and chat with me. A voice says from behind, causing Hammer and his guards to turn around. Seated in the center of the hangar, where Hammer and Vanko were supposed to eat dinner, Peter sat with one leg crossed over the other. Beside him were a few unconscious guards, while countless other guards were sprawled out on the floor outside the hangar as well. Out of reflex, the guards surrounding Hammer raised their guns and aimed them in Peter's direction. None of that, please. Peter says as he gestures outside the hangar. It didn't work for them, so do you really think it will work for you? Peter could see the wavering looks appear on the guards' faces as one by one they lowered their weapons. They knew that their only hope out of this was escaping but now that wasn't possible. Fighting Spider-Man is like fighting the ocean, sooner or later they would only end up drowning. Good, now bring Justin Hammer to me. Peter orders as he reaches over and grabs the chair that Vanko was sitting on earlier and places it in front of him, patting the seat welcomingly. What? No. 
Hammer yells as his guards look at each other for a moment before dragging him toward the seat. Stop! You work for me, you idiots! Dragging him by the arms, the remaining guards place a thrashing Justin Hammer into the seat. Restrain him! Peter ordered and they chain him up in the same restraints that Vanko wore only moments ago. Once Hammer was restrained to the chair, the guard stepped to the side and waited for further orders, not daring to do anything that could anger the superpowered individual. It's good to see you again, Justin. Peter says in the same fake friendly manner that Hammer used on him at the Grand Prix. No reply? Okay, where is Ivan Vanko? Vanko? You mean that maniac from the race? Hammer asks, hoping to weasel his way out of this. There must be some sort of mix-up. I don't have that guy here. I thought he was in jail. Just as Hammer was spewing lies to cover his butt, the sound of high heels click-clacking on the hangar floor could be heard. Looking over Hammer's shoulder, Peter could see a familiar secretary strutting her way over while dragging a knocked-out Ivan Vanko behind her by the back of his shirt. Turning his head, Hammer saw this as well and couldn't help but curse his secretary internally. Why did you have to bring him back? You stupid bitch. Hammer thought. Only moments ago he was ready to give up everything to get Vanko back, but now the man's presence only brought him pain. Good work, Mystique. Peter says as the secretary's whole form shifts and changed into her original blue appearance, shocking everyone in the room. Especially Justin Hammer, who just found out that his most trusted secretary was some sort of alien spy. Mission complete. She says as she drops Vanko at Peter's feet and hands over a flash drive as well. What's this? Peter asks as he takes the drive. All the evidence you'll need. Raven reveals as she turns her back and walks out of the hangar. I'm going home. Sure, I will need a mission report by the end of the week though. Peter calls out as she gets further away. I know. She says with a wave over her shoulder and turns the corner, disappearing outside of the hangar. Turning back to Justin Hammer, who was caught red-handed in his lies, Peter gestures toward Vanko. You were saying? Hammer Industries owner and CEO, Justin Hammer, was arrested today. The police have made a statement, saying that Justin facilitated a prison break for the maniac who attacked the recent Grand Prix in Monaco. The escaped prisoner, Ivan Vanko, and Mr. Hammer were detained and brought in by none other than New York's favorite hero, Spider-Man. Watching the TV with a smirk on his face, Tony still couldn't believe that this was happening. When Peter left and promised a surprise present on his way out, Tony didn't think he would deliver such an amazing and thoughtful gift. Justin Hammer has always been a sort of fly that kept buzzing around Tony's head. A constant annoyance that refused to just leave him alone. When Peter came back to the tower with both Vanko and Hammer unconscious and dragging behind him by the back of their shirts, Tony didn't know what to think. He especially didn't think that Justin Hammer would have the balls to execute a prison break and work with a criminal. All just to finally beat him. Well, good riddance. Tony muttered as he toasted his glass of whiskey toward the TV, which showed the mugshots of both Vanko and Hammer. After dealing with both Vanko and Hammer, Peter went through the evidence before handing Hammer off to the proper authorities. Vanko, on the other hand, will be kept in the tower's detainment floor. Peter could have let the rest of the Iron Man 2 movie events play out, but he didn't see a valid reason for it. Yeah, he could have used it as more training for the Avengers, as both Wolverine and Sabretooth failed spectacularly in Monaco, but he can just cater a new training program based on teamwork for all Avengers to go through. There's no reason to risk anyone's safety for the purpose of training. Monaco was doable because Vanko was so weak at that point. Allowing him to upgrade and expand wouldn't be smart. Vanko would stay in the tower's detainment floor indefinitely, as Peter and Tony didn't want his knowledge to be used against them. Who knows how many other people would kill to have that knowledge. After all, every country and weapons manufacturer around the world was currently striving and failing to make a fraction of what Vanko and Tony could easily create. Leaving Vanko in a random prison somewhere is simply asking for trouble. Of course, Peter sent his hand subordinates to retrieve all of Vanko's blueprints and data. From his home in Russia to any location he stayed or visited along the way to Monaco, Peter made sure everything was searched and confiscated. He can't have someone finding blueprints for all of Vanko's equipment and using them for nefarious purposes, or selling them to someone that would then use them for nefarious purposes. Meanwhile, in the large decorative throne room of Asgard, the ceremony to name the new king, Thor Odinson, was underway. Seated on a majestic throne in the back of the room, Thor's father, Odin Borson sat in his golden armor with his trusted spear, Gungnir in hand. Insert picture of Odin Borson here, standing at the bottom of the steps leading to the throne, Loki Odinson, Odin's second son, stood among other high-standing members of the Asgardian kingdom. Insert picture of Loki Odinson here, where is he? A high-status Asgardian whispers to Loki. 
He said he'd be along soon. Loki answers without a care, happy that his smooth-brained brother was late for his own crowning. Sif, the only female member of the prestigious Warriors, 3, realizes the truth and shakes her head in disapproval. He wants to make an entrance. She mutters loud enough for those near her to hear. Well, if he doesn't show up soon, then he shouldn't bother. Odin looks like he's ready to feed him to his ravens. Someone says. I wouldn't worry. Father will forgive him. He always does. Loki says, sneering inwardly. Just then, at the front of the hall, two giant decorative doors banged open and a hammer crackling with lightning soars into the room. Seconds later, Thor Odinson strides cockily into the hall, dressed similarly to his father, with a proud smirk on his face. Holding out his hand as he walks in, Thor calls the hammer back and catches it with ease. Insert picture of Thor Odinson here, the waiting crowd erupts in cheers. Thor spins his hammer with a flourish, and holds it up before the crowd, basking at the moment, relishing in the adoration, whipping his audience up into a frenzy. Oh, please! Sif says with a disapproving shake of her head. Odin watches from his throne, not liking his son's showy display. Vault below the throne room, as the sound of cheers echo from above, an odd, cold breeze picks up in the vault of Asgard. The station guards rub their limbs to warm themselves, growing increasingly uneasy as they sense that something wasn't right. They exchange a look, then walk the length of the vault's hallway to its end, where a blue casket sits undisturbed upon a pedestal. Large shadows suddenly loom over the guards. They look up and shout in terror as they raise their weapons. Throne Room As Thor finished stirring up the crowd and reaches the throne at the back of the room, he drops to one knee and kneels before his father. Frigga, Thor's mother, casts him an admonishing glance, not happy with his flashy entrance. Thor winks at her, and she can't help but crack a smile in her son's direction. It was hard to stay mad at her children. Insert picture of Frigga here, bitch. Boom. Bitch. Odin strikes Gungnir upon the ground with a deafening boom, causing the crowd to fall silent instantly. Gungnir. Its aim is true, its power strong. With it, I have defended Asgard and the lives of the innocent across the Nine Realms since the time of the Great Beginning. Though the day has come for a new king to wield his own weapon. That duty remains the same. Thor Odinson, my heir, my firstborn. Odin speaks with quiet, effortless authority as he raises Gungnir for all to see. Placing Gungnir to the side, Odin holds out his hand and summons Thor's hammer to himself, catching it just as easily as his son did only moments ago. Mjolnir. Forged in the heart of a dying star from the sacred URU metal. Only one may lift it. Only one is worthy. Whoever wields this hammer commands all lightning and storms. Its power has no equal. Either as a weapon, to destroy, or as a tool, to build. It is a fit companion for a king. Odin says as he tosses the hammer back to Thor. Vault. The bodies of the Asgardian guards, which were now strewn with ice, are flung to the vault's floor. One of the large blue-skinned attackers lifts the blue casket off its stand and turns to leave, similar blue-skinned creatures following closely behind. As they leave, the wall behind where the casket once sat starts to separate and retract, revealing something standing in the shadows behind it. As the creatures walk away, a fiery glow rises behind them. They turn back around in surprise, but it was already too late. A fiery beam of light shoots in their direction, slicing the blue thieves into pieces. Throne room, today I entrust you with the greatest honor in all the nine realms. The sacred throne of Asgard. I have sacrificed much to achieve peace. So, too, must a new generation sacrifice to maintain that peace. Responsibility, duty, honor. These are not merely virtues to which we must aspire. They are essential to every soldier and to every king. Odin speaks down toward Thor as a cold chill begins to fill the room. The crowd starts to shiver and rub their limbs for warmth in the increasingly cold air of the hall. Thor Odinson, do you swear to guard the Nine Realms? Odin looks upon his son with pride. I swear. Thor answers as his confident smirk grows by the second. Do you swear to preserve the peace? Odin continues. I swear. Thor answers once again. Do you swear to cast aside all selfish ambition and pledge yourself only to the good of all the realms? Odin asks. I swear. Thor says confidently. Then on this day, I, Odin Allfather, proclaim you king of Asgard and the Nine Realms. Odin finishes as he slams Gungnir on the floor once again. Boom, the hall goes silent as the crowd witnesses the birth of a new king, but soon everyone begins to notice a strange change in the room. Ice creeps across the surface of the large banners around the hall, making an eerie cracking sound. Thor, the warriors three, and the crowd see it as well. Some in the crowd gasp in shock as the steam from their breath fills the air, visible for all to see. Frost Giants. Odin mutters as his eyes go wide in shock. The far-off sounds of a battle echo in the depths of the palace below. 
Sif and the warriors three reach for their weapons, as Thor forgets everything and races from the hall, ready for a good battle. Thor enters the vault below the throne room with his hammer in hand and stares shocked at the sight before him. The warriors three and Loki hurry in behind Thor and stop short. Shattered and melting ice is strewn about the floor. The smoldering and twisted remains of the tall blue-skinned humanoid thieves lay sprawled out all over the floor. The blue-skinned thieves just lost a savage battle, without a single survivor among them. Amidst this horrific scene, shrouded in the shadows, stands a black metal creature, a fiery glow coming from within it. Insert picture of the destroyer here, the destroyer is an enchanted Asgardian automaton used primarily to guard Odin's vault, though it could also be used as a weapon against its master's enemies. The destroyer unquestionably obeys the ruler of Asgard and wielder of Gungnir. It holds the blue casket, which the thieves tried to steal, safely in hand. Awaiting its master orders. The destroyer. Sif mutters in fright as she lays eyes on the shadowy figure. The tesseract? Loki mutters with an interesting look in his eyes. I thought it was just a legend. Of course, he was mistaken, as the tesseract is on earth, but the two are oddly similar in appearance. The Jotuns must pay for what they've done. Thor exclaims as he sees the dead bodies of the Asgardian vault guards. They have paid with their lives. The destroyer did its job, and the casket is safe. All is well. Odin placates as he walks over, frowning sadly at the dead Asgardian soldiers. All is well. They broke into the weapons vault. If the frost giants had stolen even one of these relics. Thor was pissed. But they didn't. Odin interrupts Thor. I want to know why they did this. Thor asks without taking his eyes off of the Asgardian bodies. The casket of ancient winters belonged to the Jotuns. They believe it's their birthright. Odin explains. And if you hadn't taken it from them, they would have laid waste to all the Nine Realms. Thor counters angrily. We have a truce with Laufey, the Jotun king. Odin explains. He just broke your truce. We must act. Thor says, pointing to the bodies in the room. Odin turns to Loki and the warriors three. Leave us, please. Odin says, and they follow his command, leaving the vault. Loki couldn't keep his eyes off of the casket until he turned the corner and followed the warriors three away from the area. What action would you take? Odin turns back to Thor and asks. March our army into Jotunheim as you once did, teach them a lesson, break their spirits so they'll never dare try to cross our borders again. Thor says with a proud look. Thor, you are a king now. Odin says as he walks over and places his hand on his son's shoulder. I know that this seems like an act of war to you, but it's not worth starting another war. Learn from me and my mistakes, my son. War brings nothing but pain and death to both sides. If you march soldiers into Jotunheim, many of those soldiers will die. Fathers, sons, mothers, and daughters will leave their homes and never return to their families ever again. Do you want that? Hearing his father's words, Thor's hands grip tightly into fists as his fingernails break the skin of his palms, drawing blood that slowly drips to the floor. How many Asgardians have to die to satiate your pride, Thor? Let's not even mention the fact that the Jotuns are our people as well. You seem to forget that Jotunheim is a part of the Nine Realms, of which you are the sworn protector and king. Thor didn't notice, as he was far too enraged to see it, but Odin was speaking from experience. He let his pride dictate all of his actions and was once what many would call a warmonger. Millions have died at the tip of Gungnir's spear. They got this far? What am I supposed to do? Thor grits his teeth, unsure of how to act as a king in this situation. We will find the breach in our defenses. It will be found, and it will be sealed. Odin says as he pats his son on the shoulder and walks off. That's it? Thor asks with a scoff. Yes, decisions made in anger and without thought are detrimental to any ruler. Go and calm yourself. Once you're calm, we can come up with a less violent way to handle this situation. Odin says as he turns the corner, leaving Thor standing alone among the dead bodies. Odin left the area thinking he got through to his son and helped steer him in the right direction, but he was only half right. If I can't send the army, I'll just go myself. Laufey will answer for this. Thor thought as he left the vault, grasping his hammer tightly in hand. Thor took his father's words about war and the death of his people seriously, but that doesn't mean he doesn't want retribution. Thor is the type to always jump headfirst into his problems, so that's what he would do. The only Asgardian life he would risk will be his own. Arriving at the Rainbow Bridge alone with his hammer in hand, Thor walks across the bridge toward the Bifrost. The Bifrost is a dome-shaped building at the end of the Rainbow Bridge. It's used to teleport anyone to and from Asgard. Arriving at the end of the bridge and entering the dome, Thor was surprised to find his brother Loki and the warriors three waiting. All of them dressed for combat. Standing off the side, Heimdall stood unmoving in his golden armor, grasping his sword tightly. 
Insert picture of Heimdall here, Heimdall is an all-seeing and all-hearing Asgardian who is the gatekeeper of Asgard and the guardian of its Bifrost. His sword is the key to activating the teleportation of the dome. Ignoring Heimdall for the moment, Thor addressed his friends and brother. Why are you here? He asks with a raised brow, ready to fight should they try to stop him. We know you, brother. Loki says as he sneers. Father said not to retaliate against the Jotuns, but you won't listen. So, here we are, my king. Sif says as she and the other warriors three drop to one knee. We will always guard your back, my king. The three proclaim all at once. Yeah. Loki says, refusing to kneel with them. What they said? Do you plan to travel somewhere, my king? Heimdall asks from the side. Yes. Exactly one week since Justin Hammer was handed over to the police with a mountain of evidence against him, Peter had started to relax again and get back into his schedule. During this time, Peter, Clint, and Natasha came together to formulate a training program for teamwork. Based on the fight in Monaco, Peter was sure that this type of training was sorely needed. The only reason Wolverine and Sabretooth won the fight against Vanko was Storm, who technically didn't do much either. Striking lightning on a grounded target while out of range wasn't a very impressive thing for her to do, after all. The training program would be put in place in one week, as they're waiting for specially made equipment that Tony would build for them. Speaking of Tony, his and Peter's work to recreate the Super Soldier Serum made huge strides in the last week. Thanks to the addition of Bedassium, the current unstable version of the serum became 50% more stable. The current method to do so was radiating the serum with bodassium. Simply dipping a piece of bodassium into the serum and leaving it there for 24 hours did wonders. Now they just need to find a way to concentrate the radiation of bodassium into the serum, and they could have a completely stable super soldier serum. Things were looking good for the Avengers SSS project. As Peter was looking for cars online with MJ and Ned in his bedroom, his phone buzzed and chimed. What about this one? MJ asks as she points to an old Mustang on the website they were using. No, he should get a Ferrari. Ned was adamant about Peter getting a supercar. No, nobody needs a car like that, Ned. MJ says as they start arguing over which cars are better. Picking up his phone, Peter sees a text from someone that rarely messages him. Bald Cyclops, meet me at the tower. Need your help with something. You're going to ditch us, aren't you? Ned asks. Of course, he is. He got the text and made that face. MJ says as she points at Peter's face. When did they stop arguing? Peter thought as he looked up and saw them staring at him with their arms crossed. What? It's not like I do this all the time. Right? Ned says unbelievably as MJ rolls her eyes. Do you plan to travel somewhere, my king? Heimdall asks Thor, ready to open the Bifrost for the new king. Yes, Jotunheim. Thor answers, receiving a raised brow from Heimdall. And I forbade you to tell anyone about our departure. You are king and I will follow your orders, but be warned. I will honor my sworn oath to protect this realm as its gatekeeper. If your return threatens the safety of Asgard, the Bifrost will remain closed to you. You'll be left to die in the cold wastes of Jotunheim. King or not? Heimdall says resolutely. I have no plan to die today. Thor replies in confidence. None do. Heimdall replies as he inserts his golden sword into the control panel, and the Bifrost fires up. After hours of trekking through the frozen hellscape of Jotunheim, Thor and his party made it to Laufey, the king of all Jotuns. Thor demanded answers while all Jotuns, including Laufey, merely laughed and jeered at their every word. Asgard may see the nine realms as theirs, but most of these realms were abandoned after the war it took to win them. When your new self-proclaimed king leaves and never comes back after decimating your home, it's hard to really see them as your king. This is especially true for Jotunheim, where Odin's war brought nothing but destruction to the realm. After being made fun of by the Jotuns, Loki managed to convince Thor to retreat back to Asgard, but that was ruined by one simple comment from the crowd of Jotuns surrounding Laufey. Run back home, little princess. How could the hot-headed Thor allow these words to go unpunished? Especially since he was a king now. Not a prince or even a princess for that matter. This started a huge battle, which was certainly unwinnable. Thor and his compatriots may be strong, almost godlike in power, but this was a fight against an old rival of Odin, Laufey, and every Jotun in the area. The Asgardians started off strong but they soon found themselves losing to the numbers advantage and Laufey hadn't even joined the fight. Simply choosing to sit back and watch with an amused smile on his blue face. As the thought of their own deaths appeared in the minds of the Asgardian invaders, the bright light of the Bifrost shot down from the sky. As the light dimmed, Odin Allfather appeared in his war armor with Gungnir grasped tightly in hand. He rode an eight-legged horse, which was also in its own set of golden armor. 
Odin may be old, but his imposing figure caused all Jotuns to back away and cower behind Lao Fei, who glared in Odin's direction. Lao Fei, end this. Odin says resolutely. We aren't the ones that started it. Lao Fei replies, which causes Thor and the rest to duck their heads in shame. The new king of Asgard comes to Jotunheim seeking war, should we not give it to him? The Jotuns at Lofi's back gained some confidence from the words of their king as they jeered and prepared to fight. I understand, but these are the actions of an overzealous boy. Treat them as such. We can stop this before it spirals out of control. Odin replies diplomatically. Sadly, Laufey wasn't going to listen. After all, Thor gave him exactly what he wanted. A reason to go to war with Asgard and Odin, his most hated enemy. We are beyond diplomacy. After dropping those fighting words, Laufey and his people stormed forward, but their advance didn't last long. Not wanting to cause more bloodshed, Odin slams his spear to the ground, creating a shockwave that knocks the Jotuns back. Raising his spear, he signals Heimdall and the Bifrost shoots down once again, taking every Asgardian out of Jotunheim. Laufey and his men, who stood in the cold wastes that they called home, looked down at the imprint left by the Bifrost with sneers on their blue faces. As they all return safely to the Bifrost at the end of the Rainbow Bridge, a huge argument begins between an angry father and son. Thor wanted to stay and fight, while Odin was fuming at his son's actions and the fact that he didn't seem to understand what he had done wrong. You're a vain, greedy, cruel boy. Odin says as the argument rises to its peak. And you are an old man and a fool. Thor replies in kind, though he would later wish he had kept his mouth shut. The whole world seemed to stop at Thor's words. Odin falls quiet as if he realized something. When he spoke again, there was something terrifying beneath the calmness of his words. A fool, yes. I was a fool to think you were ready. Odin states as he looks at his son in disappointment. Thor Odinson. You have ignored the sound advice of your father. Through your arrogance and stupidity, you have opened these peaceful realms and innocent lives to the horrors of war once again. The Allfather says as he plunges Gungnir into the Bifrost's control panel. The Bifrost energy begins building as it activates. With Odin's rage, it fires, and the Bifrost opens at the end of the platform, creating a portal behind Thor. Odin turns to his son as he stalks over like an angry lion. You are unworthy of this realm. Odin says as he rips away the insignias on Thor's armor, which showed that he is, in fact, king of Asgard. Unworthy of your title. Unworthy of the loved ones you have betrayed and disappointed. Why you can't do that? Thor replies with a horrified look on his face, which soon morphs into anger. I am king. Yes, and I am the All-Father. Odin says, as he ignores his son's pleas and continues on. I hereby strip you of your powers. Extending his hand toward his son, Mjolnir goes flying from Thor's grip and into Odin's waiting hand. In the name of my father and of his father before him. Odin uses what was once Thor's lightning to strike his son and completely strip him of his Asgardian armor. I cast you out. As he proclaims this, Odin thrusts Mjolnir forward and with a crack of thunder, Thor is hurled back into the open Bifrost and disappears into the vortex. Odin holds Mjolnir in his hand, staring at it bitterly. He closes his eyes, lost in contemplation as he brings it to his lips. Whoever holds this hammer, if they be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. He whispers, and runes appear on the side of the hammer, as if carved into its smooth surface. Suddenly, Odin turns and hurls the hammer into the Bifrost. As he walks over to take his spear back, deactivating the Bifrost, Odin collapses to the floor and falls unconscious from the overuse of his powers. So you're saying this hammer fell from the sky and nothing can lift it? Peter asked as he looked through the file that Fury gave him. I didn't think Thor would come so soon. The pictures in the folder showed the huge crater in New Mexico with a pristine Mjolnir sitting in the center with its handle pointing to the sky. Yes, we don't know for sure if it fell from the sky or not, but that's what it looks like. There's nothing under the hammer holding it in place, either. Fury explains what they know at this point. We tested the metal as well, but couldn't find a match for anything on the planet. There also seems to be some sort of runic writing on the hammer's surface. It looks like ancient Norse. Peter replies as he observes an up-close picture of the hammer. Can you read it? Fury asks. Yeah. Peter confirms as the long hours in the library of Kamar Taj weren't spent in vain. Well, what does it say? Fury asks curiously. It says things are just about to get interesting. Peter says, getting an annoyed grunt from Fury. Let's go to New Mexico. I want to see the Mjolnir. Mjolnir? Two days ago, do you think he's dead? A woman asks as a group of three crowds around the downed form of Thor Odinson. I think it was legally your fault. The three were driving in the desert at night, as they were following the storm, 
trying to understand the odd readings they were picking up from the activation of the Bifrost. Though they didn't know that was the cause. During that drive, a man appeared out of nowhere and was swiftly hit by their car. Darcy, shut up and get the first aid kit from the glove box. Another woman, who seemed to be in charge, says in exasperation. Jane, we need to get him to a hospital. A man says as he looks down worriedly at Thor. Hammer. Thor mutters as his eyes groggily open. Yes, we know you're hammered. Darcy jokes as she returns with a first aid kit in hand. Climbing to his feet, Thor stares up at the sky and starts yelling. Father. Heimdall. I know you can hear me. Open the Bifrost. Thor calls, but receives nothing in return. As the two scientists and assistant try to calm the obviously drunk and brain-damaged man, Thor gets a bit heated, which makes Darcy pull a taser from her purse. You dare to threaten Thor, King of Asgard, with such a puny. Thor says as he looms over Darcy, causing her to act in order to defend herself. Tzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Anger and frustration overtake him, as he strains with all his might, screaming from the effort, glaring up at the storm and lightning above him. Suddenly, something begins to glow on the side of Mjolnir. Thor looks down and takes notice, reading the runes his father left behind. I'm not worthy? Thor thought in despair. Thor falls to his knees as the rain pours down around him, soaking his clothes completely through. He still isn't worthy. Peter thought as he walked down into the crater and stood on the opposite side of Mjolnir. As Thor picks up his head to see the blue and red spider-themed man, Peter bends once again and grasps the handle of the hammer. Instantly, a bolt of blue lightning comes crashing down from the clouded sky and strikes exactly where Peter held Mjolnir at the handle. Before Thor's shocked eyes, this unknown man took hold of his prized weapon and lifted it with relative ease. I guess I'm worthy? Peter spoke his thoughts as blue lightning danced around his body. It can't be. Thor mutters in complete and utter defeat. Walking away from Thor, who was stunned into an unmoving stupor, Peter spins the hammer in one hand as he turns to fury. Your men can detain him now. I'll come to speak with him soon. Peter says as he walks off to play with his new toy. Ground units, move in. Show's over. Fury calls out over the radio, shocked at the scene he just witnessed. As the agents surround him, Thor doesn't seem to notice or care. He just sits there on his knees, eyes trained on the back of the strange man that just stole his most prized possession, with a lost and broken look. While the shield grunts cart off the unresponsive intruder to his cell, Peter portaled to a more secluded portion of the desert and started testing out what he could do with the hammer. Immediately, thunderclouds roll in as lightning and thunder fill the open desert air. I might be able to terraform the desert with this thing. Peter thought as the rain started to fall. Kicking it into overdrive, Peter wound his hand back and hurled Mjolnir forward, causing it to shoot across the desert and strike a sandy hill. The hill exploded from the impact as some of the sand was converted into glass from the lightning that surrounded the hammer. Holding out his hand, Peter called Mjolnir back with an excited smile plastered all over his face. He always wanted to do this. Instantly, the hammer shoots out of the sands and back toward Peter, landing safely back in his hand. This is so cool. Peter muttered as he stared at the hammer in awe. Continuing his tests, Peter found that he possessed every power that Thor once had. Just as the enchantment, Odin left said. The hammer could generate electricity, manipulate storms, change its weight, and grant Peter flight if he threw it and hung on for the ride. As for Thor's Asgardian powers like super strength, durability, speed, agility, stamina, reflexes, healing, and longevity, Peter wasn't sure how to test that as he already has those powers. Maybe not longevity, though? I'll have to test it later and see if my powers have increased. Peter thought as he spun the hammer and flew back in the direction of the crater. Thor sits in a chair, staring forward blankly, hands cuffed behind him, unable to break them even if he tried. Agent Coulson stands across from him with a notepad in hand. It's not easy to do what you did. You made us all look like a bunch of mall cops. That's hurtful. Coulson says, but receives no response from the broken Asgardian. The men you so easily subdued are highly trained professionals, and in my experience, it takes someone who's received similar training to do what you did to them. Would you like to tell me where you received your training? Coulson continues asking question after question, but soon gives up as Thor doesn't respond to a single one. As he got up to leave the room, Thor finally spoke. Who was the man that took my hammer? Just as the thunderstorm cleared over the impromptu shield base around the crater, a figure covered in blue lightning came flying across the desert, bringing yet another storm with it. This immediately alerted the shield agents that were guarding the perimeter. An alarm was sounded as the lightning-clad figure impacted the center of the crater with a loud boom, deepening the already large hole in the desert floor. As the armed agents circled the crater, ready to fight the second intruder of the night, they found a lightning-clad Spider-Man with a very familiar hammer in hand. Yo! Peter says with a wave as he walks out of the crater and towards the main building, where he could sense Fury and Thor were located. Seeing that it was Spider-Man, who arrived earlier with Director Fury, the guards eased up and lowered their weapons. Even if Spider-Man was an intruder, none of them believed they could do anything to stop him. I'm back. Peter calls out as he enters the building and sees Fury waiting there for his arrival. Done playing with your new toy? Fury asks as he eyes the hammer in Peter's hand. Yeah, when the hammer said, shall possess the power of Thor, it really meant it. I have powers like Storm now. Peter says as he spins the hammer casually between his fingers. Right, so gods are real? Fury asks, unsure of what to make of all of this. I wouldn't go that far, but it's possible. Peter replies as he turns to see a window, showing another room with Thor restrained inside. Learn anything from our guest yet? 
The window was probably a one-way mirror, as neither Thor nor Agent Coulson, who was currently questioning the banished Asgardian, seemed to react to Peter's arrival. No, he hasn't spoken a word since you left. Fury replies with an annoyed tilt to his voice. Do you think he's related to the hammer, or just some crazy that showed up to test his luck? If I had to guess? Peter says as he eyes Thor, pretending to think about it. He has to be related. The look of despair on his face when he couldn't lift it was too real. Going quiet, the two turn their attention to Coulson and Thor, watching to see if their guest would finally speak. Just as Coulson gave up and made his way to the door, planning to leave their prisoner to stew for a while, Thor finally spoke up. Who was the man that took my hammer? Thor asks, stopping Coulson in his tracks. You mean Spider-Man? Coulson asks as he backtracks to his seat. How do you not know who Spider-Man is? Have you been living under a rock? Hmm, what an odd name. Thor replies in contemplation. It's his superhero name. Coulson explains, gaining Thor's full attention. Spider-Man is Earth's most famous hero. If you don't know that, then you must not be from around here. Staring at Coulson with a conflicted look in his eyes, Thor quickly comes to a decision. I refuse to speak anymore, son of Cowl. Bring that man Spider here. I need to have a word with him. Spider-Man left. He won't be. Coulson replies, but the sound of the door opening stops him mid-sentence. I'm here, you can leave, Coulson. Peter says as he walks into the room, Mjolnir in hand, drawing a jealous and sad look from its original owner. Ah, uh, sure. Coulson says as he passes Peter and walks out of the room. As the door closes, leaving Peter and Thor alone in the room, Peter takes a seat across from Thor and places Mjolnir on the table right in front of Thor's eyes. Peter didn't mean it to be, but this simple move was truly torturous for Thor. Staring at the key to unlocking his powers and returning home, knowing that he couldn't lift it and that it now belonged to someone else, truly stung deeply. Hello, I'm Spider-Man. Peter says, as he leaned back into his chair, waiting for Thor's reply. Thor Odinson, King of Asgard. Thor replies, tearing his eyes off of his former hammer. King? Peter blurted out in surprise. Did I just hear him wrong? Yes, I was crowned four days ago. Thor says, but the arrogance that once filled him was nowhere to be seen. Peter was truly surprised. Though, this wasn't exactly a bad thing. Either this world is slightly different than the MCU of his old world, or his actions have somehow affected Asgard, which was hard to believe. Either way, Thor being king of Asgard could actually be a good thing. An Avenger with full control of a godlike advanced alien civilization seemed very advantageous to Peter. With Peter's help, Thor might be able to save Asgard from its destruction. It's such a shame what happened in Ragnarok after all. They could also possibly save Thor's father, Odin, who would die because of Loki. In the movie, Loki wanted to live like a king, so he exiled Odin and used his appearance to rule Asgard. Sadly, due to his exile, Odin's power was slowly drained away until he died. He needed to stay in Asgard to keep himself alive, but Loki didn't know that. With Thor as king, Loki would have no reason to banish his father, hopefully. Either way, Peter would keep an eye out for Odin's safety. Obviously, he hasn't met the old man in this world, but Peter always liked Odin's character in the movies. Congratulations. Peter says genuinely, soliciting a self-deprecating chuckle from Thor. Yeah, the great Thor Odinson, king of Asgard. Banished to Midgard as a powerless mortal. Thor says as he slumps in his chair and looks up at the ceiling. To top it all off, a human from Midgard, the weakest of the Nine Realms, now possesses the powers that were stripped from me. Sounds like you've had a tough week. Peter says, surprised with how much Thor was sharing. He expected the Asgardian to keep his lips sealed for a bit longer, as he did in the movie. Though maybe he trusts Peter a bit, as Mjolnir and his father's enchantment see him as a worthy wielder of his powers. This whole week has been a mix of the best and worst days of my life. Thor admits as he sits up and looks straight at Peter. Why are you worthy and I'm not? You would have to give me more information for me to know that answer. I've only just met you and found this hammer today. Peter says as he motions toward Mjolnir. Why were you banished from Asgard? It's hard to believe that a king could be kicked out of his own kingdom after all. You must have done something pretty shitty. Thor stares Peter straight in the eyes. What would you do if a foreign nation infiltrated your palace, killed your guards, and tried to steal something that could destroy your world and many others? Thor wanted to know what made Peter different from him. What made him worthy of Mjolnir and his powers? It depends on the circumstances. Peter says as he thinks for a moment. Seeing as you said the word, tried, that means they didn't get away with this world-ending device, right? Yes. Thor nods. Then I would speak to those close to me with more experience for advice and come up with a plan together to deal with the threat. 
whether that would be military action, trade embargoes, diplomacy, assassinations, etc. Though ultimately, the security around this hypothetical device would need to be increased by a large margin. Peter explains his thoughts. Thor goes silent as he reflects on his own actions, his father's voice ringing out in his mind. Decisions made in anger and without thought are detrimental to any ruler. Go and calm yourself. Once you're calm, we can come up with a less violent way to handle the situation. He wanted to help me and I spit in his face. Thor mutters quietly with a far-off look as realization began to dawn on him. Instead of trying to see things from his perspective, I let my anger and arrogance cloud my judgment. As Thor finished speaking Mjolnir pulsed slightly on the table before going still once again. Thor didn't notice as he was too preoccupied in his own thoughts, but Peter sure did. Is it reacting to him? Peter thought curiously. I don't know what that means, but that sounds like a good reason why you wouldn't be worthy. I see. Thor says as he slumps back into his chair. Can you leave me alone? I need to think. Sure. Peter says as he stands and picks up Mjolnir from the table with ease. It was nice meeting you, Thor. Without waiting for Thor to reply, Peter stepped out of the room to allow Thor some time alone, closing the door behind him. I thought he'd never leave. A very familiar voice says, causing Thor to jump and find a transparent figure standing before him. Loki, shutting the door behind him and making his way back to the one-way mirror, where Fury and Coulson were waiting, Peter could feel the sudden appearance of some sort of mystic energy in the interrogation room with Thor. Is it Loki? Peter thought as he remembered the events of the movie. He was especially chatty with you. Fury comments as Peter arrived, peeking into the window at the first chance he gets. Well, I did take his powers. I'm sure he was both distraught and curious about me. Peter says as he watches Thor speak to the blank air in front of him. So, we're believing this story about a banished god king? Coulson asks as it was hard for him to believe, gesturing toward Thor, who was still talking to himself in the room. Because that looks like a crazy man to me. What's happened? Tell me. Is it Jotunheim? Let me explain to father. Thor pleads like a madman to thin air. Ignoring Coulson's words, Peter tries to move some eldritch energy to his eyes, which is a trick that the Ancient One told him about. Turning his head away from Fury and Coulson so they couldn't see, Peter's eye glowed in a faint golden light. Instantly, Peter could see a mass of energy in the interrogation room, standing in front of Thor. Loki was far more skilled in the art of magic than himself, so this is the best Peter would be able to get without actually using a spell, and he would rather not alert the godlike trickster by doing so. Especially since Fury and Coulson would see him using magic as well. After confirming that it was Loki, sending down an illusion to speak to his brother, Peter put some eldritch energy in his ears this time, making it possible to hear the other half of the conversation going on inside the room right now. Your banishment and the threat of a new war was too much for father to bear. He died shortly after you were banished. Loki lies like a master. A horrified look appears on Thor's face. It reminded Peter of the face he showed when he saw Mjolnir pick a new wielder before his very eyes. Only magnified by ten times. Thor thinks he is responsible for his father's death after all. He's truly having the worst week of his life. Peter thought in pity. You mustn't blame yourself. Loki says in fake pity, smirking inwardly at his brother's pain. I know that you loved him. I tried to tell him so, but he wouldn't listen. Though it was cruel to put the hammer within your reach, knowing that you could never lift it, and especially cruel of him to allow some weak human to steal your powers. Thor stares ahead, falling deeper into the abyss of despair. Loki was loving all of this. He's always had an inferiority complex when it comes to Thor, so this is all some twisted form of vindictive revenge or payback to him. Peter didn't understand why he would do this though, as Loki seemed to be treated well by his family in the movies. Especially Frigga who seemed to love him just as much as Thor. Maybe they treated him differently in this world? Peter thought curiously. Or perhaps Thor was a bad brother in his younger years? Although Loki was enjoying the situation, he was definitely worried about Peter, who somehow now possessed the powers of his brother. Though it did make it harder for Thor to return to Asgard, which was great for him. The burden of the throne has fallen to me now. Loki says, causing his brother to look at him with hope-filled eyes. Can I come home? Thor asks as he just wanted to go and see his mother and apologize for what he's done. The truce I brokered with Jotunheim is conditional upon your exile. Loki continues spinning his lies. Couldn't we find a way to? Thor says, but Loki cuts him off. I'm afraid mother has forbidden your return, brother. Loki says, knowing his mother would never do such a thing. Reality sets in as Thor lowers his head like a beaten dog. He would be forever stranded in Midgard until his dying days. This is goodbye, brother. I'm so sorry. 
Loki says, not sorry at all. No, I'm sorry, Loki. Thank you for coming to see me. Thor says, unwilling to look his brother in the eyes any longer. With that, the two brothers said their farewells, and all signs of the human-shaped bundle of energy that Peter was watching disappeared. He seems to be done talking to himself. Coulson says as he turns to Peter and Fury. Should I call a psychologist? No, don't bother. Peter says as he walks back toward the room, leaving Fury and Coulson standing there in confusion. Hello again. Peter calls out as he enters the room once again to find an especially sullen-looking Thor. Thor doesn't even bother replying this time around. Shrugging, uncaring, Peter walks behind the restrained Asgardian and rips his metal bindings off with ease. Seeing this, Thor looks up at Peter in confusion. Come on, we're leaving. Peter says as he walks over to the door and opens it, motioning for Thor to walk through before him. Thor just sat there and stared at him with dead eyes. Oh, come on. Peter says as he shoots a web at Thor, throwing him through the open door. Ah? Thor bellows as he shoots through the door and into the waiting hallway wall outside. Bang, now up you go. Peter says he sees Thor laying on the ground, looking up at him with a look that said, to hell. If you're going to live with the rest of us mortals, then you need to get a job and a place to live. Let's go. Grabbing Thor by his shirt, Peter pulled him to his feet and guided him down the hall, where Fury and Coulson were waiting with questioning looks. I got this. Peter says as he and Thor walk right past them. I'll fill you in later, Fury. Fine. Fury sighed as he let them go without a single complaint. After borrowing a car from the shield base, as he didn't want to reveal his portal ability to Thor just yet, Peter drove Thor back into the nearest town. As they drove through the empty highway, Thor couldn't keep his eyes off the car's dashboard, where Peter placed Mjolnir. It was almost like the hammer was his old lover, and Thor hadn't gotten over the breakup just yet. After a while of silent driving, Peter pulled the car up to a diner, which happened to be the same one that Jane took Thor in the movie. Follow me. Peter says as he hops out of the car. Walking inside the diner with Thor following behind him, Peter noticed a help-wanted sign in the window and smirked under his mask. Instantly, a bell on the door rings, and everyone in the diner turns to see Spider-Man walk in, which especially shocked these small-town people. Hello, I'm here to help my friend apply for a job. Peter calls out to a nearby waitress. There's nothing like working a low-paying minimum wage job in the service industry to give you a wake-up call on life. Ah, uh, sure honey. The waitress replies as she eyes Peter up and down, unsure of whether he was really Spider-Man or not. Follow me. After a short interview in the back of the diner, where Peter proved who he was, Thor was hired off the books and would be paid minimum wage. They probably wouldn't have hired him if Peter wasn't helping, as the staff remembered him from earlier in the day, when he broke multiple cups and plates by purposely smashing them on the floor. Asgardian culture is different after all. He had to be hired off the books as Thor didn't have any identification papers or bank accounts. Though that's fine as he wouldn't be working there for long anyway. Alright, thank you. Peter says as he and Thor leave the diner. He'll be here bright and early tomorrow morning for his first day. Hopping back into the car, Peter drove over to a rundown motel and bought Thor a room for an entire month. After receiving the key, they made their way to the room and opened it up. Looks, nice. Peter mutters as they see the room. Yeah. Thor says as sees a cockroach crawl under the bed. Well, I'll leave you to it. Peter says as he walks off. Get to bed early. You have work in the morning. As Peter left Thor in poverty with his shitty living conditions and low-paying job, he couldn't help but feel bad for the guy. Was it necessary to give him such poor housing along with a low-paying job? No, but this would be a quicker way to rehabilitate the spoiled prince of Asgard. Thor wasn't just the prince of a place here on Earth, where you get born with a golden spoon in your mouth and live like a billionaire for your whole life. No, Asgard is one of, if not the strongest and most advanced kingdoms in the whole universe. Thor was born with a godlike power and a diamond-encrusted platinum spoon in his mouth. He needed to be taken down countless pegs in order to see things from a normal person's perspective. Living life as a coddled godly prince since birth certainly won't make a well-rounded person, which is the reason why Peter is doing all of this. After returning the car to the shield base at the crater, Peter explained to Fury and Coulson about what he did before returning home. It was pretty late by this time, so May was already fast asleep. Plopping down on the couch, Peter placed Mjolnir on the coffee table and just stared at it in silence. Peter never thought that he would be worthy of the standards that Odin set, but here he is as the new wielder of Mjolnir. This is the dream of many Marvel fans back in his original world, and he was living every second of it. After staring at the hammer for a good while, Peter came to a saddening conclusion. I'll have to give it back when Thor is ready. Peter knew it. 
There's no way that Odin would make it so his son can't take his hammer and powers back. After all, this whole ordeal is to teach Thor a well-deserved lesson. Once that lesson is learned, Peter was sure that the hammer would default back to Thor. To test his logic, Peter took the hammer in hand and opened a portal to Kamartaj. He, obviously, isn't an expert in Asgardian enchantments, so a more skilled hand was needed to analyze what Odin did to Mjolnir. Stepping out of his portal, Peter expected to appear in the same room where he met the Ancient One for the first time, but instead, he arrived in some sort of waiting room taking a closer look, Peter found that there were no windows, doors, or any other ways out of the room. Using some spells to check what was happening, Peter came to the conclusion that he was trapped in some sort of prison dimension. The whole dimension was nothing but this small waiting room. Weird, did I trigger something at Kamartage? Peter questioned as this has never happened before. Using his sling ring, Peter tried to open another portal but that seemed to be impossible. Well, shit, Peter thought as he took a seat on the couch. Shit, indeed. A familiar voice appeared in the room. Looking across from him, Peter found the Ancient One seated there with her legs crossed in all of her grand baldness. Your body and energy signature has changed. The Ancient One says as she snaps her fingers and teleports them both out of the dimension and into a room with a similar setup back in Kamartaj. Would you like to explain why? It's good to see you too, teacher. Peter says with mock annoyance. I've been good. Thanks for asking. Yes, you have been ignoring me for a while. I accept your apology. The Ancient One has been keeping her distance and acting differently towards Peter ever since he offered her a place in the Avengers. The Ancient One just stares at Peter, ignoring his tangent and waiting for a reply to her earlier question. Fine, be that way. Peter mutters as he tosses Mjolnir into his teacher's lap with a vindictive smile on his face. Assessing the hammer with a glance while it was mid-air, the Ancient One instantly knew what was happening and teleported herself to the spot next to Peter on the couch. Asterisk crunch. Boom, asterisk as she disappeared, the hammer fell and tore through her chair and smashed into the ground, breaking the flooring. That wasn't very nice. The Ancient One gives Peter an unamused look. Calling Mjolnir back, the hammer flew from the broken flooring and into Peter's waiting hand. Well, neither is ignoring your loving student. Peter says as he holds the hammer in front of her. This is Thor Odinson's hammer, Mjolnir. I've gathered that already. She says as she eyes the writing on the hammer. Why do you have it? Peter has been messing with her desired timeline all this time and she didn't like it. Though this move of his will certainly change things immensely especially if he tries to keep the hammer. The reason she has been ignoring Peter is the fact that she hasn't decided whether or not to change all of her carefully laid plans. After all, the Ancient One has spent hundreds of years preparing the perfect timeline for Earth and the surrounding universe's well-being. It landed in New Mexico a few days ago. Peter says as he places Mjolnir on the couch between them. I saw the enchantment so I tested my luck. Hmm, are you keeping it? She asks, hoping he would say no. We'll see. Peter replies with a smirk. He had an idea of what she was thinking and knew this answer would annoy her, which he would gladly do. I just want to know everything this enchantment does, so I came to my beautiful bald teacher. Peter continues. Right? The Ancient One says as she moves her hand slightly, causing the hammer to float in front of her and the enchantments to shine. As she does this, not only do the runes that Peter saw earlier brighten, but new writing appears just below as well. After a moment of silence, the Ancient One speaks. It has some fail-safes. She says as she points to the writing and begins to explain. Basically, as Peter expected, once Thor goes through his tribulation and learns his lesson, he would get priority in the use of Mjolnir and his powers would return to him as well. Sadly, Peter would lose his cool new power-up sooner or later. I thought so. Peter says as he takes the hammer back. Have you met Thor yet? She asks. Yep, I helped him get a job at a diner in New Mexico and a place to stay in a nearby motel. Peter says, causing his teacher to raise a questioning eyebrow. You have the Prince of Asgard staying in a motel in New Mexico? The Ancient One asks in disbelief. You mean King and yes. His father sent him here to learn a lesson, so I thought I would lend a helping hand. Peter says with a smile as the Ancient One's eyebrows raise slightly. You are changing a lot. She says, knowing that Peter knew of her plans and how he was ruining them. Well, I try my best. Peter says with an infuriating smile. Your only choice is to join up with me and the Avengers. You're really making it hard on me, aren't you? She says with a pronounced frown on her face. Once again, I try my best. Peter repeats. You should come to the Avengers Tower sometime and look around. You might take a liking to it. I can guarantee you a spot on the council once you join as well. I'll think about it. The Ancient One replies with her usual answer. 
No, don't think. Just do what you want. Peter says with an exasperated sigh. You keep thinking that everything needs hundreds of years of planning and thought. It doesn't. You don't need to work alone and pull the strings from the background. You can step into the front and take charge. You don't need to die. The Ancient One just sat there and looks at him in shock. She knew that Peter had some future knowledge, but she didn't know that it went so deep as to know of her death. I'm sorry that I've been keeping my distance. She mutters for just a moment before disappearing from the room, leaving Peter sitting there all alone. You can't keep running from your problems. Peter yells to the empty room, knowing she can probably still hear him wherever she went. Returning home after confronting his teacher and learning the full scale of the enchantment on Mjolnir, Peter hopped in bed and stared sadly at the hammer on his nightstand. Deep down, Peter knew that he wouldn't be able to keep Mjolnir, but it's hard not to get so attached to such a cool weapon. The power-up he received was like icing on the cake as well. As he was falling asleep, Peter thought of a good idea. If I can't keep it, then I'll use it as leverage to get something just as good. Of course, Peter wouldn't outright blackmail Thor or Asgard with the hammer, as that would ruin their relations and possibly lose a future Avenger. He would simply hand over Mjolnir with a bit of reluctance while letting Thor know that he owes him one. After all, Peter would be giving up godlike powers for him, so Thor would hopefully accept that debt, allowing Peter to cash it in soon after. There are two things that Peter would ask for. First, Peter could study the magic system of Asgard. Though that all depends on whether he can use Asgardian magic. After all, they probably use a different sort of energy than Kamartage. For all he knows, only Asgardians can use such magic. Though technically Loki isn't an Asgardian and he can use their magic. I'll have to figure that out later on. Peter thought in interest. Secondly, Peter could ask for a weapon. A weapon for a weapon is a fair trade after all. Not just any weapon either, but a weapon created by the dwarves in Nidaveller. Nidaveller is a neutron star and one of the nine realms, which is orbited by a multi-ringed megastructure that serves as the homeworld of the dwarves. The dwarves of Nidaveller are an ancient race of skilled forgers and blacksmiths who are ruled by King Eitri. They are close allies of the Asgardians, and after being asked by Odin they created the mighty weapon that's currently next to Peter's nightlight, Mjolnir. Getting a specially made weapon similar to Mjolnir would be the best case scenario, as Thor may allow Peter to learn Asgard's magic after joining the Avengers and getting closer to one another. Peeking at Mjolnir one last time before falling asleep, Peter closed his eyes and dozed off into his pillow. Whatever, I'll just enjoy my time as a god of thunder for the time being. The next morning, Peter went to school as usual, but once classes were over, he just had to show off his temporary godly powers. What's going on? Ned asks as he and MJ sat in his room, wondering what Peter was so excited about. Are we looking at cars again? You should really consider getting a supercar. Maybe not a Bugatti, but Ferraris aren't too expensive. MJ, who was sitting beside him, couldn't help but roll her eyes at Ned's childish taste in cars. In her humble opinion, supercars are for idiots that don't know what to do with their money. Especially if you buy one and never take it to a track to actually race the damn thing. No, it's something way cooler. Peter says as he holds out his hand, and Mjolnir comes flying into his grasp from under his bed. What? Ned practically jumped out of his seat. Is that like a soul weapon from Bleach? Ned has been going down the anime path recently, so he couldn't help but see the comparison. In a way. Peter answers with a slight tilt of his head. Though, it's not connected to my soul. At least, I don't think it is. Does it upgrade like Shirkai and Bankai? MJ asks, causing Ned to turn to her with a questioning look. What? I watch anime sometimes. No, but it does do this. Peter says as lightning starts to dance around the hammer, which instantly spreads and wraps around his body next. Wow. Ned mutters as MJ just watched in awe beside him. Yeah, now look outside. Peter says as he gestures toward the window. When they turned to look, what was once a beautiful, clear day had changed. Dark clouds and lightning filled the air as the sounds of rumbling thunder could be heard. Why you changed the weather? MJ asked with a dumbfounded look on her face. You can't be serious. Cool, right? After showing off to his girlfriend and best friend, Peter donned his superhero clothes and went to show off to his other best friend. Texting him beforehand, Peter told Tony to wait on the roof of Avengers Tower, which he did with reluctance as there was a thunderstorm overhead. After waiting only a few moments, Tony could see a familiar figure clad in lightning, soaring just under the storm clouds. Tony watched with a raised brow as this figure fell from the sky and performed a superhero landing right in front of him. Yo! Peter said with a wave of his hammer. What the hell was that? Tony exclaimed in shock, which was just what Peter was going for. After explaining everything, Tony was amazed and annoyed that Peter would leave him out. 
He wanted to go to New Mexico as well. Maybe he would have been able to lift the hammer before Peter? Though that was just wishful thinking on his part. Mostly, he wanted to meet Thor, the god of thunder. I wouldn't go so far as to call him a god. Peter corrects Tony before he decides to convert to a new religion. Asgardians are just a very advanced civilization of long-lived aliens with metahuman powers. Yeah, they're a bit godlike, but that doesn't make them gods exactly. After explaining everything fully, Peter promised to let Tony study Mjolnir. Of course, Peter would be involved with it, as Tony would have a hard time handling a hammer that he can't lift. Though he certainly tried. Ahaug! Tony grunted as he tried every position that he could think of to lift Mjolnir from his coffee table. He tried so hard that Peter had to put a stop to it or else Tony would end up hurting his back. After finding out that he wasn't worthy, which was devastating for his fragile ego, Tony started sulking like a child that couldn't get his toy. Oh, come on. Peter says as he plopped down next to Tony, putting an arm around his shoulder. Cheer up, not everyone can be worthy of godlike power like I am. I hate you. Tony said as turned to look Peter in his eyes, knowing that his masked friend had to be smiling right now. I love you too, buddy. New Mexico, knowing that he could use his low mood to get something out of him, Tony convinced Peter to take him to meet Thor, who just so happened to be working his new job. Ding dong opening the doors to the diner, Peter shocked the staff and customers once again, but this time it was even worse since Tony was there as well. Table for two, please. Peter says to a shocked waitress. S sit anywhere you like, S Spider-Man sir. She stutters as this was a different waitress from last night. Thanks, darling. Tony says with a wink as he walks past Peter and picks a booth by the window. Peter gives his thanks as well, following Tony to the booth and sitting across from him. So, where is he? Tony asks just in time for the door leading to the kitchen to swing open. Turning their heads, Peter and Tony saw Thor wearing an apron with two filled garbage bags in hand. The look on his face was that of a man that has been through some shit. Take that trash to the dumpster. An angry voice projected from the back of the kitchen. Hopefully, you can't screw that up too. Thor seemed to duck his head in embarrassment as he heard these words. Making his way out the front doors, he didn't notice Peter sitting at a nearby booth. In almost every task they gave him, Thor would mess it up in some way or another. Dishes were broken. Food was ruined. Customers were disrespected. As Thor made it to the dumpster across the parking lot, he went to throw both bags into the dumpster. This sudden movement caused the heavier bag to rip at the bottom and dump all of its contents onto the ground. Thor just stood there unmoving as he looked at the mess beside the dumpster with dead eyes. This has to be some form of torture. Tony remarks. Leaving their table and walking back out the door to the parking lot, Peter and Tony arrive outside just in time to see Thor punching the side of the metal dumpster, trash from his earlier accident still littered the ground at his feet. Bang 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 bang. As the sounds of metal banging filled the area, those that were passing by on the sidewalk gawked and kept their distance from the crazy blonde maniac. Bad day. Tony asks as he and Peter stood a few feet behind Thor. Thor stops hitting the dumpster, which was dented by this point, and turned to give a sidelong glare toward Tony. That glare disappeared and was replaced with a sad and longing look as Thor saw Peter standing beside him with Mjolnir hanging from his hip. Taking a closer look, Peter could see the knuckles on both of Thor's hands were bruised, cut open, and dripping blood. The pain was probably unbearable for his new mortal body, but he didn't seem to notice or care. Good to see you again, Thor. Peter says as he shoots a net-like web to the garbage that was all over the floor and tosses it into the dented dumpster, saving Thor the trouble of having to clean it all up. You as well, man spider. Thor says with a nod as he turns to Tony. Do you know this mortal? Mortal? Why does that sound like a slur? Tony felt offended by that word as he turns to Peter for answers. I told you already. Thor has a bit of a god complex. I'm guessing his whole family does as well. To him, we are all just mortal ants that live below the heavens. Peter explains as if this were a cultivation novel. In actuality, he's just from an overpowered alien race. Tony wasn't the only one that heard this, as Thor's ears perked up upon listening in. I don't know what an alien is, but we don't consider ourselves gods. Only you mortals thought of us in such ways. Thor says with a shrug. Then why call us mortals in the first place? Tony asked with a questioning look. Well, because of your mortality. My people can live for countless millennia. Thor explained matter-of-factly but you can still die, right? Peter cuts in and asks. Because that's what mortality means. Being subject to an inevitable death. Only gods can't die after all. Upon hearing this, Thor didn't know how to reply or argue and started to realize something. He did, in fact, have a god complex. I'm not a god. 
Thor thought as he looked between Tony and Peter before speaking. You're right, I shouldn't have called you that. Forgive me. As soon as Thor uttered these words, Peter felt a jolt from the hammer hanging on his hip. Just as it did in the interrogation room yesterday, Mjolnir glowed slightly but soon dimmed, reacting to Thor once again. Though nobody seemed to notice but him. Jotunheim. An apprehensive-looking Loki, king of Asgard, walks alone across the barren icy terrain, making his way toward a temple that was mostly rubble by this point. Darkness shrouds the ruined temple, except for the shafts of light that shoot their way in through the crumbling ceiling. As Loki walks inside, frost giant guards surround him on all sides with weapons ready. Laufey approaches shortly behind his guards with a bloodthirsty smirk, towering over Loki menacingly. Tell me why I shouldn't kill you where you stand? Laufey asks. I've come alone and unarmed. Loki says, as he raises his arms, showing that he means no harm. To what end? Laufey keeps up the questions. To make you another proposition. Loki says with a winning smile. So you're the one who led us into Asgard. Laufey mutters as realization dawns on him. You're welcome. Loki lowers his arms as the surrounding frost giants lower their weapons, becoming less hostile toward him by the second. This was a lie, though. Loki may be a manipulative piece of shit, but he wasn't involved with the attempt of robbery on that day. He even mistook the casket of ancient winter for the legendary Tesseract. Ever since he took charge of Asgard as king, Loki and his mother, Frigga, have been working hard to find out how the Jotuns got into Asgard during Thor's crowning ceremony. After some digging, the mother and son duo found that one of the palace's Vanir sorcerers, who happened to be skilled in the art of magic, allowed them entry in exchange for a few artifacts that the Frost Giants had on hand. Vanir were those in Asgard that are born with the innate ability to wield magic. There are two races that dominate Asgard, and the Vanir happens to be one of them. The Asir are the other half. Where the Vanir are more suitable towards magic, the Asir are natural-born warriors. A low to mid-level Asir has the capability to match Captain America in strength. Of course, this all hinges on them actually working hard and building up toward that amount of power. Let's get back on track. After finding the man that helped the Jotuns get in, Frigga and Loki used their magical abilities and a bit of torture to get all the information they needed. And while his mother was using this information to fix the holes in Asgard's defenses, Loki snuck off to speak to the Jotuns without her knowledge. My men are dead, and I have no casket. You are a deceiver. Laufey lashes out, grabbing him around the throat, but Loki calmly stands his ground. You have no idea what I am. Loki says as his skin begins to turn blue. The blueness spreads across his face, as Laufey and the guards stare in shock. Hello, father. Loki says with a grin. Loki has known about his status as an adopted child for a while now. Frigga, being the caring mother that she is, knew that Loki was a smart boy and would find out sooner or later. Knowing this, she pleaded with her husband to sit Loki down and explain things together, but Odin was a stubborn man that didn't see the need to do such a thing. In his eyes, Loki was his son. Adopted or not, it didn't matter, which is why he thought that telling him would be useless and possibly cause pointless drama. Seeing that her husband didn't understand, Frigga spent a day with a much younger Loki and explained everything, sneakily going against her husband and king's wishes. Upon seeing this, Laufey releases Loki with a look of complete and utter surprise on his face. Stepping back a few steps from his biological father's rather huge form, Loki fixes his clothes as his body turns back to normal. Intrigued, Laufey sizes up his newfound son. Ah, the bastard son. It's all coming back to me now. I thought Odin had killed you. That's what I would have done. He's as weak as you are. Laufey scowls in disgust. I'm no longer weak. I now rule Asgard until Odin awakens. Perhaps you should not have so carelessly abandoned me. Loki says with a look of contempt. Or perhaps it was the wisest choice I've ever made. Laufey says as he pauses for a moment. I will hear what you have to offer. Good, now we're getting somewhere. Loki says with an overly dramatic sigh. I will conceal you and a handful of your soldiers, lead you into my father's chambers, and let you slay him where he sleeps. The throne will be mine, and you will have the casket. Laufey studies his long-lost son's face, looking for any sort of deception but found none. Too bad, he didn't know who he was dealing with exactly. Loki could convince mathematicians that 1 plus 1 equals 3, and they'd eat it up with smiles on their faces. Why would you do this? Laufey asks with a raised eyebrow. When all is said and done, we will have a permanent peace between our two worlds. Then I, the bastard son, will have accomplished what Odin and Thor never could. Loki says with a trademark evil smirk. Silence filled the rundown temple before Laufey started to chuckle in a low rumble. This is a great day for Jotunheim. Asgard is finally ours. Laufey proclaims. No. 
Asgard is mine. Loki corrects before the Jotuns could get too far ahead of themselves. The rest of the Nine Realms will be yours, as long as you do as you're told. Laufey stops laughing as the joyous atmosphere melts away. The King of Jotunheim considers Loki's words for a moment before opening his mouth once again. I accept. After receiving their apology from Thor, Peter and Tony invited the fallen Asgardian king to eat dinner with them. He was reluctant at first, as Thor was already reprimanded multiple times for slacking off on the job, but they soon found out that Thor's first work shift at the diner had come to an end. You're done for the day, darling. A waitress, who seemed to be overlooking Thor throughout the day, said as she ran off to continue her work. As soon as Thor heard those beautiful words, his shoulders slumped down in relaxation as a small smile graced his lips. He just finished his first day of actual work. Never in his entire life has Thor even lifted a finger to clean up after someone else or wait on them hand and foot. He was the one getting waited on and needing the clean up, not the other way around. Hell, Thor hasn't even cooked his own food before. The palace in Asgard had teams of cooks that would provide him with the most luxurious of feasts, yet they had him in the kitchen cooking for mortals today. Don't use that word anymore. Thor reprimanded himself internally. Though, he did feel an odd sense of accomplishment as soon as his work ended for the day. Thor hated every one moment, but he powered through it and worked hard. Even after multiple failures, he never gave up. I worked a human job today. Thor thought as he sat down at the booth with Tony and Peter. I wonder what Loki would think. You truly mix well with those mortals, brother. Thor laughed inwardly as he imagined what his brother would say. After ordering their food, Peter was the one to break the silence at the table. So, I heard from the waitress that you came here with a group of people a few days ago. How did you meet them? Peter asks, wondering if Thor would still fall in love with Jane after all of his meddling. With that question, Thor started to explain how he got hit by a car upon exiting the Bifrost and the humans he met on that day. He didn't seem to show any lovey-dicey signs when talking about Jane, but Peter wasn't exactly an expert when it came to these things. After eating their fill and talking about minor things, Tony suggests that they go out to drink. Tony and Thor were all for it, but Peter wasn't really interested. The mask makes eating and drinking impossible for him anyway. Peter didn't even get to eat dinner with them, so drinking didn't sound very interesting either. Come on, it'll be fun. Tony pleaded as he tried his best to convince his spidery friend to join them. We have to celebrate Thor's first day on the job anyway. Yes, we must drink to a good day's work. Thor joined in, ready to drink until all of his problems fade away. Fine. Peter agreed with a heavy amount of reluctance in his voice. Sitting on stools at the bar of a local place down the street from Thor's job, Thor and Tony drank themselves stupid while Peter sat by and enjoyed the show. I had it all backward. I had it all wrong. Thor spills all of his woes as he gulps down his twelfth pint of beer. Peter watched him with interest. Due to being completely sober and alcohol-free, Peter became the babysitter of two very wasted man-children. You know, it's not a bad thing to find out that you don't have all the answers. Because that's when you start asking the right questions. Tony says as he knocks back yet another shot of tequila, somehow even more intoxicated than Thor. Thor takes in all of Tony's drunken wisdom and starts drinking another beer before speaking again. For the first time in my life, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Thor says as he looks at Peter and points to the hammer on the bar in front of him. I lost Mjolnir, I lost my powers, I can't go home, and worst of all, my father is dead and it's all my fault. Thor admits everything to Peter and Tony as he downs the rest of his pint and slams the glass back down onto the bar top. Thankfully, he didn't break the thing. I'm sorry to hear that. What was he like? Peter asks, not knowing how to explain that Odin is alive. At least he should be. Father was a patient, just, and wise king. Thor says as he stares down at the bottom of his empty glass. If only I was the tiniest sliver of the man he was, then I wouldn't be here and he wouldn't be dead. Then strive to embody those characteristics and make his memory proud. Your father may be gone but you can be a better man to the people that were left behind. Be a better son, brother, person, king. Peter says as Thor's grip on his empty glass tightens. You can't go back and fix the past but you can move forward and make a better future. Silence filled the group as Tony took another shot and slammed it down on the bar top as well. And that's why he's Spider-Man. Saving the world one drunk bastard at a time. Tony says as he pats Thor on the back a few times. It'll be alright big guy. My daddy's dead too. Okay, I think Tony's had enough. Peter says as he turns to the bartender and hands over a hundred dollar bill. Let's cut him off for the night. Hey. I can still. Whoa. Tony stands up and tries to argue but soon gets dizzy and sits back down. Hey, I know you, man. 
An intimidating yet drunk group of locals enter the bar and one of them calls out to Peter's group. You're Spider-Man. Don't be an idiot. Spider-Man would never come to this shitty town. He's just a fake. Another calls out which riles up the group of drunkards. As the group approaches, belligerent and looking for a fight, Peter could smell the heavy scent of liquor following them. He doesn't like where this was going. You think it's funny impersonating a superhero? Someone in the group calls out as they surround Peter's group at the bar. What a bunch of violent idiots. Peter couldn't help but think with an annoyed look under his mask. We have no quarrel with you. Thor turns and addresses the drunken mob. Leave us to our drinks, and we'll leave you to yours. You should shut the hell up, princess. A random drunk calls out to Thor. Run back home, little princess. The words that started his downfall in Jotunheim ring out in Thor's head upon hearing this. Thor's fists tighten as he takes a sharp breath inward. Peter looks over at Thor, concerned that he's going to lose it. Though, to his surprise, he remains unaffected by the drunken mob's baiting. I will not fight. Thor says, as he is now a changed man. Leave us be. As Thor says this, Mjolnir pulses and lights up for a third time before dimming down once again. Peter couldn't help but shake his head at this. You're really getting ready to leave me so soon, huh? Peter thought as he looked at his temporary hammer. Then it'll be easier to kick your ass. Another dumbass says as the group laughs amongst themselves. Out of nowhere, Tony stands up and steps in front of the mob of drunken fools. Ladies and gentlemen, let the bar fight begin. Tony speaks like an announcer at a boxing match as he winds his arm back and sucker punches the closest guy, knocking him out as he hits the floor. I guess I will fight? Thor mutters, as he can't just leave his new friend to fight a whole group of drunkards alone. The sounds of breaking wood and glass could be heard from the bar as Thor and Tony issue out a well-deserved beat down. Peter, on the other hand, just sat at the bar and watched the fighting. He wouldn't get involved unless they needed his help, and by the way things were looking, he wouldn't have to get up. You going to help your friends? The bartender asks Peter without much worry. He was far too used to this group of local idiots coming in and causing trouble. Nah, they got it. The bright mid-afternoon sun shone through the windows of a small living room. The whole place was trashed with pizza boxes, beer bottles, and shot glasses. Even some questionable stains could be spotted all across the carpet as well. Two men could be seen sleeping huddled together on the same couch, which also happened to have a few stains on them as well. Beer stains to be exact. If someone were to take a picture and post this image online, the world would wonder why Iron Man was sleeping in the arms of a muscle-bound blonde man. Camera flash that was about to become a reality, as a blue and red spider-themed man took the perfect photo. I'm posting this on Instagram. Peter mutters as he instantly posts it without an ounce of shame. It's what they deserve. A voice called out from the kitchen. Turning, Peter could see Jane Foster standing there in her pajamas with a cup of coffee in hand. Last night, after drinking themselves stupid and getting into a bar fight, Thor ended up dragging them to meet his current love interest, Jane Foster. And boy was she surprised when the crazy yet handsome man she met and hit with her car showed up unannounced in the middle of the night, and to make matters even more shocking, he brought Spider-Man and Tony Stark along as well. Jane wanted nothing more than to kick them out and go to bed, but how could she possibly turn two living superheroes away? So, Thor and Tony brought their two-man party to Jane's living room, while Peter and Jane supervised and tried their best to keep them under control. It didn't take Jane long to get used to Peter and Tony's presence, as she was too busy keeping her living room intact to worry about anything else. Ugh. My head. Tony muttered in pain as the light from the window hit his eyes, waking him from his drunken slumber. As soon as Tony noticed the big, strong manly arms wrapped around him, he freaked and rolled off the couch. Bang, oh, dang it. Tony yelled as his body and face smacked into the floor. Morning sunshine. Peter says in a loud and excited fashion. Ah, uh, please, for the love of God, stop talking. Tony says as he holds his aching head. Quiet. Thor begins to stir awake from all the commotion. Are all of you humans this loud in the morning? Although Thor would usually be able to wake up on the day after a drunken bender without much consequence, the godlike king of Asgard was currently powerless, so he felt everything that Tony was feeling at this very moment. How do these mortals deal with this? My mouth is completely dry and my head is killing me. Thor thought and instantly reprimanded himself for using the M word. Good morning, your royal highness. Jane says loud enough to make Thor flinch. She just had to get her revenge for everything that happened last night. Lady Jane? Thor asks in realization as he turns to see her standing in the kitchen. What are you doing here? This is my place. She replies and takes a sip of her coffee. Well, it's a rental. I'm only staying here for research purposes. Right? Thor mutters as he turns to see Tony stand up from the floor. 
How did we get here? You're asking the wrong guy. I was just as drunk as you last night. Tony says as he walks over to the windows and starts closing the blinds one by one. Ah, that's better. You wanted us to meet who you called the fair maiden Lady Jane Foster, so here we are. You guys drank, ordered pizza, and did your very best to trash the place. Peter says Tony paced into the kitchen and started drinking water directly from the sink's tap. I'll pay for the damages. Tony says as he stops drinking for only a moment before going right back at it again. Yeah, you will. Jane nods matter-of-factly. I also charge a steep babysitting fee. Tony doesn't even stop drinking as he gives her a thumbs up, not caring about how much he had to pay. You have a child? Thor was instantly alarmed, not understanding the joke. No, she means you and Tony. Peter says as Thor calms down. Knock knock, Jane. Are you ready? We need to get going if we want to make our flight. A man's voice calls out from the front door. Flight? Thor questioned as Jane opens the front door, and in walked her research partner Professor Eric Selvig and assistant Darcy Lewis. Selvig is an older man with gray hair, while Darcy is a dark-haired woman that seemed to be a few years younger than Jane. What the hell happened here? Darcy asked as she saw the wrecked living room with Thor still on the couch. Thor? Hello. Thor said as they entered the room. What are you? Darcy begins to ask but stops in her tracks as she turns to see Spider-Man and Tony Stark standing in the kitchen. What are the Avengers doing here? Did you commit a crime? Of course not. They're friends with Thor. Jane denies the accusation immediately as she points at Thor. What? The crazy guy that you hit with your car is friends with Spider-Man. Darcy says in absolute disbelief. I'm not a crazy man. Thor refutes as he stands up and walks to the kitchen, taking Tony's place at the sink as he downs as much water as possible. While everyone was settling in and Darcy got her autographs, Selvig spoke up. Jane, unless you want to stay in New Mexico, we have a flight to catch. He says as he motions toward his watch. You're leaving? Thor asks after Tony explained what a flight was. Yeah, those men in black, whatever they are. They took all of my research and even if I stay to try and build it all back up from scratch, they'll just come and take it all away again. Jane says sadly as she stares down at her coffee mug. You mean shield? Peter asks. I think that's what they called themselves. Selvig says with a nod. I can get your research back for you, but you'll have to miss your flight. Peter says, getting a happy smile from Thor, who didn't want Jane to leave. You can really do that? Jane asks in hope. Sure, I know the big boss of S.H.I.E.L.D., so I can just call and ask. He shouldn't have a problem with you getting your stuff back. Peter says as he takes out his phone and sends Fury a text and received a reply only seconds later. There, he said he'll have some men bring your stuff back to your workplace later today. That was easy. Darcy mutters. He's Spider-Man, Tony says as he opens the fridge and starts looking for some food but found nothing appetizing. He could call up anyone and ask for a favor and they'd most likely say yes without thinking, but enough of that. I need food. Yes. I could go for a feast as well, my friend. Thor agreed as he was in the same position as Tony. After deciding to stay and cancel their flight plans, everyone decided to go out and get some food, as both Thor and Tony were hungover and starving. As they were eating at the same diner once again, some oddly dressed characters made their way down the street. Four towering warriors in intricate Asgardian armor walked down the center of the road, obstructing traffic along the way. Though they didn't seem to understand that they were doing so. These warriors are the Warriors 3, Hogan, Fandral, and Valstag, alongside the beautiful and deadly Lady Sif. Townsfolk stared in wonder at the four warriors, as they strolled down the street in all their Asgardian splendor. A group of children in a nearby park hit a baseball, which happens to roll under a parked car. One kid runs to retrieve it, but couldn't reach it no matter how hard he tried. Suddenly, the side of the car rises into the air. The boy looks over with his mouth dropping open at what he sees. Volstag easily holds the car up with one hand. Volstag picks up the boy's ball and drops the car back down, handing the ball back to the boy and pats his head. There you go, lad. He says as he walks off with the other Asgardians, leaving a shocked child behind. Is it just me, or does Earth look a little different to you? Volstag asks as he takes in the surroundings. It has been a thousand years. Sif replies as they keep walking. Things change so fast here. You leave for a millennium, and it's like the whole neighborhood's gone. Volstag remarks. Maybe we should split? Sif says but stops as she sees a familiar mane of golden locks through a nearby window. Inside the diner, Thor was eating and talking animatedly with Jane, doing his best to woo her when suddenly there was a knock on the window to his left. Turning their heads, the group saw what appeared to be some sort of cosplayers outside waving at Thor with smiles on their faces. My friends. 
Asgard Loki stands with Gungnir in hand, surveying his kingdom from one of the many balconies on Asgard's royal palace, when an Einherjar guard quickly approaches him, out of breath from rushing through the palace halls. The Einherjar are a group of Asgardian warriors that serve as the army of Asgard and are the warrior class of its society. They are tasked with protecting Asgard and quelling conflicts within the Nine Realms. My liege, the Warriors Three and the Lady Sif have gone missing. The Armored Warrior states. Loki's eyes narrow towards the Rainbow Bridge in the distance, knowing exactly who is responsible for this. Gathering some soldiers, the King of Asgard made his way straight to the prime suspect. Approaching Heimdall on the Rainbow Bridge with a small army of Einherjar guards at his back. Loki stands menacingly before the all-seeing gatekeeper of Asgard, who doesn't even flinch upon seeing the forces surrounding him. Tell me, Loki, how did you get the Jotuns into Asgard? Heimdall asks in an accusatory tone. I had nothing to do with the attempted robbery of the weapons vault. Though there are secret paths between worlds to which even you with all your gifts are blind to. Of course, I have no use for them anymore, now that I'm king. Loki says truthfully, knowing that he wouldn't be believed. And as king, I say, for your act of treason, you are relieved of your duties as gatekeeper of Asgard. Your citizenship has also been revoked. Then I need no longer obey you. Heimdall raises his massive sword and strides toward Loki. Before he could get too close, the army of guards slam the butts of their spears onto the ground and swiftly point them in the direction of the former gatekeeper in unison. Although this causes Heimdall to stop his advance, the confident look in his eagle-like eyes doesn't lessen for a single second. Not wanting to lose any of his men in a fight with one of Asgard's most skilled warriors, Loki reaches out with both hands and takes hold of something invisible, which was hovering in mid-air before him. As it quickly fades into view, Heimdall is shocked to see the casket of ancient winters appear in Loki's grasp. The blueness creeps from his hands and up his arms, as Loki opens the casket towards Heimdall, who is standing still in the center of dozens of spears. From inside the casket, all hell breaks loose. The fury in the casket is instantly unleashed as its wind screamed. Ice, snow, and darkness come flying straight toward Heimdall. An icy chill covers his body, freezing him slowly but surely. The guards keep him from moving forward as the casket completely freezes Heimdall into a living icy statue. You may return to your duties. Loki shoes away the guards as he closes the casket and vanishes it once again. As the guards ran off, leaving only Loki and a frozen Heimdall behind, Loki inserts Gungnir into the observatory's control panel and opens the Bifrost. With a single gesture, the destroyer appears before him, a fiery glow rising within it, as it turns its head toward its king. Ensure that my idiot brother and his friends do not return. I can't have them ruining my plans. My friends. Thor happily races out of the diner to greet his comrades. Peter follows him out with Tony following closely behind, both interested in meeting the warriors three and Sif. Especially when they find out that Peter has all of Thor's powers. I don't believe it. Who are they? He can't have been telling the truth? Jane and her group were shocked and in denial. They still didn't believe that Thor was the banished king of an alien race of godlike beings. Though they would believe soon enough. My friends, I've never been happier to see anyone, but you shouldn't have come. Thor says, knowing that he deserves his exile. We're here to take you home. Sif reveals. Jane did not appear melancholy upon hearing the news of Thor leaving. She wanted to spend more time with the big muscle head. You know I can't. My father is dead because of me. I must remain in exile. Thor says woefully, causing his fellow Asgardians to exchange puzzled looks. Thor, your father still lives. Valstag says, wondering why Thor thought Odin was dead. But, Loki said. Upon uttering these three simple words, Thor knew exactly where he went wrong. He lied. Believing in his brother, Loki, will always be Thor's greatest downfall. Thor, why does this oddly dressed mortal have your hammer? Sif asks as she points to Peter, who walked over with Mjolnir in hand. Jo. Peter says with a wave of his hammer. I'm Spider-Man. Jo. One of the warriors three repeats in confusion. Father placed an. Thor tried to explain, but before he could get into it, the Bifrost storm began to form in the distance. Was somebody else coming? Tony asks as the Bifrost funnel shoots down to the ground only 20 yards away. As the funnel disappears, a large metal armor-like robot appears in the middle of the road. After witnessing the very odd event ending with the appearance of a killer robot, every sane person within the area started running and driving in the opposite direction as fast as they possibly could. What's the destroyer doing here? Thor exclaims in alarm as the metal automaton marches in his direction. Oh, now this just got interesting. Tony says as he presses a button on his watch. Tony is never too far away from his Iron Man suit. 
Merely seconds after hitting the button on his watch, a large missile comes flying over from out of town and hits the ground in front of him. As the dust cleared from the impact, Tony was already suited up in his red and gold armor. When his mask slammed down into place, hiding his face, the Asgardians next to him couldn't help but gawk at such a magnificent set of armor. Midgard certainly is different. Volstag mutters, as even in Asgard this kind of armor would be impossible to find. I'll take the first round if you don't mind. Tony's metallic voice fills the air. Sure, have at it. Peter says as he spins Mjolnir in hand. Though, I call second round. I haven't been able to test out this baby to its fullest extent just yet. You got it, Webhead. Tony says as his hands and feet light up and he shoots toward the incoming robot. Turning to the side, Peter could see Thor looking intently at Mjolnir. Unless you think you're worthy? Peter remarks as he drops the hammer at Thor's feet, which causes the sidewalk to crack in a spiderweb pattern. What does he mean by that? One of the warriors three asks in confusion, wondering why Thor would need to be worthy. Clang, a loud metallic banging sound fills the street as Tony's metal fist collided with the destroyer's fiery face. The force of the punch sends the Asgardian robot reeling backward but doesn't knock the thing off its feet. You're a hefty piece of machinery, aren't you? Tony comments after scanning it and seeing that it wasn't alive. Let's blow you up and see what happens. I'll use your scraps to update my suit. While Tony was shooting missiles at the destroyer and laying waste to any nearby structures, Thor stares down at Mjolnir with a look of uncertainty. After a few more explosions went off as he watched the retreating forms of the nearby weak and frightened humans, Thor's resolve grew as he became determined to fight. Hammer or no hammer. Powers or no powers. Mortal or not Thor would do his best to protect these people. Leave this town now. Thor says as he turns to look Jane in the eyes. Get yourself and your friends to safety. What about you? She asks worriedly. I must stay and fight. Only the king of Asgard can command the destroyer, which means my brother is the one who sent it. It's my responsibility. Thor explains. Before Jane could argue back, Thor turned to his Asgardian comrades. I'm still a warrior, and I will fight by your side. Thor exclaims as he stares down at Mjolnir. Good luck, Peter says, feeling that this is the moment he loses exclusive use of Mjolnir. It was good while it lasted. Bending down as Tony clashes with the destroyer, Thor reaches out and grips the handle of Mjolnir with a single hand. I can do this. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.